Can you just see Joaquin is in and needs to be elevated? Likewise with Didi. And then if you can start the YouTube stream, Janine, I think we're good to go. We've got a quorum of the board. And so Joaquin can begin whenever after that. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joaquin Esquivel. I'm chair of the State Water Resources Control Board. Today is Wednesday, uh, April 21st, and I would like to bring this meeting uh, back into order. I'll quickly begin by introducing my fellow board colleagues. Uh, with me today is Vice Chair Jervin Diadamo, board member Tam Doda, board member Laurel Firestone, and board member Sean McGuire. Additionally, uh, joining us today is our executive director, Eileen Sobeck, our chief counsel, Michael Lawfer, our two chief deputies, Eric Oppenheimer and Jonathan Bishop. Our clerk of the board is Janine Townsend and assisting her today is Margie Argel and uh, Courtney Tyler. Um, you know, today's uh, item is a workshop. And before I get into uh, the introduction of that, I just want to take a quick moment and acknowledge yesterday's guilty uh, verdict related to George Floyd's murder. Weeks of protests followed George Floyd's death and the horrific video of its nine minutes and 29 seconds of his life. His death galvanized action across the country. Many people, communities, and organizations looked inward and outward to recognize real inequalities that exist across our country. These inequalities are pervasive, they're persistent, and they're pernicious. These inequalities are the product of system, systemic racism. At the water boards, the protests and calls for injustice following his death led us to redouble our own racial equity efforts here. Early this summer, for those of you that follow along these board meetings, which I forgive you if you don't uh, see every one, um, early this summer, the Water Board's Racial Equity Steering Group will be presenting a resolution. Our early, I'll, I'll first note that um, last summer, we first initiated um, work here at the Water Boards writ large, not at, just at the state board or the regional boards, but a Water Board's effort to not just develop some language potentially for a resolution, but really institute a program uh, around racial equity and beginning to understand not just our internal uh, work that we need to do as an organization to ensure that uh, we have equity, diversity and inclusion, but also that our programs externally do that. And so uh, early this summer, the Water Board's Racial Equity Steering Group will be presenting a resolution to the State Water Board that will inform an action plan to evaluate and address institutional and systemic racism within the Water Board's purview. As Dr. King said, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Perhaps yesterday's important but small measure of justice will provide an inflection point to that arc for our country. My sincere hope and expectation, though, is that, that the Water Board's racial equity resolution coming later this year will provide a definitive inflection point for us and for our efforts to address racism and its adverse effect on the environment health, environmental health of far too many Californians. So just Thank you for uh, allowing me just to take that moment and uh, deliver a statement, not just for myself, but really um, the executive team entirely here at the State Water Board. 
With that, we can move on to our agenda item number 10 here. Um, and so uh, this workshop is be and so welcome. The workshop is on Sacramento River temperature management for the water year 2021. This workshop is being webcast and recorded and will be made available online for those who cannot watch it with us today. Uh, quickly on the conduct of today's workshop, the workshop is being held in accordance with the public notice dated April 10th, 2021. As a workshop, the board will not take any formal action and there will be no sworn testimony or cross-examination of participants. However, the board members may ask clarifying questions of the speakers after receiving updates and comments at this workshop, the board may also provide direction to staff regarding future tasks or actions. The purpose of today's workshop is for the board to hear an update on the development of the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation's 2021 Sacramento River Temper Management, Temperature Management Plan and receive input on the board's consideration of that plan. A quick explanation of the ordering process for today. The workshop will begin with a state and federal agency panel presentation consisting of staff presentations from the State Water Board, the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, California Department of Water Resources, National Marine Fisheries Service, and the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Following the agency's panel presentation, we will hear presentations from five additional groups who have requested to make presentations. Following those panels, we will provide the opportunity for comments from the public and other interested parties. For those that will be providing oral comments, please state your name and the organization you represent, if any, prior to providing your comments. Public comment will occur based on the order of virtual comment cards received. Instructions for completing a virtual comment card were provided uh, the board, at the board meeting notice, and you should have submitted one prior to the start of this workshop. If you were not aware of those instructions and you're viewing on one of our uh, traditional webcast streams on Cali PA or the YouTube uh, channel, uh, you can still participate by emailing comment letters, that's all one word, at waterboards.ca.gov. Um, and also on the notice today, there are instructions and links. And, um, and you will request a virtual speaker card and then resume, uh, receive a Zoom link and password to it. Uh, join us here. You will not be able to speak in this workshop until you receive the Zoom link and password, so please do that if you are looking to comment. In order to ensure all participants having the opportunity to participate, oral comments may be subject to time limits. Um, and I haven't had a chance to scroll yet through, but I think as at least of yesterday evening, um, we had somewhere around uh, 38 uh, plus commenters, but some of that included panels, uh, just for everyone's sense of um, comment time at this point. Um, before we get started with the agency and other panel presentations, uh, we will offer the opportunity for any elected or tribal officials that would like to provide comment to do so. Uh, and board clerk, do we have any elected, uh, Janine, do we have any elected or tribal officials uh, that submitted uh, virtual comment cards? I do not see any, no. Very well. Uh, okay, well, before we start, uh, any questions from board members or anything that I've uh, missed here uh, that you'd like to start or cover with? Then great. Um, I, you know, I will just quickly say uh, incredible thanks to the federal agencies and our sister uh, state agencies here for a lot of work that has certainly been going on uh, these last months, a lot of discussion um, and, uh, and, and what we've known and continue to, to learn from previous droughts and challenging conditions on the Sacramento River given that this year is calling to mind the years of 2014 and 15, I think for many when um, there, there were uh, massive uh, die-offs on, on, on our rivers because of uh, challenges with temperature management. Uh, but again, I think the lesson is to move those, those conversations earlier in the year where there are still opportunities. And I just want to thank and appreciate particularly the US Bureau of Reclamation here for uh, being so open to continuing to have those discussions um, and, and find uh, where there may be opportunities through modeling, through bringing in additional resources um, to uh, find solutions to very challenging conditions. And especially as we find ourselves in drought here, um, you know, we'll only continue to be more challenging in the months ahead. So this uh, work comes well received. And I just wanna thank everyone for, for the spirit um, that they are and, and leadership and expertise that they're bringing to this discussion. Uh, with that, uh, we'll move on to our agency panel presentations, and I'd like to start with Diane Riddle, our Assistant Deputy Director for the Board's Division of Water Rights, who's going to introduce our other agency partners. Good morning, Diane. Good to see you. Good morning. Um, thank you for that um, great introduction. 
Again, I am Diane Riddle. I am one of the assistant deputy directors in the Division of Water Rights overseeing the Bay Delta hearings and special projects branch. Um, I'll provide a brief introduction to the workshop today along with Matt Holland, environmental program manager overseeing the Bay Delta section in the branch. Next slide, please. So again, um, the purpose of today's workshop is to receive information to inform the State Water Board's consideration of the Bureau of Reclamation's 2021 Sacramento River Temperature Management Plan pursuant to the requirements of State Water Board Order 90-5. To inform that consideration, an update on Sacramento temperature management planning activities will pre be provided along with supporting technical information from state and federal agencies involved in temperature management, following which we will receive information from stakeholder groups as well as public comments. Next slide, please. So Matt Holland and I will start with a brief introduction regarding the State Water Board's temperature requirements included in State Water Board Order 90-5 and this year's planning process related to Order 90-5. We will then hear a Bay Delta Watershed Hydrology update from Kristen White and Molly White from the Bureau of Reclamation and the Department of Water Resources, respectively. Um, the purpose of that presentation is to provide some context for today's workshop and um, really just kind of inform the board on extreme dry hydrologic conditions that are currently existing um, following the dry conditions uh, last year. Following the hydrology update, we will hear from Doug Killen with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife and Stephen Morano with the National Marine Fisheries Service on the condition and status of focal fish species for related to Sacramento River temperature management issues. We will then hear from Dave Mooney with the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation, um, who will provide an overview of Reclamation's proposed Sacramento River temperature management actions included in their recent reconsultation on Endangered Species Act compliance and associated um, and the Associated National Marine Fisheries Service biological opinion. Next, we will hear from James Gilbert with the National Marine Fisheries Service Southwest Fisheries Science Center, who will provide an overview on recent modeling, evaluating a range of operational factors affecting temperature management and associated temperature dependent mortality to winter run salmon eggs. Finally, to close out the agency presentation, we will hear from Liz Kaitek with the US Bureau of Reclamation and Stephen Morano with the National Marine Fisheries Service on the current process to develop the draft temperature management plan this year. Next slide, please. Following the agency presentations, we will hear from groups who requested to make presentations today. We will start with Thad Bentner, Louis Baer, Lee Bergfeld, and Mike Diaz representing the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors. We'll then hear from John McManus with the Golden Gate Salmon Association. And I think we have a typo on the slide. Sorry about that. Um, and Mike Conroy with the Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association. Next, we will receive a panel presentation from John Rosenfeld with the San Francisco Baykeeper, Doug OBG with Natural Resources Defense Council, and Greg Reese with the Bay Institute. Following that presentation, we will hear a presentation from Bill Jennings, Tom Cannon, Chris Schutz, and Mike J Jackson representing the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance, Cal California Water Impact Network and Aqua Alliance. Lastly, we will hear a presentation from Jessica Law with the Sacramento Water Forum. After that presentation, we will hear the public comments. Next slide, please. So to provide some context for today's discussions, I, I will provide a brief overview of State Water Board Order 90-5. Um, as indicated by the order number, the State Water Board adopted Order 90-5 in 1990, um, quite some time ago. Um, the order establishes requirements on the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation's water rights um, to partially implement temperature objectives 
included in the Central Valley Water Quality Control Board's Water Quality Control Plan. The order includes various requirements. Um, most significantly, the order required the installation of a temperature control device on Shasta Dam that allows for selective withdrawal of water from the reservoir to improve temperature management. The order also includes requirements for reclamation to take actions within its reasonable control to meet temperature on the Sacramento River, which I'll talk about in the next slide. The order also includes monitoring and reporting requirements for flows and temperatures and other water quality parameters. The order also includes minimum flow requirements and ramping rates for the protection of fish, as well as measures to avoid impacts to Trinity River salmon from Sacramento River temperature management operations. Next slide, please. With respect to temperature management, Order 90-5 requires reclamation to operate Shasta Dam, Keswick Dam, and the Spring Creek Power Plant to meet a daily average water temperature of 56 degrees Fahrenheit on the Sacramento River at Red Bluff Diversion Dam during periods when higher temperatures will be detrimental to fish, including listed winter run Chinook salmon, as well as fall run Chinook salmon and other species. If there are factors beyond reclamation's reasonable control that prevent reclamation from meeting 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Red Bluff Diversion Dam, reclamation in consultation with the fishery agencies and West, the Western Area Power Administration may develop a temperature management plan and propose that the compliance point be moved upstream, which is the case in nearly all years, given that conditions generally don't support meeting a temperature of 56 degrees at Red Bluff Diversion Dam during the entire spring through fall focal period for temperature management. The map on the slide identifies different compliance points that have been used in the past for temperature management pursuant to Order 90-5, including Red Bluff Diversion Dam, which is located about 60 miles downstream of Keswick Dam and the Clear Creek Compliance Point that is located about 12 miles downstream of Keswick Dam that is identified in Reclamation's proposed action and the 2019 National Marine Fisheries Service biological opinion that will be discussed later during this panel. As you will hear about later today, currently science indicates that temperatures cooler than 56 degrees are needed to avoid significant temperature related mortality to winter run Chinook salmon eggs. While Order 90-5 was established before this recent science, meeting a temperature of 56 degrees at Red Bluff Diversion Dam or other more downstream locations provides for cooler temperatures at upstream locations, which is consistent with the current management strategies to manage for cooler temperatures at locations closer to Keswick Dam. The provisions for temperature management for a temperature management plan also provide flexibility to accommodate management strategies involving cooler temperatures at upstream compliance location in the context of Order 90-5. But I'd note that um, just given um, the evolution of regulatory requirements and science, um, the order is, is a little bit older um, and doesn't reflect all of these, uh, this, these recent developments, but I think can still accommodate and address recent science. With that, I'll turn it over to Matt, who will talk about the various temperature management considerations this year and the coordination that we've had to date to evaluate and assess temperature management issues. Next slide. Sorry, I was muted, <laughs> Diane. Um, so uh, the, I'm gonna briefly go over the main temperature management considerations that we face on this upper Sacramento River um, and further presentations from uh, subsequent panels will go into this, these issues in greater detail. Um, the so the primary species of concern are um, endangered winter run Chinook salmon and commercially important fall run Chinook. Other salmonids and other fish species are present uh, during the temperature management season, but the greatest challenges relate to maintaining suitable conditions for winter run during late spring through fall and transitioning to conditions that can be maintained throughout the fall and winter to minimize impacts to fall run. So generally these issues um, center around maintaining suitable temperature and flow conditions to minimize mortality while maintaining life history diversity and spatial diversity. Um, as most 
uh, of you probably know, spatial diversity is an issue of particular concern for winter run, which currently only spawn on the main stem of the Sacramento River below Keswick Reservoir, although there's currently an effort to introduce um, uh, self-sustaining population into Battle Creek as well. So as relates winter run and fall run, um, as I mentioned, you know, kind of maintaining temperature conditions uh, that are suitable for preventing mortality are, is, is the main important thing during the summer and early fall. But then there's a need to transition to operations that minimize red dewatering and stranding from flow fluctuations, um, which tend to affect fall run. Um, complicating all of this uh, is the fact that the Sacramento River is a, um, a, an important part of a system-wide water supply management system um, that manages water for multiple purposes. Um, other considerations include um, maintaining sufficient carryover storage uh, to ensure good fall temperature conditions and also to um, have a good chance of maintaining temperature conditions in the following year. Um, other considerations that generally don't come into play but do come into play during um, years like this when cold water resources are very limited and the reservoir is low, um, include hydropower operations as well. Next slide, please. Um, so over the course of this year, we have um, been involved in a number of coordination efforts. Um, and this is kind of reflecting what we've been trying to move toward in, in prior years since the last drought. Um, where we engage uh, in the late winter and early spring to identify what likely temperature concerns um, may arise uh, during the course of the upcoming temperature management season. There's, of course, a lot of uncertainty um, in the early part of the season because we don't know exactly how the hydrology is going to set up and how the reservoir is going to stratify, but we can get started with sort of spotting issues that are coming at us. Um, in early spring, um, we start engaging with reclamation, the fisheries agencies, um, DWR, um, to evaluate um, temperature factors affecting temperature related, sorry, evaluate factors attempting temperature related mortality. And so this year in particular, we started engaging with the Southwest Fisheries Science Center and reclamation to try to examine a range of, uh, of potential options that we could then uh, consider for operational feasibility as the season moves on. Um, this has yielded some information about actions that we could potentially take in the early season, including uh, power bypass um, and coordination on implementation criteria, such as uh, in, a, in a year like this, when cold water resources are very limiting, what kind of temperature protection window could we provide? How wide should it be? Um, and you'll hear more about that um, in particular from the Southwest Fishery Science Center. Um, additionally, evaluation of other actions has been one of the fo a focus of this work. So um, the hydropower bypass, um, which was an issue that we have discussed um, over the years, but it has generally only been used in, in situations like uh, what we're facing right now. Um, this consultation has also included um, working with the Sacramento, Sacramento River settlement contractors on voluntary actions and also um, use of their model to evaluate power bypass. Um, and at least monthly, we have um, meetings with the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group, which is an interagency uh, group that uh, provides technical advice on temperature management planning. Uh, next slide. So the next steps. Um, for temperature management planning on, on the Sacramento are uh, to receive input in this workshop today. Uh, we have an SRTTG meeting tomorrow, um, April 22nd, in which we'll be considering um, technical information provided by uh, Reclamation and uh, National Marine Fishery Service. We expect to receive a draft temperature management plan um, by the end of next week. Um, we will uh, review, provide input, um, and uh, contribute to the refinement of that draft temperature management plan. Um, and then we would receive a final temperature management plan in late May. Upon receipt of that final temperature management 
plan, we have 10 days, the board has 10 days um, to uh, object to the plan or accept it. And with that, um, uh, next slide, if there are any questions, um, we'd be happy to take them. Otherwise, um, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you, Mr. Holland. Uh, board members, anything at this point? Okay, thank you. Thank you. And we'll give a moment for uh, folks on the panel to get um, unmuted. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Ms. White. Hi there, good morning. Um, Chair Esquivel, board members, I'm Molly White, and I am um, with DWR and Water Operations Manager for the State Water Project. Today, Chris and White and I, uh, Chris and White with Reclamation, will be providing a hydrology and operations update. Next slide. Thank you. So this is a depiction of where we are looking at water year 2020 to the left and water year 2021 to the right. Um, in 2020, precipitation for much of Northern California ranged between 50 and 70% of historical average. And for Northern California, it was the ninth driest on record. As shown on the right, water year 2021, it's even worse for the entire state as shown in the dark red uh, throughout the map and shaping up as being one of the driest on record. We are halfway through the water year um, and our key rain and snow producing months are in our rear view mirror at this time. Uh, rainfall across the state has ranged anywhere between 25% to 50% of average. And from a statewide perspective, uh, the two year total is very close to the current record dry of 76, 77. So, the coming, we do have some coming forecasted precip this weekend, and um, that may likely make 2021 the second driest um, two year period on record. And then that would make 2014 15 the third driest, and 13 14 the fourth driest um, for the statewide two year precip totals. Next slide. Here is a snapshot of the drought monitor. So nearly the entire state is experiencing some form of drought conditions. About 30% of the state is facing extreme conditions shown in red and about 40% of the state is facing severe drought conditions as shown in the golden color. Next slide, please. I'll go through the basins here real quick. I know you all have seen these slides. So we've got the cumulative precipitation here for the Northern Sierra Basin. Um, to date, as shown in that bold blue line, we are at 22.4 inches and that was through April 16th. It um, falls at 49% of historical average. And um, for this water year through March, the Northern Eight Station precip is ranking as the third driest on record to date through this time period. Next slide. San Joaquin Basin to date, we have seen 17.7 inches. That is 50% of historical average. And the um, October through March precipitation is ranking as the fifth driest on record. Next slide. For Tulare Basin, uh, 9.4 inches to date, which is 37% of average, and the October through March precip is ranked as the second driest on record. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of about a week ago of the um, northern, central, and southern Sierra snowpack, um, snow water content. 
across the basins, we reached the peak snowpack around the third week of uh, March. And subsequently, we have seen the snowpack diminishing uh, very rapidly um, with the recent warm temperatures and reservoir inflows from the snow, snow melt are dismal just due to the very um, dry soils that we have in the basin. As of yesterday, the statewide snowpack average was 31% of average. Next slide, please. I wanted to bring up, uh, Kristen and I were here back in mid-February, and so the graphic on the left was shared during that presentation. And um, it really shows that the projections were quite variable even at that time with the below, pre below average precip we had been seeing. But um, we were quite certain we would be falling below average for runoff. It was just a matter of how below uh, average. And so if you look to the right, that's a snapshot of the central. So these are the Central Valley runoff forecast for um, the SAC and San Joaquin and their main tributaries. And so if you look at um, the current slide there to the right, you can see how all the, the probability were really converging to that um, lower end of the projection, which is well below average. Uh, next slide, please. Reservoir conditions. Kristen and I will talk to our you know, respective uh, Reservoirs overall, just a snapshot uh, storage throughout the state are well below historical average. And next slide, please. So I'll kick it off to Kristen to talk about Shasta. Great, thanks Molly and uh, good morning board members. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, yeah, although I wish it was in better circumstances, I wish we had better news. Um, maybe next year we'll be talking about <laughs> about a happier situation. Um, so looking at Lake Shasta, this is just a, a, a snapshot of what the storage has been this year uh, compared to uh, uh, 20, the 2014 water year and the 2015 water year. Um, you can see we started the year uh, uh, pretty well above where 2014 and 2015 started, uh, right under, right around 2.2 million acre feet. And we have barely come up from that um, throughout the year. Uh, so we're only at about 2.3 million acre feet or 2.36 million acre feet now. Um, we did hold that minimum release of 3250 all the way uh, throughout the winter. I think uh, we started going up in March for Delta outflow. Um, and you can just see that uh, uh, regardless of that minimum release, the storage just um, kept dropping and we um, have really been gaining very little. Um, next slide. So for Lake Oroville conditions, um, just the back-to-back -back years of very dry conditions have put us um, in a place of resulting very low storage um, at this point in time. October through March, the runoff for the Feather River watershed is currently the fourth driest on record. Um, we stand at just under 1.5 million acre feet. And as shown here, we are tracking uh, below the 14 and 15 uh, historical dry years. And uh, should the dry conditions persist, uh, Orville storage may drop to a historical low later this year, uh, below lowest on record, which was back in 1977 at about um, 880,000 acre feet. Uh, next slide. Thanks, Molly. Um, so Folsom's got a very similar story. I'm sorry if this sounds repetitive, but it is dry throughout the system. Uh, where we started the year off above where we started the 2014-2015 uh, the drought years, um, uh, a, a decent storage right around uh, a little over 400,000 acre feet, um, decent for a dry year. But uh, again, we have just been dropping throughout the year uh, with very little reprieve. We are less than what we ended last year. Um, now to a very low storage level for Folsom um, below, as you can see on the graph, below what we were at in 2014 of uh, about 359,000 acre feet. So definite um, concerns for Folsom storage and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. Next slide, please. Uh, San Luis Reservoir, similar where we, we started right around average. Um, uh, we were able to pick up a little bit of water over the winter, um, but as we started getting into the spring months, 
Uh, we've been um, uh, really struggling to even maintain minimum pumping uh, due to del delta outflow and salinity concerns, particularly in March and April. Next slide. All right, so now New Maloney's our, our shining star. It's the only reservoir that's right at average, although probably not gonna be there for very long. Um, uh, so this is, uh, we are doing much better than we did in the drought. This is a very large reservoir on a small watershed. It's about 2.4 million acre feet capacity with an average inflow of about one, one to 1.1 1 .1 million acre feet. So uh, that means that it can go very long between filling. We really need a, a quite a very wet year like 2017 to be able to provide carryover storage for non-wet years. Um, so this reservoir is, is one that we uh, really tried to extend out that storage and, and that's playing out well this year, although uh, we are likely to start going below average um, this year. Next slide, please. All right, so I'll, I'll take it back. Thanks, Kristen. This is just wanted to provide a snapshot of just the just the geographic locations of our reservoirs and just where we um, stand with the, from a picture snapshot and the total capacity and historical average of the major CVP and SWP managed reservoirs north of the Delta. Next slide. Okay, as we uh, look at the April forecast, I, I think Molly mentioned most of these statistics, um, uh, I think in, in her earlier presentation, but just as a reminder, um, and these are likely only going to uh, go in the, in the drier direction as we move in the next uh, month, we are critical in the Sacramento and San Joaquin. Uh, we are well below average for runoff, rainfall, and snowpack. Um, we really only had one major storm. It was the one at the end of January. Everything else after that has been uh, fairly small and inconsistent precipitation. That's resulted in third driest uh, 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 runoff through March for the Sac Valley, sixth driest for the San Joaquin, and eighth driest for the Tulare, Bay, uh, Tulare Lake Basin. Um, we are, uh, given the very dry weather that we've seen in April, there's been uh, almost no precipitation until yesterday. I think there was a little precip up in Redding, and as Molly mentioned, we hoped for a little bit more precip um, uh, coming in later this week, although uh, it, it will not be anything significant like, uh, like what we saw at the end of January, or at least we don't expect it to be. Um, but given those dry conditions combined with very dry soils, we do expect the May forecast to decrease further from what we saw in April. Um, we're just not seeing that runoff from the snowpack that we had hoped. Next slide. Molly? Yeah, thank you, Kristen. Um, my pr presentation got hung up there. So the everyone, um, we're back to SWP Ops update. So um, to give you an update where we stand today, the in March, DWR did reduce the um, state water project water supply allocation. We were at 10%. We reduced down to 5%. This 5% does match 2014 and is the lowest on record for um, MI contractors. In addition, earlier this month, uh, we did notify the Feather River settlement contractors that because of the dry conditions, we would be reducing their contractual deliveries by 50% this year. Uh, as mentioned, we are well below average there in Lake Oroville right now. Our objective is to conserve water in Oroville for when it is needed later in the season. Um, our objective at this point is to maintain at least 900,000 acre feet through August. And that's to sustain peak downstream requirements and demands as well as for later summer and fall Feather River temperature management. So our releases now and through the summer will be as, will be minimums just to meet uh, downstream water quality and flow standards um, and to sustain just those minimal exports needed to support our state water contractors that are not directly connected to San Luis Reservoir. Right now we are at about 400 CFS. As far as Delta operations, um, the story continues because of the dry conditions. The um, the projects have had challenges meeting um, D1641 Delta outflow in March and April. 
uh, currently we um, the projects are both maintaining minimum exports and current upstream releases at the risk of not meeting delta outflow for the remainder of april um, we have talked about the this projected projected storm later this week or this weekend but um, unless there is substantial rainfall at this juncture it's just, just likely that the projects may not be able to meet outflow requirements through the remainder of April. Uh, this has definitely just been a challenging balancing act as we manage through the limited resources that we have in the system. And uh, we have been communicating these challenges um, to board staff. And that's all I had for the ops update. Next slide, I believe, is the CVP ops update. Yes, thanks. Yep. Thanks, Molly. Very unfortunate conditions for sure. Um, so uh, just comparatively looking at uh, the Central Valley project operations, we are at 5% north of Delta agricultural allocation and 55% of historical use uh, for municipal and industrial contractors. Uh, south of Delta allocation, the 5% that was issued in February has been deemed no longer available, uh, and the, the municipal and industrial contractors are also at 55% of historical use or, or public health and safety, whichever is greater. Um, moving into Lake Shasta, our storage, as I mentioned earlier, is uh, ve just, barely, just barely above what we ended last year at uh, 2.3 million acre feet, which is well below average. Um, our releases, uh, as I mentioned, were minimum until we got into March, and then March and April have been uh, primarily for Delta outflow until about mid-April, just in the past maybe week, week and a half, we started also releasing for meeting the, the other in-basin uses, primarily the senior water right demands um, within the system. So we anticipate those uh, uh, releases for both senior water right uh, demands and Delta objectives to continue. Um, our Sacramento River settlement contractors are at a 75% allocation per their contract. It is a Shasta critical year. Um, it's pretty much critical everywhere. Um, so our key objectives uh, for Shasta operations for this year are temperature management, number one. That's why we're here at this workshop and eager to hear input and feedback on some of the challenges we're facing. Um, also carryover storage. It's definitely a, um, a concern of what to do if next year is dry. Unfortunately, we have very limited uh, very limited um, ability to increase that. Although, as Molly mentioned, uh, we are um, trying to balance between that and Delta objectives. Um, also meeting our senior water right requirements and health and safety needs throughout the basin. Uh, next slide. Okay, uh, moving on to Folsom and again, <laughs> somewhat repetitive. Uh, we are releasing above minimums to primarily support Delta objectives with key objectives of carryover storage, temperature management and meeting health and safety needs throughout the basin. Um, moving into Trinity Lake, very similar story. Trinity, I don't think we had a graph for that but it's also very low storage, um, uh, projected to be very low towards the end of this year. Uh, releases from Trinity will primarily follow the 2001 record of decision and then the releases that come into the Sacramento are will be shaped to try and balance between Shasta and Trinity storage. There's, um, we wish you could bring um, more over but Trinity reservoir storage is also suffering so we're very limited in the amount that can be brought over into the um, Sacramento basin to support Shasta storage. So our key objectives there are also carryover storage and temperature management for both the Sacramento River and Trinity Rivers, um, concerns in both areas. And next slide. All right, and then uh, finally at New Maloney's, uh, we are still concerned about storage conservation there. Uh, releases will be primarily controlled by the stepped release plan from the 2019 record of decision and Vernalis flows and salinity objectives. Um, and then finally, our Delta exports are likely to be low throughout the summer to meet our senior water right and refuge requirements south of the Delta. Um, and then we uh, are expecting to see some increased exports to facilitate third party transfers. So, and that's all I have. Any questions? None for me, but just thanks. Uh, this really sets us up well for what is then now really getting into a deep dive into the ramifications of what uh, the hydrology we find ourselves with. And as you said, Ms. White, uh, regrettably um, droughts here. And, and it's obvious that we are, you know, from these numbers, you know, quite, quite concerning um, in where we are on, on the system at this point of the year, knowing that um, we still have the driest uh, months ahead of us. And uh, there is so much uncertainty about 
the next water year. So um, thank you. I just really appreciate the, the thorough the thorough update on on the hydrology and uh, being able to have a touch point with you uh, from the previous update you gave us, which again, unfortunately, um, we're at the bottom of what were you know projections at that point. And so I think it really speaks to the severity of the challenges that we're facing on the system. And uh, so just thank you. Thank you for 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 updating us on on the, the hydrologic components. I think we can um, if, just looking to my fellow board members and please uh, always feel free to jump in if you have questions. Uh, board member Firestone. Thanks. Thanks so much. Um, I'm just uh, newer to this area, so I have um, basic questions. I appreciate the time and the chance at this workshop to, to dig in. Um, such a challenging time. Uh, and this was really helpful to just uh, have that, um, you know, in, in clear, um, uh, stark uh, terms. So what one of the things I'm wondering, and I know this is a real challenge, is that, um, you know, early in the season, um, and throughout the season, you're projecting what you think things are going to be like, and then you have to see how it turns out and then adjust um, as that goes. And I'm wondering for, for this year, um, as you have looked so far at, you know, projections versus how things have actually played out, um, if, you know, if you can give a sense of what those trends have been and what that means for you know, the decisions that you've had to make. I mean, I've seen that um, some of that from your slides and certainly having to reduce um, the allocations, but I'm just wondering if you could give a little bit more um, uh, of an overview of how that, that change between projections and actuals played out um, and impacts sort of system-wide considerations and, and particularly temperature management. Um, I can start and then okay. let Molly, um, and, and please let me know if this answers your question. I think um, when we do our projections, we really think about trying to plan things, especially early in the year, based on a 90% exceedance, meaning there's a 90% chance it's gonna be higher than that. I believe, and I'll ask Molly to correct me, that every single month has come in below the 90. I think there was one month that it was close. Um, so uh, that means every single month has come in worse than the conservative estimate that we used. Um, yeah, yes. Thanks, Molly. <laughs> wow. Wow. And, and just to add a little bit more when it comes to our planning efforts and so forth from an SWP perspective, we do look at a range of, Kristen mentioned the 90% hydrology, a very dry conservative hydrology that we that helps inform our decisions and our projections moving forward. Um, not all the water for water supply does come out of Lake Oroville um, during the year. There are many times even in the projections that there's just unstored water in the system that the projects can pick up to help support and uh, our water supply allocations. And as noted throughout the presentation and with the grim, con <clears throat> excuse me, the grim grim conditions that we are facing, there hasn't been nearly any opportunities just to pick up that additional water. And so I know from a state water project perspective, there's very little discretionary releases um, to support water supply. Much of the, um, as mentioned, our releases are going to meet our downstream, our senior diverter obligations, as well as our um, flow and water quality objectives. Great, thanks. I guess um, just following up um, to add a little bit on that or make sure I caught it. So um, in terms of the, the implications or what you've had to do to adjust then to that change throughout time, can you just give me some sense of, and again, I know you covered this somewhat, but just emphasizing um, to help me follow the, um, you know, how that's impacted temperature management and system-wide considerations just over this period. Did those, those differences as you've had to, to adjust over this, even just the short period? Yeah, and I, I can touch on the CVP side. Um, uh, basically, we've 
been uh, delta. That means the delta outflow uh, and delta salinity conditions, um, and then more recently, some of the uh, demands with the dry soils have really been controlling releases. Uh, and and um, uh, I think since March, um, higher than what we expected under the 90% exceedance. Um, that's that's just an example of the extreme dryness throughout the basin. So um, so obviously higher releases is, uh, uh, is going to reduce storage as we go into uh, a, a stratified reservoir, which we don't typically get to until uh, early to mid-May. Um, so, so that's part of the effect of temperature management. Um, ways that we've adjusted with that and tried to minimize that, um, we normally think about our minimum pumping of 1500 CFS that usually supports uh, the minimum needs. We have gotten um, quite creative um, this year of, uh, of, of staying. We've actually been below that quite a bit. Um, uh, we've even uh, done a, a significant amount of cycling uh, at the federal facility, which means basically turning the pump off uh, for half a day and then turning it back on. Um, we have very old infrastructure, so that's really hard on our system. It's really not sustainable. Um, however, um, that is one of the tools that we've been using along with just intense coordination with DWR about how to meet our needs and go back and forth. And I know um, I'll let Molly talk about some of the things on the state side as well. All right, hi, this is Molly. Um, yeah, so, so same with, as Kristen had mentioned, um, intense coordination, the, we've been at periods when the Bureau is cycling a unit, unit and we've gone to zero exports. Um, for a continuum, a handful of days to meet those requirements. Um, as far as for temperature management for, um, for the Feather River, that our goal is that 900,000 um, acre feet um, target through August. And as mentioned, it, it's to minimize um, risk of early in the summer of falling below um, a our power pool levels. And once we are at that position, or position um, it does inhibit and limit some of our temperature management capabilities. So that's been a um, objective of ours as we um, plan for this up, you know, balancing those needs with the very minimum exports in the Delta. Thanks so much. Thank you all, I much appreciated. Thank you again, uh, uh, Ms. White and Ms. White. Uh, also, oh, uh, board member Dodek, were you looking to uh, make a comment? Please, by all means. Yes, thank you. Thank you for that very um, sobering update. I think it, like the chair said, it uh, sets really the, the you know, backdrop for the rest of today's discussion. Um, I do have a question and um, it's not meant to be a trick question. It um, really is something that I think we all struggle with. Um, so I'm curious about your thinking when you try to balance all of these key objectives as you conduct your operations, you know, temperature management, carryover storage, meeting water rights and delivery commitments, and of course, meeting the health and safety needs throughout the basins. I mean, with the scarce resources that you have, when it comes to trying to balance all these needs, how do you prioritize? What considerations do you, you know, do you um, take into account? And how do you do that kind of difficult balancing decision? And again, not meant to trick you, but just because it's something that we all struggle with. You know, during my entire 16 years on the board, every time we have these kind of situation, these questions come up. And, um, and I'm honestly just curious um, for both the State Water Project and the Central Valley Project, as an operational decision, how do you make that balancing determination? Yeah, maybe I'll start out. Um, I'd say uh, it's, a, it's a great question and I wish we had an easy answer to it. Um, uh, my best answer is heavy coordination. Um, I mean, obviously, the uh, the priorities of the project are are, are policy and management decisions. Um, however, we have a number of requirements, and 
this is a year where we're really struggling to meet all the requirements together. Um, so uh, we're relying heavily on coordination, talking with the senior water right users about what flexibility they can have and in, uh, in, in modifying their their timing and, and their demands, um, talking with the board on a regular basis about uh, different ways to look at meeting different objectives, trying to capitalize on the very small precipitation events that we've had um, uh, so that we can save storage. I think uh, that, that'd be my best answer is that we're really relying heavily on coordination and talking to as, as many of the parties as we can to figure out the best solution uh, to, to balance the various um, concerns. And, and the risk is, is kind of the last big uh, thing that we're balancing. Um, I mean, we, we are generally thinking that May is a final forecast and that we don't see a big difference between April and May, um, but we also generally think that we're going to receive runoff from snowpack, um, which doesn't appear to be happening um, much right now. So um, so balancing that risk as well uh, has really um, uh, fed into the conversation. Molly, do you have for, uh, anything to add? No, I, I just want to second the coordination um, and how it's so critical given in any year it's, and especially critical in a year like this year. I, I think the, the resources are scarce as we look forward for, you know, the, this upcoming season and just trying to um, avoid the worst outcomes for one thing. And I, I think it's just a balance as you look across the whole system in itself. So I think Kristen, you mentioned, um, you elaborated quite well, thank you. Thank you both and thank you board member. It is a good question and actually um, leads us well into the rest of the discussion today that we'll dig into further the nuance around that balancing and the considerations of the multiple agencies that are involved in these discussions, including the biological agencies, which um, we, we really appreciate uh, the resources that they bring to understanding and, and beginning to model out, I think, some of uh, the impacts of the various choices and, and act actions that may be out there that are particularly uh, likely there earlier in the water year. Um, so um, thank you for that good question. And I think, it, again, it leads us well into then our next panel, uh, which is uh, on uh, fisheries conditions and uh, impacts. So I'd like to welcome up Douglas Killam and uh, Stephen uh, Morana. Oh, one moment. I think you still need to be asked to be unmute. Hi. Unmuted, perhaps. Can you hear me? This is. Doug oh, I can Cohen. hear you. Yes, I can hear you. Hello. Hi. Uh, good morning, board members and others on the call. I am uh, Doug Killam with California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, also on the line is Steve Marinaro from NOAA. We're going to be giving a talk today on fish conditions and status in the Upper Sacramento River. Uh, primarily below uh, Shasta Reservoir. Next slide, please. First off is a historical uh, trend of winter and fall run Chinook. We have four runs of salmon in this watershed, which comprises the Sacramento River comprises the majority of uh, salmon in California, uh, including the Feather River and the Upper Sac uh, Basin uh, below Keswick uh, Dam. Uh, the red bars show the winter run Chinook salmon, which is an endangered run that occurs only in the upper Sac basin. And then the more uh, green bars show the fall run Chinook salmon population in thousands of fish on the uh, Y axis and on the horizontal axis. Those are the years uh, from 1970 through 2020. Uh, in the early 70s, winter run populations were similar to fall run populations shown by the red and green bars. And then as uh, earlier presentation noted, there was a bad drought in 76 and 77. And along with pollution concerns that led to a crash of the winter run uh, populations. Uh, then subsequent dry, or dry periods from 1987 through 1992 resulted in low uh, winter run numbers and they became listed under the Endangered Species Act beginning in 1989 for state and uh, 
1994 federally, uh, getting the protections from uh, under those laws. Fall run numbers have been much larger than winter runs since the 80s, uh, except for recent periods in 2016 and 18. The single winter run population, as mentioned by uh, Mr. Holland earlier, went through a bottleneck in the 90s with some years of less than 200 fish uh, and currently have a high hatchery influence leading to a lot of genetic diversity concerns in that run. Next slide, please. Catch up. Uh, this is zooming in on the winter and fall run counts from that last graph showing a snapshot of uh, the recent past from 2007 through 2020. Uh, there are additional runs in this river, but uh, the late fall run of salmon is not as impacted by uh, temperature concerns. One of the main priorities is temperature management. Temperature management is uh, used for keeping salmon alive uh, in the upper sack basin as part of the, one of the priorities of the uh, water releases. Uh, Chinook salmon in this area generally have a three-year life cycle. This, this means that adult numbers for any given year are impacted by juvenile conditions from three years previous and ocean conditions from one to two years previous. Uh, winter run are listed under the ESAs and uh, taking of them defined as harming uh, or killing of or killing of winter run is closely re regulated and restriction. Restricted winter run numbers impact commercial and recreational seasons and can shorten or eliminate opportunities to harvest fall run salmon. Fall run are important economically to California, both commercially and recreationally, bringing in millions of dollars each year to local economies. The Sacramento River watershed produces the majority of California Chinook salmon resources each year. In our area, both winter run and fall run hatcheries in the watershed uh, are present. The winter run Livingston Stone Fish Hatchery is a conservation hatchery at the base of Shasta Dam and used to provide limited numbers of winter run to conserve against extinction. Coleman Fish Hatchery on Battle Creek in the watershed is a supplementation hatchery and provides up to 12 million additional fall run each year. Next slide, please. This is a snapshot of just the winter run and the relation to the juveniles produced by females each year. Years are on the bottom and thousands of fish are on the top. The red bars show adult females spawning in the uh, main stem river and the blue bars show the number of juveniles produced by that each female of the in that red bar each year. As mentioned, they only exist in the upper sack watershed. Adults begin their upstream migration as early as November. They peak in mid uh, March and April and end in June. Winter run spawn from May to August, peak spawning in late June to early July. As an aside, it seems strange to have a, a run of fish called winter run that spawn in July, but they were named for when the uh, bulk of the run was passing through the Golden Gate area when we used to have canneries, salmon canneries down there along the river. Uh, and they would go through during the winter. Winter run eggs and fry need cold water to emerge from reds and take an average of 89 days from spawning to exit the red. So when a fish spawns in July, it needs about three months for the eggs and fry in the salmon nests or, or what we call reds uh, that are buried in the gravel. It takes them an average of three months to clear those reds where they enter into the water column. Uh, and they need cold water during that entire period. Once emerged from reds, juveniles begin feeding and can tolerate warmer temperatures. Uh, migration downstream toward the ocean of juvenile winter run takes place from late July till March, and peak of migration is from September to November here in the uh, upper Sac watershed, which is the upper 60 miles of the river, basically from Red Bluff up to Keswick. Uh, they spend between two to four years in the ocean, two-year-olds, you may have heard the term jacks or grills, those are the young fish that come back as two-year-olds, the, the majority of them now return as three-year-olds. Next slide, please. On the on to the fall run status. Uh, the chart shows the status of fall run populations above Red Bluff. Green columns are the main stem sac river fish. 
Orange bars in this slide are the salmon using the tributary streams above Red Bluff. We have a lot of uh, watershed streams that uh, dump into the Sacramento River below uh, Keswick Dam. And on average, 20 27% of the entire watershed uh, above Red Bluff is from the main stem for fall run numbers. The other major contributors are Battle Creek, uh, with 57% and Clear Creek with 12% shown. Those additional watersheds are shown with the orange bars. Uh, Chinook, most numerous run, uh, fall run Chinook are the most numerous run of Chinook in California. Adults begin their upstream migration as early as June and peak in August and September and end in, end in October. Uh, fall run spawn from September September to December and peak spawning occurs in October. Like winter run, fall run eggs need cold water and take an average of 92 days from spawning to exit the red. Migration downstream towards the ocean of juvenile fall run takes place from late December till June, but peak of migration is from January to February. Uh, hatchery Coleman fish, uh, fish migrate after their release in March and April. And again, they spend between two to four years in the ocean and the majority now return as, as fall run or as three-year-olds. Next slide, please. Uh, this slide is dealing with the Sacramento River temperature management. Temperature management is critical throughout the egg fry incubation. Water temperatures above 56 degrees can reduce in red survival, incrementally up to 62 degrees Fahrenheit, above which conditions are lethal to all survival of uh, salmon, eggs, and fry in the reds. In most years, the upper river below Keswick Dam is held below 56 degrees by management of cold water releases from Shasta Reservoir. In years where Shasta Reservoir levels are low, in, such as drought years, high water temperatures during both winter and fall run red incubation periods, June through November, can result in high egg mortality. This happened most recently in 2014 and again in 2015 when only an estimated 5% of the in-river winter run juveniles emigrated past Red Bluff. Uh, the 20-year average for this survival from egg to uh, juvenile is approximately 25%. And similar poor survival impacts to fall run were estimated during those years as well. Next slide, please. Stephen is going to discuss this slide. Great. Thanks, Doug. So good morning, board members. I'm Stephen Morano. I'm a biologist with National Marine Fisheries Service in the Central Valley office. And uh, thanks for the opportunity to present today. Uh, I've got a very colorful slide to share with you all. So um, I'll begin by talking about temperature impacts on Chinook salmon biology. So I know Diane and Matt and Doug introduced it. And I'm trying to set the stage as well for some of the upcoming agency talks, particularly Reclamation's presentation on temperature planning uh, and the Science Center's presentation on temperature modeling. So uh, We'll sort of touch on these topics repeatedly today to help uh, sort of build, build the full picture. So as Doug highlighted, there's been a lot of declines in Sacramento River Chinook populations over the long term, uh, including some poor recent years. And temperature is certainly important throughout their life history, but it's particularly key during the early life stages and eggs as eggs and fry. And I wanted to share some of the biology behind this because I think it's helpful for understanding temperature management. And I also think it's just incredibly fascinating. So I hope I can maybe brighten your day with a little bit of fish biology here. So the, the underlying issue is that it's difficult for aquatic organisms to get oxygen out of the water, believe it or not, right? So particularly if you're a fish egg before you can pump water across your gills or swim to a new location. So when salmon eggs start experiencing higher temperatures that increase their metabolism, the oxygen demands of the embryo can actually exceed what the egg can at least passively take in. Uh, and when it exceeds that, that can lead to death. So like we've talked about, there's been these longstanding management goals to maintain water temperatures under 56 degrees Fahrenheit uh, to protect winter run egg survival. And then there's a more recent research that indicates that it requires about two to three degrees cooler, about 53 and a half uh, Fahrenheit or specifically 12 degrees centigrade that's required to fully prevent temperature dependent mortality in the early life stages. There's still some ongoing modeling and investigating to figure out just how wide or narrow that window of temperature sensi sensitivity is for the eggs, just how much we need to focus that 53 and a half degrees Fahrenheit around the time that they're hatching, uh, or whether it's a slightly broader uh, sort of incremental impact over the course of their egg incubation. 
Um, but regardless, uh, we're trying to target that, that uh, critical temperature. And like Doug noted, we see the results of excessive temperatures in 2014, 15. So this figure here uh, is intended just to exhibit some of that visually what, uh, what Doug was sharing, right? So um, you may recall, he talked about adult migration um, upstream peaking in March and April. So the spawn uh, timing tends to peak around late June to early July shown in the purple there. Um, and the blue area about six weeks later is when the egg hatch is peaking. And about five weeks after that in the green is when the fry are emerging from the gravel. And then meanwhile, river temperatures, uh, it's shown with Keswick here as an example, are, are, are increasing. Uh, and at this really susceptible life stage, just as the eggs are attempting to hatch and ultimately emerge, uh, temperatures are becoming detrimental uh, to this life stage. So um, I've explained some of the importance of temperature management, hopefully, and specifically um, why we're interested in mortality, temperature dependent mortality for the species. So I'll turn it back over to Doug uh, for our final slide, just to describe some of the broader impacts uh, on the watershed. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, so warm water can affect juvenile survival as, as there are typically when there's, the water is warm, the flows are low and clear. Uh, and these impacts of just dry hydrology on the salmon population in the upper Sacramento River can be pretty drastic. Uh, we saw that in all the drought years, but we've had a lot better monitoring in recent years, particularly uh, in the drought of 2012 through 16. Uh, low Shasta reservoir levels from poor runoff and snow melt lead to reduced cold water availability for salmon reds during winter and fall run incubations is one factor. Uh, we also have the tributary fall run spawners as well as spring run, which I haven't mentioned much. Uh, they are delayed or blocked from entering the tributaries up here by low flows and warm water at the mouth, uh, leaving these fish to spawn in, poor, in the poorer main stem environment that occurs later. Uh, in September to February, flows are often reduced to a minimum of 3250 CFS to conserve water. Uh, this can lead to red dewatering and juvenile stranding of fish that spawned in the higher summer flows. Uh, low flows. Uh, prevent both winter and fall run juveniles from accessing shoreline vegetative cover around islands and on the shorelines. These are important habitats for the very small young uh, salmon. As the, as the flows pull back from the summer high, the vegetation doesn't regrow. So you end up with just rocky shorelines in the river up here. Many of you notice that on some of the rivers, American or Feather, if you walking along them as well as the Sacramento. This reduces the resting shelter and, in, and increases predator contacts. And then finally, low flows are typically very clear during drought periods. Uh, we have very little rain off, uh, rain runoff to muddy the water. Clear water attracts abundant aquatic and avian predators such as fish otters, cormorants, and mergansers, uh, and allows them to easily contact and consume the rearing and juvenile migrating uh, fish in the watershed. And that's all we have today for uh, the fisheries update. Are there any questions? Thank you for that. Um, none for me and just quickly looking to my fellow board members. Um, okay, seeing none, thank you. That was very helpful. And uh, yes, to your point um, is really helping to build to now uh, some of the more uh, definitive actions that are being taken by reclamation, I believe. We have uh, Mr. Dave Mooney as part of our, our next um, panel then uh, to go over those. Good morning. I'm glad uh, you can join us here, Mr. Mooney. Happy to. I think I have a presentation. Yeah, it should be slowly popping up here. There it is. Thank you. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come speak to you today. My name is Dave Mooney. I manage the Bureau of Reclamation's Bay Delta office. So my office coordinates many of our CBP fish and wildlife activities and partnerships with the state. And one of our responsibilities is the Endangered Species Act consultation for the operation of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. So next slide, please. So today we're talking about the Shasta and Trinity divisions up near Redding, California. Uh, 
These actions are coordinated with the rest of the Central Valley and Delta, including our other facilities and the state water project. So as folks have mentioned, Shass is our largest reservoir. It has Keswick downstream of it as a re-regulating reservoir. Water from the Trinity Basin comes over into Whiskey Town, and it's either brought through uh, the Spring Creek Tunnel, also into Keswick, or it's released down Clear Creek to support fish in that system. So today I was going to talk about our, our consultation. It had a suite of actions, including how we operate these and other facilities, how we do our status and trend monitoring to evaluate performance, our habitat facility actions to try to improve some of the environmental conditions, our uh, hatchery actions to support fish, and then our special studies, which is how we try to further the state-of-the-art science. Uh, next slide, please. So the operation of the CVP is complicated uh, and temperature management is part of the year round overlapping needs and requirements. So to develop our plans, we start by thinking about the hydrology, meteorology and the, the landscape conditions. So today is primarily focused on operations, but as we mentioned before, we have uh, other measures outside of order 90-5 and the flows. Uh, one way of understanding operations is to parse it into two seasons. So today is really focused on the temperature management season, but we also manage our releases in the fall, winter, and spring to rebuild storage while operating for delta requirements, flood control, and non-project water rights. So looking at temperatures, fish need suitable water quality year round, but we focus primarily on the May through September period for a couple reasons. Uh, the first is that air temperatures start to materially warm the river flows. Our diversions under CVP allocations are typically pretty small before May. And starting in about May, the res reservoir is stratified. So we know of and can plan for the use of our cold water. And then lastly, as we heard before, this is when the winter run Chinook salmon begin their spawning and in, in incubation period. So the next slide. So we talked a little bit about the life cycle of the winter run Chinook salmon. And we're generally looking at the spawning, incubation, and emergence period that occurs in May through November. Uh, we also look at the location of where the winter runs spawn. We have agreements with the California Department of Fish and Wildlife, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and then the Pacific State Marine Fisheries Commission to identify the timing and location of adult returns in those reds. So the graph to the left is showing that we find the majority of reds above the Clear Creek Confluence, that's abbreviated CCR, which is about five miles upstream of Airport Road and about seven miles downstream of, of Highway 44. Uh, we look at, and the different colors on those bars show the timing of when those reds were identified uh, based on carcass surveys and aerial flyovers. So we generally look at survival and mortality in terms of temperature dependent effects versus everything else. So in consultation with NIMS, we expect negligible temperature dependent mortality in average daily water temperatures of 53 and a half Fahrenheit or colder. And once we get above 56, we see mortality picked up pretty dramatically. Unfortunately, we don't always have enough cold water to meet those temperatures. And when we're in May, we don't know how hot the summer will be or exactly where the fish will spawn. We've tried a couple of different strategies before. Uh, I think we've talked about 2014, where we started to use our cold water early and we ran out. That wasn't, uh, and many fish died. Uh, in 2015, we needed our cold water more carefully and ran warmer, but that also didn't work either. So when we were looking at the proposed action, uh, we looked at egg incubation studies uh, back all the way to 1994, which found that as the egg mass grows, the demand for dissolved oxygen, uh, which is correlated with temperature, increases. So the fish need colder water until their gills are developed and then their temperature tolerances are higher. So it made sense to us to use this information and the resulting strategy to manage cold water and the science behind it is documented in papers by Jim Anderson in the University of Washington. Next slide, please. So what we have here is our uh, conceptual approach for how we attempt to target colder water temperatures when eggs need the most dissolved oxygen. And we show this by different tiers. So tier one is shown in blue for when we have enough cold water 
to operate to 53 and a half or colder um, past the Clear Creek confluence. So we don't actually pick a tier. Uh, we look at the measured reservoir profiles. We consider warm potential meteorology conditions throughout the year, and we use models to do so. Uh, we have some experience in how much cold water pool is needed to operate within a certain tier, and those general guidelines are shown on the slide. Uh, keep in mind that is a volume where it says CWP of cold water pool, so that's different than total storage. As we start into tier two, shown in green, we would narrow the window of operating at colder temperature while still staying below 56 degrees Fahrenheit. And so we're creating warmer shoulder temperatures. At some point, life history diversity is more important and we start to trade maximizing the quantity of reds for a wider, more diverse window. And this would be the tier three condition shown in yellow. Tier four here is shown in red. And that's a condition where we do not have enough cold water to maintain 56 Fahrenheit down to Clear Creek. And that's when we get very concerned because at the 56 and warmer temperature, we start to see mortality pick up substantially. So before the reservoir stratifies, we can look at the total storage in Shasta to serve as a rough guideline. And we use total storage to project tier four. This helps us plan ahead. Uh, so this process is not formulaic. Uh, Sacramento River Temperature Task Group can support us in developing a temperature management plan, and it may create a more complex schedule as shown in the dashed line on that graph. And participants in that group include the State Water Board, State and Federal Fisher Agencies, Western Area Power Administration, tribes, and the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors. Next slide, please. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, sorry, Mr. Mooney, one moment. There it goes. Thank you. Never sure whether I froze and my <laughs> through or something else happened. So <laughs> thank you. Uh, so performance measures are how we provide the sideboards for the technical teams to develop plans. And these are the numbers that we believe may avoid jeopardy and do not preclude recovery. So we have an expected frequency based on hydrology and our operations under the 2020 operations plan. And this gives us a range of different mortality uh, for temperature dependent mortality. And then below with egg to fry survival, that gives us incentives to undertake measures with the goal of improving that survival. So any future pattern of years is going to be unique, but these provide some objectives that we think are good for uh, protecting the species and we look forward to refining them as we move forward through time. So if in any year we do not meet these performance, uh, we will charter an independent panel to review the actions and make recommendations so we can update our operation. And regardless of our performance, an independent panel in 2024 would occur to, to help us figure out how we want to navigate uh, temperature operations moving forward. So next slide. I'm sorry, before you move off that slide, Sure. If you could help me better understand this. So these are your performance measures within each of those tiers. So for example, if you're operating under tier four, your eight to five, eight to fry survival performance metric is as listed, but the performance measures don't, um, don't project how you manage the tiers or how you strive to operate towards the better mortality results? Correct. So within our proposed action, we have a commitment to try to reach the coldest tier that we can. Okay. By May 1st, uh, we also have a commitment to use our discretion to remain within that tier throughout the operations, which may require us to, to change some of our discretionary actions. And so we're striving for the best tier, which is tier one, uh, under all conditions. We've also looked at the system-wide operation for what type of actions and demands um, draw from Shasta and how we think we can uh, land in those colder tiers more frequently. But fundamentally, we're driven by 
nature and hydrology and those, those types of conditions. And then we can operate a little bit around the edges to improve upon that. But you don't have a specific performance measure for operating, say, within tier one. Uh, we would expect that we would be in tier one 68% of the time. And so our perform part of our performance measure is whether or not conditions play out such that we're in tier one 68% of the time. If not, then that's potentially a different effect on the species than we anticipated over the duration of the biological opinion. And we would adjust to try to see if a different operation makes more sense. Thank you. That helps me better understand these two charts. All right, so you may have noticed on those previous charts that uh, there's an NA for tier four. So we're looking at a tier four year, unfortunately, this year, which calls for extraordinary considerations. Uh, we think of this as an all hands on deck type of situation where we're working together to find different solutions. Uh, dry conditions and drought were one of the big drivers behind our proposed action, and it played a central role in how we think about our operation. Uh, so we've taken a, a couple of actions ahead of time. So already in place to help us out this year was our looking at the previous year for how we can increase storage in, in Shasta Reservoir through our different fall and winter refill operations, as well as some of the modifications to the coordinated operations agreement that places a greater reliance on Oroville to meet uh, Delta needs. This year, all shown in the picture, we have planned for increased use of the Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery that provides a refugio population potentially and supplementation in almost all years. And then we also have a, a drought and dry year toolkit, which is still under development. Uh, we've solicited different templates for the types of actions to consider and the coordination needed. Uh, these are all items that require some trade-off and generally mean that we're putting a lot of pressure on different constituencies. I also think it's important to recognize that the monitoring program we have now, um, and that's standard in every year, came from our experience in the last drought. So we've incorporated some of the modern statistical frameworks and those advanced technologies as part of the operation, and that's already in place. Uh, where we've worked through some of these different types of actions and the trade-off, we already have them incorporated. And so we'll have to see how they play out. Uh, we're currently preparing for a director's meeting where in the event we have two successive years with total survival less than 15%, uh, we need to look at what we can do to address the potential for a third year of low survival since the, the fish run on three-year cycles on average. So we're at the point during operations where we look first at developing the performance measures that are unique to a tier four condition. Uh, we've been engaging in our meet and confer actions with the Sacramento River Settlement contractors and talking about measures like the scheduling of spring diversions, uh, water transfers, and then the potential for delayed diversions for fall rice decomposition. In order to help some of these actions go forward, we consulted upon an expanded transfer window in the fall that we hope can open up a lot of opportunities. Uh, for the long term, we have some measures that are already in place. We've been working pretty extensively to increase our spawning and rearing habitat. We've been working with the Sacramento River Settlement contractors on barriers to reduce potential straying. Uh, we have seals on the temperature control device to reduce warm water mixing in later on in the season. Uh, we have some actions that are in the middle of implementation. We've been looking at whether we can relieve some of the Wilkins Slough requirements by using our screening program to lower some of the intakes on the most downstream diversions. And then we have some actions that are still in planning, uh, one of which is improvements to the Delta cross channel gates to enable um, more frequent operation. But luckily this year, we did not encounter a need to, to open those gates for salinity. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry, can I ask a just a quick question on that? Make sure I'm following. Sure. So the date, the months or dates that you mean with ahead of time versus during, can you just help me follow what that means? Yeah, so uh, ahead of time is, uh, it's not a, a hard calendar date. It's before we know that we're in these drought and dry year conditions. So, you know, come last fall, we spent a lot of effort looking through how do we avoid dewatering the later spawning winter run in the season how do we work with the Sacramento River Settlement contractors so that uh, fall run don't spawn in areas that will later be dried out? And then what type of flows are we going to maintain 
uh, in the river to protect those last fall runs that balances protecting those fall run while still rebuilding storage. That's one of those actions. Uh, and then some of the other ones are, are uh, efforts to just make the system better. So we're producing more food, reducing more of the stresses on fish that we can better weather these types of drought conditions. So, so ahead of time could mean any time um, in the kind of winter up until, um, I guess, at what point does it become during? I think, I don't think there's a fixed line. I think we started to get concerned in February, which is typically our greatest precipitation month. And when we were moving through that and not seeing storms on the horizon, it became pretty clear that we were shifting to a during drought. Um, I think that became even more clear in March when we started to uh, do the meet and confer and other types of actions. Okay. And um, just going back to the performance measures, um, so you are, you're working towards trying to get the highest tier possible um, ahead of time, although you probably have a sense of which tier you're gonna be in. And then you have your specific performance measures based on the tier that really kick in during. Um, but you're preparing for that, for, you know, you're making projections and preparing for that um, prior to, or in the ahead of time category. I think right? that's correct. I think one of the, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, a lot of our drought provisions are pretty rough on a lot of folks. So there's a bit of a trade-off between getting everything in place to try to prepare for a drought versus having a couple months of potential precipitation still on the horizon. I think one of the lessons we learned from 1415 is that we didn't take actions quick enough or make decisions as fast as we wish we would have. So we, I think we've accelerated that quite a bit this year, but it's always a balance of, of when do you start um, folks preparing for the worst. Thank you both. Um, and uh, I'm just uh, going to flag, I'm going to transition um, management of the meeting to the vice chair. Um, I need to transition out to something and just thank you though, uh, Mr. Mooney again for the, the, the collaboration, the work and appreciate uh, the discussion that'll continue to be had here. So just thank you. Me too. So the last slide I had is uh, looking forward and what we hope to see happen during the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group. Uh, we think there is some shaping that occur, that can occur to reduce temperature dependent mortality, even though we can't stay below that 56 degree threshold all year round. There may be times where we try to push for colder temperatures to focus on of that water. Uh, and coming up, NIMS will talk about some of the considerations and trade-offs and Liz Kiddick will talk about some of our efforts to date on a temperature plan. I believe this concludes my presentation. If there are questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Hey, do we have any other questions? I had a question. I don't know if this is um, if this is the you know if this is something that um, is the right question to you or somebody else. Um, you know, I know we've had a lot of challenges, and and I think we're all looking at. Um, you know, this time where we can't meet order 90-5 um, and have to do the temperature management plan. That's obviously why we're here today. Um, and I'm just wondering from Reclamation's point of view, if there are things that um, would be helpful to um, clarify or, or sort of um, revisit um, related to the order um, to make that more straightforward on how we can achieve those, those goals and that intent. Because I, I know it's old and I think there's been 
some areas that, um, you know, maybe there's, there's areas that could be um, clearer or adapted. And I'm curious if, if you have some thoughts on that. And again, if you're not the right person to answer that and there's somebody later, um, just let me know. Yeah, my thought uh, was going to phone a friend for Chris and if he had some <laughs> thoughts. Uh, I think we generally look at it as those are the requirements we have to meet. It seems to be, at least the order itself is pretty flexible in how we navigate it. And so I think a lot of it comes down to how we work together and how we coordinate in these challenging years, which is probably not the circumstances of this order or any order. Um, it's kind of about the willingness to pull together and come up with reasonable solutions. But Kristen may have more specific answers. Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. I mean, especially given the age, I think Diane mentioned in her presentation, you know, this is an, is an old order um, and a lot has changed since then. Um, I guess one of the biggest disconnects I see between how we're approaching things now and what was written in 90-5 is um, we've got new science. I think, I don't remember if it was Stephen uh, or Doug who went over this, that we're now seeing that it's better to shoot for a lower temperature uh, that's further upstream rather than 56 at Red Bluff. 90-5 is written to, to simply move the location of 56 degrees. Um, so it doesn't have a biological, a specific biological objective with it um, that you could that you could shoot for. Um, I think the, the science has improved. I say this as a non-biologist warning in case you ask me <laughs> how it's improved, but um, uh, I think it's improved and, and we now know enough uh, to, to, to be evaluating um, kind of uh, what, the, what the biology, how the biology might play out. So um, I think that's one of the challenges we have um, between something that says, where can you meet 56? versus how can we shape things to best meet um, uh, the needs of the species, um, particularly given the, the stressors that they might be experiencing other than temperature management. Great, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, and then Mr. Mooney, I had a question about um, the charts that you provide here on the tiers, um, and, and in particular, I'm looking here at slide. Yeah, on the performance measures and um, the color chart on uh, cold water temperature tiers. You're looking at May through October and the focus of uh, the previous part of the presentation, uh, you talked about winter one run and also fall run, but on the um, tiers, the focus is on winter run only? Yes. So we, we look at the the operation of the temperature control device and the winter run egg incubation as our, as our critical period. There's a couple other considerations that come in during temperature management, one of which is the first day that we open the, the, open the side gates, which is the lowest elevation on the reservoir. And that's kind of our, our last action to maintain temperatures. And, and that sets up how we move into the fall period and the, the potential effects on um, you know, fall run and spring run from temperatures. I, th I think the majority of our concern for fall run is generally on red dewatering, uh, but we, we do watch temperatures year round. Okay, thank you for that. All right, um, any other questions? Otherwise we'll move on. Okay, next we have um, James Gilbert. Uh, factors at, uh, affecting temperature dependent mortality and the rapid assessment tool. Uh, Mr. Gilbert from National Marine Fishery Service. All right, good morning board. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to present here today. Um, I do have a PowerPoint. Okay, so my name is James Gilbert. Um, I'm a researcher uh, at the University of California, Santa Cruz, and I work in affiliation with NOAA Fisheries at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. I believe I'm uh, joined on the line uh, by my colleagues, uh, Eric Danner and Miles Daniels. Um, they may jump in if there's a particular question that, um, or an answer that they can provide um, beyond my expertise. 
Uh, but today I'm going to talk about um, some ongoing efforts um, looking at the uh, factors affecting temperature dependent mortality um, and how they uh, may be useful for um, seasonal temperature management in a year like this. Next slide, please. Uh, to just briefly orient you to the uh, presentation here, um, I'll be talking about uh, first just a little background on temperature dependent egg mortality, and then move on to how we use models to estimate, estimate uh, that mortality. And then finally, uh, the last part, talk about uh, the rapid temperature dependent mortality framework that we've been developing. Next slide. I'd like to preface my talk um, by pointing out that uh, I work um, with uh, my colleagues at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center, and our work is uh, motivated by the mission of the center uh, to generate and communicate uh, the science necessary for conservation and management. Um, I'm not here to uh, prescribe any particular action, but to um, provide some information on um, the methods that we're developing and the information that can provide um, for other analysis. Next slide. So I apologize for the uh, slide full of text here. This is just a, a disclaimer because I want to make uh, clear at the outset here that what I'm presenting on is um, a new method and um, it's important to kind of understand how we interpret the results of that in the context of the broader um, analytical approaches that have been established. Um, what I'm presenting here uh, is meant to be um, information to assist with other modeling analysis um, and I do not intend it to be uh, the direct source of information on which um, any decisions will rest. Uh, next slide. Uh, I'll be referencing a few different acronyms uh, for different phrases and things throughout the talk. Um, you've already seen temperature dependent mortality, TDM show up a lot. Also uh, TCD, temperature control device, we're referring to the, um, the infrastructure at Shasta for uh, selective withdrawal of different uh, temperatures. Mr. Next slide. I'm sorry, yes. I, I'm going to just um, forgive me, but I'm going to interrupt here. Yeah. I should have Go been ahead. more mindful of the time uh, before you got started. I think that uh, this um, and Mr. Lawfer um, pinged me on this as well. This probably would have been a good opportunity for a break. I'm looking at your slides and uh, this is pretty significant um, stuff that we're going to be going through here. So I just want to check in with my colleagues. Um, we uh, are planning on taking um, a noon hour um, lunch for a full hour. Um, Chair Escoville is actually headed on his way to Mendocino to meet with the governor. The governor will be meeting with local communities there regarding the drought and provide um, announcements regarding addressing drought resilience. And so I think that uh, we probably want to carve out um, a noon hour, full hour lunch so that we and the public that are following this would have the opportunity to follow those announcements. Um, so just checking in with you all, um, do you wanna, uh, in light of the fact we'll be taking a full hour at noon, should we take a quick break uh, right now or uh, press on through? I, I, I would have taken a break, but Mr. Gilbert just gotten started. So just wanna check in with you all. Um, just that I would just ask for a five minute break if we could, and then jump okay. back in if that works for you. Okay, sounds good. We will be back in five minutes just for everyone to take a quick break. And Mr. Gilbert, um, uh, bear with us and um, apologies for cutting into your presentation. Thank you. That's fine. Thanks.
Hello, before the uh, board resumes in about a minute, uh, we have one individual who came into the board meeting um, with a username of C space LG. I'm going to invite you to unmute in a moment. And if you could let us know who you are so that we can go ahead and rename you and get you in the correct place in the speaker order. So once again, this is somebody who's joined the Zoom platform with the initials C space LG. You should get a message in just a moment to unmute. And if you could let us know who you are. Once again, right before we start here, we have one individual in the Zoom platform with the initials C space LG. We cannot associate you with the presenter or speaker card. Oh, my name's Celia. I'm just a member of the public interested in public comment. Okay, and what was the first name? Just so that, were you um, an individual that had submitted? Is this, okay, I see you, Celia. Okay, we'll get you renamed so that when we get to you in the speaker order, um, I know you noted that you wanted to speak if necessary, and we'll have you up on the, the scroll screen later this afternoon. Um, Great. Speak if necessary. Thanks. Thanks. Oops. Okay. Um, Mr. Gilbert. All right, thank you. So uh, picking up where we uh, left off, um, these are just a, a few of the acronyms I may reference. Um, I think we move on to the next slide. So um, to start off with, I'll talk a little bit of um, context and background for understanding um, temperature dependent mortality. Next slide. So. This has been covered in pre previous presentations, so I won't dwell on this too much, uh, but it, uh, understanding temperature dependent mortality comes down to understanding temperature and time. And if you could click forward one, um, the uh, reds don't show up in the river um, all at once, but rather they happen over a period of time. And if you think about um, when the um, eggs are laid in the river, uh, the clock starts on the incubation period, and um, if you start accumulating all of the eggs as they're incubating, um, if you click ahead one, uh, you would get a distribution of eggs in the river that looks something like this uh, bell-shaped curve here. And um, uh, click ahead one. The, this happens to coincide with the, the warmest weather um, during the, the hot part of the year. So there's a risk that um, some or part of this distribution is going to experience uh, warm temperatures and temperature-related uh, mortality. Uh, one more click ahead. And so if we think about uh, this distribution of eggs and the temperatures that they experience, um, if there is a, a lot of cold water um, that can keep the water temperatures down towards 53 and a half degrees, uh, then you'll save uh, most of that, uh, that bell curve. If there's only a limited amount of cold water, then you start um, narrowing the band um, of that distribution that, can, um, that will survive. And that's what the, the colored bars in that uh, figure are meant to represent, that, that variation. And you can just go ahead and click uh, forward two more. Um, that's just indicating that um, the, um, the uh, choices you have, basically when you have a limited amount of cold water. Next slide, please. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that temperature dependent mortality is just one source of mortality. I believe it was mentioned in an earlier um, presentation that um, we tend to think of it as temperature dependent mortality and all other um, sources. So it's just again, um, a reminder of that. Next slide. And of course, uh, this does not occur in, a, um, in isolation, but rather temperature dependent mortality is the um, res result of a complex set of interconnected processes. And um, I'll ask you to just uh, click forward six times, if you will, there. Um, really, it's a, a combination of all of these things and how they interact, things that start up at um, the inflow and storage in Shasta, uh, the weather 
um, the amount of water being brought in from Trinity, um, how water is released at Keswick, and uh, when and where the reds are, and the river temperatures that they experience. Next slide. And so we use models as a way to organize and integrate all of that information and all of these processes together. Next slide. And the way it's uh, traditionally done is to use a, a model of um, temperature stratification and selective withdrawal or uh, TCD operation for the Shasta Reservoir. And information from a, a model of that uh, feeds into a temperature model for Keswick Reservoir which in turn feeds into a model of river temperature. And all of that then uh, allows us to estimate the uh, temperature effects on mortality in the river. And on the right-hand side there, I've just uh, listed the modeling platforms that are uh, often used for these sorts of analyses. Next slide. The Southwest Fisheries Science Center uh, has um, a simulation framework and I'll refer to this as the, the full simulation framework uh, that consists of uh, models for Shasta and Keswick reservoirs using the CQUAL W2 platform, and then a river temperature model for the Upper Sacramento River, and that's called RAFT, and then um, a model for estimating temperature-dependent mortality. Uh, these are all uh, complex models with high spatial and temporal resolution, and I will note that they um, have undergone a, um, an independent review by the Center for Independent Experts, Information on those reviews is provided at the UN, uh, the URL there at the bottom for the, the CV temp website that's hosted by NOAA. Um, and going back to the, the fact that these models are um, more complex, uh, generally it takes about uh, 30 minutes to run a simulation for uh, one year when we consider all of these different components. Next slide. Uh, this framework uh, works very well for um, analyzing targeted scenarios in the system. And the, the workflow diagram there on the left is meant to represent um, the, the process and the workflow that's existed in recent years. And uh, the idea is that um, there is a single or maybe a, a handful of operational scenarios and informa information from that is fed into uh, the reservoir and river models and all that together, um, we'll call the, the full model. And from that, we get a, an estimate of temperature dependent mortality. And um, basically it's one estimate for one operational scenario. And that information um, can be used for management discussion and uh, decision-making. Uh, this approach is, uh, has a lot of benefits. It's straightforward. Uh, there's just a few scenarios to um, interpret and understand. Um, and it's really great for fine tuning um, an operational scenario that's already constrained. And when we're only considering a few simulations at a time, uh, the amount of time it takes to simulate is not generally a problem. Next slide. Uh, but if there are cases where we want to um, expand the scope of the operational scenarios we consider or uncertainties in the system, um, this approach might not work as well. And that's uh, motivation behind or what we're calling the rapid TDM framework. Next slide. So a little bit about uh, the motivation. Uh, we're scientists and we're interested in, in understanding uh, the factors at play in the system um, broadly in the Central Valley, uh, but specifically for winter run Chinook in the upper Sacramento River. And we're interested at understanding this across uh, scales, you know, not just seasonal, but um, multi-year and decadal. And um, like I mentioned previously, considering important uncertainties, like things like um, how uh, meteorology changes uh, and uh, impacts from, from climate and longer term trends. Next slide. And uh, to think about this in a different way, um, we can approach it as considering uh, the interactions between environmental uh, factors, things that aren't under our control, and uh, the operations, the things that are under control. And um, if you could advance one, one click, you can summarize it as thinking about how do the, does the uncertainty in the environmental factors affect the options available on the uh, operational side for the things that we can control. 
Next slide. And I thought I'd um, further uh, illustrate the motivation for our rapid assessment analysis framework uh, by talking through a, a hypothetical scenario. And generally we can think of in, in the spring, uh, we may have some information about water supply forecasts for the rest of the year and some idea of uh, what the meteorology might look like and its uncertainty. And we're interested in understanding um, how will different release schedules and operation of the TCD affect uh, TDM in the Sacramento River um, this year. Okay, advance one. So some things we might consider uh, would be some dry uh, Shasta inflow scenarios, uh, perhaps five different uh, warm uh, weather scenarios. And then a selection of 10 different patterns, each for um, releases and imports um, from Shasta and Trinity, respectively. And then uh, 10 patterns for how we shape that uh, target temperature downstream. If you could advance one more. If we look at all of the combinations of each of these factors, that um, adds up very quickly. Uh, we come up with 15,000 different scenarios to look at. Um, advance one more. And um, down at the bottom there, um, if we assume that it takes about 30 minutes for each of those, uh, that would take three, about 310 days total uh, to run through all of that analysis. And uh, you can see that quickly that becomes an in infeasible task for looking at uh, this broader range of uh, analysis. Next slide. So uh, acknowledging uh, that potential limitation, we started developing this uh, rapid assessment methodology Click ahead one. And uh, this is built on um, some existing uh, but simplified sim simulation methods. And the um, goal is to be able to simulate all of these components, uh, but have it only take about a few seconds uh, per year per model run. Um, and it includes um, all the same components, so uh, a vertically stratifying Shasta Dam with the ability to um, reflect uh, selective withdrawal through the TCD. Uh, the Keswick Dam and Reservoir downstream, and then a uh, simplified version of the river below Keswick. Uh, next. The approach has been to uh, start as simple as possible and add complexity where necessary. Um, and uh, next. And then um, acknowledging too that there will be a process of iterative refinement. And we rely on these more complex models to help identify and guide the improvements uh, to that uh, the rapid model. Next. Uh, I'll mention this here and I'll, I'll mention it again. Um, this is meant to be a complement to and not a replacement for uh, the full simulation approach. Next slide. So if we revisit this workflow and decision-making process again um, and add in the ability to run a broader range of scenarios, um, advance one, we can see that the, the workflow um, can be expanded and now includes um, this process where we consider the um, outputs from this rapid approach, uh, where we look at patterns, trends, and sensitivities, and under a process re review, um, use that information to identify scenarios um, that we might not have considered before, uh, but that would be worthwhile for evaluating using the, the full models. Um, I've closed the loop on uh, that top iteration cycle um, because we expect that there might be information from the full model runs that may then feed back into further uh, rapid analysis. The final step of the process is still um, the um, going from the full model to the decision making process. Um, it's just now that there may be um, additional information provided through the rapid information about um, context for sensitivity and uh, different factors that are important. Next slide. Um, again, uh, I'm just emphasizing that this is a, a new analysis uh, method and um, it's currently under active refinement and testing. And so um, we need to be cautious about how we, um, how we apply the results of this. Um, and it's really intended to be a way of informing um, these more complicated models in a way that um, doesn't, isn't so uh, resource intensive. And um, we're really hopeful that this can provide a lot of value and um, directing the, uh, the analytical power of these complex models in a way that's really helpful. Next slide. Okay, 
So uh, that's kind of the basis for this rapid analysis framework. Um, and now I'd like to kind of walk through a little bit of an example um, of how this would be applied. Next slide. So to start off with, um, this is just a, an example of how we might um, hypothetically uh, vary uh, the release patterns. Uh, the two plots at the bottom are meant to indicate the uh, one way of uh, producing um, scenarios for um, a given, uh, given simulation using the rapid framework. And if you click forward uh, three, I believe, um, there should be lines that pop up. And the idea here is that because we have the ability to consider a broad range of analysis, we can pick uh, different patterns of releases at Keswick or uh, Trinity imports at the, the Spring, Spring Creek um, power plant uh, inflow to Keswick and um, look to see if there's any benefit to different timing or amounts at different months of the year um, and use that information in, um, in the rapid model to inform uh, further modeling. Next slide. On the other side of the operational uh, set of factors is uh, how uh, the TCD is operated to meet a temperature target. And um, Dave uh, addressed this uh, somewhat in his presentation and I'll um, go over it again here. Um, the idea is that um, when there's uh, cold water available to meet a, a certain period of cold water downstream, uh, we talk about shaping or assigning a, a temperature target pattern. And what I mean by that pattern is uh, represented by the orange line on the plot at the, or the schematic at the right. And that's meant to reflect a time series of river temperature at a point. And uh, we've conceptualized the components of this pattern um, into four different variables uh, beyond the location on the river. First of those is the target temperature. Um, that's indicated by B there. That's the coldest temperature that can be um, achieved during or is attempted to be achieved during a, a particular period. The length of that um, period that's uh, attempted to be maintained is uh, we call that the target window or the window length. And that window length uh, the timing is uh, assigned by the centering date. Um, so for example, if there was an eight week window with a centering date on August 1st, there would be four weeks of a target temperature uh, before and four weeks after August 1st. Uh, the final component is that higher temperature indicated by E. Um, that's, we call it the shoulder temperature and that's the um, higher temperature that's maintained outside of the target window. Next slide. On the environmental side of things, uh, we would probably want to consider um, variability in things like hydrology. Um, and there's lots of different sources for that information. Um, we can look at historical data. Um, the uh, data shown here in the plot just shows some examples of historical data and their variability for inflow to Shasta. Um, there's also information from forecasts and um, we, there are other methods for synthesizing, for example, dry hydrology. Next slide. On the flip side of that, uh, we would also be interested in understanding um, the impact of meteorological variability, especially things like uh, heat waves and cool spells and uh, how they might affect temperature management through a season. Next slide. So those are the, the general categories of inputs to the system. Um, what kind of information do we get out of these sorts of models? And we can break them down into two main categories, the, the physical components or the, the physical uh, outcomes in the system, meaning the amount of water and the temperature of that water, um, and then the biological components. And um, I will point out here that the, um, both the rapid assessment model framework and the full simulation framework um, both include the same components. And so all of this information is available from both approaches. Um, and so the, the plots here um, apply or can be represented from, from both approaches. Starting upstream, uh, we can get information on conditions in Shasta Reservoir as they're simulated through a season. <clears throat> and that includes uh, <clears throat> volume and uh, temperatures. The colors there indicate uh, temperatures going from cool to warm, blue to the, the yellow color there. And you'll notice that there's gray boxes or gray rectangles 
um, overlaid on top. And that's meant to replicate or represent the <clears throat> operation of the TCD gates uh, throughout the season in response to uh, the release operations and the temperatures in um, the reservoir. Uh, next. Uh, we would also be interested in um, looking at the, the releases and how the storage in the reservoir uh, evolves through the season. That's just shown as an example plot there on the bottom. Next slide. And as we move downstream, uh, we would be interested then in seeing what the river temperatures, uh, what they were simulated to be at a point and how well uh, they were able to meet a given target temperature. And again, that's represented as that orange line that pattern there. Next. So those are the physical components. Uh, all of this ultimately feeds into um, our estimation of temperature dependent mortality, um, the, the biological side of things. And <clears throat> because we have temperature at uh, many points on the river through time, <clears throat> we can have an estimate of what the probability of temperature dependent mortality is uh, at all of those points in times. And putting all that information together, uh, we call that a temperature dependent mortality landscape. And that's shown here in the, um, the colored plot. Uh, the idea is that as you go along uh, the X axis, uh, you're going through time. So that's how uh, the probability of temperature dependent mortality changes through time. The Y axis is the distance um, downstream from Keswick with Keswick being at the top where the zero is. The uh, darker orange and red colors indicate higher um, probability of temperature dependent mortality. And the, the cooler, I don't really see them too much on this plot, but the cooler green and blue temperatures mean a lower probability of temperature dependent mortality. All of this information exists uh, separately from uh, where the reds are. So we can overlay um, the either hypothetical or real time uh, or historical uh, red distributions to get an idea of what the overall temperature dependent mortality would be under those conditions. And um, if you advance a couple uh, slides, or a couple of clicks forward, um, the uh, white dots there shown um, represent a historical distribution of reds. And if you compare where those reds are to uh, the uh, mortality landscape, you see that the um, ones on the edge, if you advance one, uh, tend to be in places with high mortality probabilities and uh, would likely um, experience mortality. Uh, next slide. Okay, so that's all um, the, the hypothetical um, inputs and the information we may get out. Uh, the last part here, I'd like to talk through um, an example analysis where we explore alternative operations um, based on information um, from this year. Uh, and this starts from a baseline scenario um, where we have a, a single schedule of releases at Keswick and a single set of um, Trinity imports. And um, those are discussed uh, briefly uh, earlier this morning. The second part of this is a, a temperature target that we call our, our baseline target with a constant 56 degrees Fahrenheit at the CCR or uh, Clear Creek point uh, for a period of, of May through October. Uh, I do want to point out that uh, a target is just that. It's uh, something uh, that the model and or operator in real life would try to meet, but there's no guarantee uh, that that temperature can be or will be maintained uh, for that period. From that baseline scenario, uh, we built a broader scope of analysis to be considered with this uh, rapid TDM analysis framework. And um, a big component of that was considering many different combinations of those temperature target uh, parameters or variables. Uh, so that's things that, that move the temp target temperature up and down or left and right and um, move that shoulder temperature up and down as well. Uh, we also considered uh, two different uh, dry, very dry hydrologies and a range of warm uh, meteorology time series. On top of that, then we also considered a modified release schedule where we reduced releases by 5% um, during the summer months. Next slide. Just as a reminder, uh, this step of the process running through the rapid uh, simulator model um, before we get to the, the 
point of running through models and making decisions. Uh, it, we in, intend for this to be a, um, an exercise in uh, looking at patterns, trends, and sensitivities, and being able to pick from this broad range of many thousands of scenarios, um, a few that would be useful for running through uh, the full model. Next slide. So <clears throat> we've run through uh, these uh, scenarios through the rapid simulator approach. Um, and now we have uh, many thousands of results to sort through. And um, admittedly, that's, um, it can be a challenge to try and uh, interpret everything. And so one of the methods uh, we've uh, applied is um, using visualizations to help identify and communicate uh, these patterns. And I know there's a lot on this screen here, so I'll kind of um, walk through it step by step and hopefully it will uh, make sense. So if we first start from, I think about this as being a, um, a process of adding um, different filters to select down out of our big data set, um, we can move from a general, uh, uh, more, the more general broad data set and uh, start focusing in on um, different components that are of interest. The plots here show um, a, just a single target location. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're assuming that CCR location. And uh, we're also just assuming a single baseline release scenario. From that, uh, you see that there are five different plots. And each one of those represents a different shoulder temperature. Um, that's the, the warmer temperature outside of the target window um, that will be assessed with the model. And um, as you go from left to right in the plots, those are shoulder temperatures going from 56 up to 61 degrees. Now within each of the plots, you'll notice there are three different sets of colored dots. The color indicates the target temperature. So that's the colder temperature um, used to guide the shaping of um, temperature control. <clears throat> uh, and then you'll notice on individual plots, there's an x-axis that's the window length in weeks. And then the y-axis, shows uh, the temperature dependent mortality on an annual average basis. Finally, uh, you'll see that there is a variability in each of the, the uh, vertical columns of dots of a single color. Uh, that is the variability um, that comes about by assuming uh, different uh, inflow hydrology and meteorologies um, in the analysis framework. I put a line through each of the colored, the, the sets of colored dots to help I, um, kind of visualize and identify the patterns. And if we look across all of these, uh, we can see a few things stand out. Uh, first, the, the warmer, the warmest target temperature of 56 degrees um, has the highest temperature dependent mortality across all scenarios. So that we can see comparing to the, the blue and black lines there that there is improvement to be gained by looking at some period of a uh, cooler target temperature. And if we look at those blue and black lines, we see that uh, as we move from the eight week to the 12 through 16 week period, uh, the temperature dependent mortality tends to um, curve down. Uh, so from that we can, um, this, this suggests to us that uh, not only is it better to have some period of um, target temperature below 56, uh, that the 12 to 16 week period might be uh, the most beneficial. Next slide. If we uh, look at the same information again, but for assuming the 5% summer reduction to baseline uh, releases, we see very similar patterns, uh, but now there appears to be an incremental um, improvement uh, that is a lowering of the um, average temperature dependent mortality. Uh, but again, with uh, pretty similar um, results. Next slide. So we're at the stage of then, after we've reviewed these results, uh, we can um, use that information to identify scenarios for um, additional simulation. Uh, in this case, uh, we can look at the results that I just showed, and um, that suggests that it would be helpful to consider target temperatures in this uh, 53 and a half to 54 and a half or more broadly, a temperature below 56 degrees uh, for some period of time, uh, specifically a window length of 12 to 16 weeks. And um, there is, looks like a little benefit to having a shoulder temperature warmer than 56 uh, for a period 
Um, and then there is an incremental benefit to uh, reductions in release volume. So now we're into the point of um, we've defined some scenarios and the next step, and it's again highlighted in the uh, red oval on the left, is uh, picking out those scenarios and running them with the, the full uh, detailed trusted and vetted models. Next slide. So in this case, uh, we picked uh, three different scenarios to run through uh, the Southwest Fishery Science Center's uh, SQL W2 reservoir models and the raft river models. So these are the, the full complexity models. The scenarios are a, a base scenario, which is the uh, single release schedule and the constant 56 downstream target. Uh, the second scenario is building off of that baseline scenario um, with some temperature target shaping informed by the previous analysis and the uh, details for that are shown there. And the last um, scenario is built on that uh, uh, temperature target shaping scenario and includes an additional uh, reduction in monthly releases through the summer. So from the, um, from the rapid analysis, we would see that uh, we'd expect that there'd be an incremental reduction in temperature dependent mortality with each of these. And if you advance one, uh, we see that the um, results from this full analysis indicate uh, uh, this consistent trend. Uh, we move from a baseline uh, annual TDM of 85% down to 69% uh, with an incremental reduction in between. Um, I will note here that the uh, rapid assessment model in the analysis we've done up to this point uh, seems to be a little more optimistic in uh, some of these, although that the, the trends for um, temperature, temperature uh, dependent mortality reduction um, appear to uh, be consistent. Next slide. So the uh, next few slides here are just showing the uh, depictions of the results from uh, the full models. And we don't need to dwell too much on these here, um, but the, we can kind of um, use this information to understand uh, components of the result outside of just that single annual temperature dependent mortality number. Um, and in particular, if we advance uh, between this slide and the next, um, we can see that uh, there's differences in that uh, bottom plot and particularly the amount of uh, that cooler colors, the, the green colors that show up, um, indicates that there is a broader uh, space and time where uh, the reds have a higher probability of survival. And um, that can be helpful for understanding um, the, the different, um, or understanding or prioritizing different um, timing and um, spatial distribution of red uh, survival. And if we move on to the next slide, uh, this shows a similar um, pattern, again, just an incremental, incremental uh, improvement in the blue colors in that bottom uh, plot. And next slide. So uh, as I mentioned earlier, this um, rapid TDM framework is uh, new and in, under um, current testing and, and refinement. And uh, we expect to uh, learn a lot through this challenging year and um, uh, look forward to further iteration and comparison with the complex models to, um, to improve it. Uh, we'd also like to continue uh, documentation and sensitivity analysis. And from a scientific perspective, uh, work towards using this as a way to expanding um, our understanding of trends across multiple years and, and decades. Next slide. Um, just a few summary points. Um, again, I, I won't dwell on these too much, but um, using models, uh, all right, is a good way to have an integrated uh, tributary to TDM um, assessment method. And uh, from a scientific perspective, uh, we think it's really important to understand um, the drivers of TDM at just the season, not just the seasonal scale, but beyond. And the limitations of the current approach um, prompted us to explore other ways of doing this more, more quickly, uh, especially so we can understand uh, the effect of different uncertainties and we'll continue working towards uh, using this as a way to identify and help um, assist with um, guiding the traditional full complexity models in a seasonal framework as well. Next slide. <clears throat> uh, just reiterating, uh, this is a, a, new, uh, a new tool and it's, it's not meant to be a replacement for the trusted embedded models. Um, and it's, um, 
nothing from the, the rapid analysis framework should be construed as a prescription for a particular operation. Uh, it's just a way of understanding uh, different uh, sensitivities and trends. And um, hopefully it's uh, useful in a way that we can uh, test some of the um, outcomes and, and patterns through the uh, more complex models. And next slide. The two uh, final points, and I, I think this uh, pertains to all modeling, not just the, the rapid analysis framework. Um, but um, the first is that uh, temperature dependent modeling and temperature modeling for the upper Sacramento River generally tends to um, not take into account some of the limits and constraints imposed by just the realities of uh, operating the integrated CDP and SWP system. Uh, there are lots of constraints that uh, we didn't impose in the modeling we've done. Um, so that's an important thing uh, to consider. Um, and then the final point then is there are also significant uncertainties, especially in things like uh, meteorological conditions and uh, the distribution of REDS uh, that may affect the outcomes um, in real life that are in a way that we have not tested. Even though we've broadened the, the scope, um, there is still uncertainty. And with that, um, I think I will conclude and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Gilbert. That's a lot to digest and um, really um, interesting work uh, that you and the center have been involved in. Um, so um, I'm sure there'll be some questions. Um, who'd like to start? Sure, I'll, I'll start. So I just wanna thank you um, for <laughs> clearly the significant amount of work that you've put into this over the last, well, I don't know how long you've been working on this tool, but in development of this tool. And it's really intriguing to, to the notion that we're able to now look at thousands of different scenarios and permutations, given all the caveats, you know, we don't know everything here, um, but it could be a really informative and helpful tool going forward. And so one of my questions, my initial questions anyway, is just about the tool itself. You know, it seems like um, your science center has a number of different models. And I know you explained that they're peer reviewed and, and this one clearly is still uh, to some degree in its infancy and under development. But are you, have you made these tools available to the public generally? Uh, or do you plan to at some point in the near future? I you know, understand that things you know, take time to get over the finish line, but I'd just like to hear your perspective on that. Sure, yeah, and um, from my perspective, uh, my my hope is to be able to, um, you know, make some or any part of this process uh, more publicly available as the tool matures. Um, the, you know, precise timeline for that, I, I'm not sure I can confidently uh, uh, attest to that right now. Um, and I see that the Eric popped on and he may have um, some further uh, insight or, or guidance on the, this question as well. Yeah, hi, uh, this is Eric Danner. Um, I lead the biophysical ecology team at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center. And I, I work with, uh, with James and also Miles Daniels on developing all these tools. And um, we, we have our, our current website, the CV Temp uh, website, which uh, incorporates some of these analyses and our and our plan is to um, as the tools mature and as they become more vetted we will build more and more of those into the website um, but the in the longer term we may also uh, actually develop products that are uh, uh, that, that we can pass on to others to run themselves um, all of that future is a little bit hazy at this point but but our goal is to make th this information uh, far more accessible. Okay, I, I appreciate that. I, yeah, I've heard of, in recent months, I know there have been a number of discussions about the different tools that are available. I know Reclamation has some, you know, other parties have tools looking at different aspects of, of temperature projections, reservoir operations, TDM and the like. And so, you know, I'm certainly just one that is a proponent of transparency and, and making these tools generally available, uh, acknowledging that they have different uh, foundations, different assumptions, and they're not always going to agree. But having those tools out in the public domain, I think, is, is only going to be helpful down the road. So I appreciate that commitment. That's my only question at the moment. Uh, 
others? Um, just a clarifying question. I thought I heard you said during your presentation that the tool tends to underestimate temperature dependent, dependent mortality. Um, could you further expand upon that? Yeah, so it, it tends to be um, a little more optimistic in that, um, and this is something we're continuing to um, analyze and, and look into more. Um, compared to the more complex models, um, it appears to be able to um, utilize the cold water a little more efficiently than I think um, happens in real life. Um, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a result of the, um, uh, the fact that there are simplifications to make the, um, the model run more quickly. I have I'll ask some questions. Um, one is, I, I saw that you, you know, in Next Steps um, had doing more sensitivity analysis. Um, and I'm just interested if you already have some um, sense of, you know, sensitivity to different factors um, that and, and criteria that you um, uh, including storage and releases and that kind of thing in terms of temperature dependent mortality results or, um, I mean, again, all the caveats to say that's really a big focus going forward. I'm just wondering what you're, you're seeing already. Yeah, so I can speak generally um, what we've seen um, from the analysis recently. Um, we see that there is a, a sensitivity um, to the, the temperature targeting um, that we sh uh, showed earlier in those plots. Um, and that there is this um, an incremental benefit to um, releasing less water, uh, particularly in the earlier um, summer months. Um, I think that's, you know, qualitatively, it uh, you know, makes sense that um, if we can hold more cold water back and have it available um, a little bit later, uh, that that is helpful. Um, more broadly, uh, the in terms of the, the hydrology and the meteorology, uh, those are important um, components too, and I think um, uh, if you look at the variability in the colored dots on those plots, you see that there is um, you know, substantial spread for a given operation uh, just based on the uh, what the inflow of the Shasta and the temperatures end up, end up being throughout the summer. Um, and so I think um, there, there is a um, substantial amount of uh, sensitivity uh, that is, you know, should be considered there as well. Great, thanks. Um, uh, I, you know, the other question, and I, this may be for, for other panelists that came before, but this seems like such a um, kind of game changer in terms of the, the tool um, ability to pull together so many things um, and be, uh, you know, to the extent that that we're able to um, to fully develop and and mature the tool and and um, you know get the kind of uh, refinements that we need on this, I'm just curious what that um, how you know the the bureau and DWR um, are looking you know think that having this kind of tool um, might change things for for the the process that they have to do in terms of balancing and planning. Sorry to, to pull up other people. I don't know if they're still available. <laughs> White. Oh, Mr. Mooney, okay. Mr. Mooney, you're, uh, you appear to still be muted. Oh, sorry, did I say DWP, DWR? I can do that. And yeah. I guess we don't have, I, I, there we go. There you go. Mr. Mooney. Yeah, I think when we look at this tool, it's a, a really good opportunity to look at the range of potential objectives we could set. And I think it helps us um, have a reasonable understanding of what we might be able to achieve or not achieve. I think when we look at it, we start adding uh, some of the other requirements of the system on top and it, 
that narrows a lot of the potential there, but at least uh, knowing what our options are and where we can kind of focus efforts to try to perform a little better for fisheries uh, is extremely helpful. I think we're looking forward to seeing it develop, to get the chance to look under the hood and understand the assumptions it's making and how it's uh, simplifying matters and how it's working and, and gain some confidence on uh, just the, the verification and validation elements of it. But it's been a, a great help this year. If, if I can just uh, jump in here again, uh, and I just want to remind everybody that, that James and, and I are uh, at the Southwest Fishery Science Center, so we are an independent uh, branch of NOAA, of NIMS than the, the regulatory side of things. And so we take a very um, scientific approach to this work. We, we don't, uh, we, we have the liberty uh, with, with good reason for uh, being able to not be distracted by many of the uh, things that, that uh, the real life um, requirements that the Bureau and other agencies have to deal with. And so we are just trying to get solutions um, and understand understand the drivers in the system. So, uh, and James's last slide, you know, addressed that, that, you know, these models don't take into account the many multiple requirements that the Bureau and, and DWR have to take into account when they're managing their systems. But right. just following up on that, couldn't you build that into the scenarios, like as we, um, to help with that? portion as this matures is am I understanding that right you could build some of those build build the constraints in terms of maybe narrowing down the scenarios that you're running absolutely I, you know so that our first uh, run of this model was something like 20,000 scenarios the vast majority of which were probably unrealistic and those can be filtered out either beforehand or afterwards for our initial uh, investigations though we we don't want to constrain it in any way so we can understand what the drivers are, but then for application, that would be different. Great, okay. Yeah. Ms. White, did you have something to add? Ah, yes, thank you. I, I couldn't unmute myself earlier. Uh, <laughs> um, thanks, yeah, I wanted to echo a little bit of what Dave said that we're, we are very excited about this tool, um, but also bring up the, uh, I think James mentioned in his that this, uh, at least not yet, this is not a prescriptive uh, approach of this is the best, um, this is the best solution. But I think one of the things that we balance uh, or that we struggle with in, in any limited cold water pool year is, is risk trade-off. And so I think one of the biggest benefits of this tool is trying to help us kind of focus on uh, if you were to prioritize temperature dependent mortality as the highest objective, how do the other risks fall out? And this tool has been really great at helping us identify that. And I think you'll hear a little bit more about that in some of the later presentations. Um, and, and I think that's a big thing that we're looking for feedback on um, is just given, given these, uh, these results. And, and the, I know uh, we've only done um, limited full, full simulation scenarios, but given these, how should we be looking at risks? Great. Yeah. It, just so I'm following that, that makes so much sense. Um, so it means that you can, again, sort of narrow in which scenarios you're looking at to understand um, also which factors may um, have the biggest impact on um, mortality, but then also, I think, um, obviously balance that with, with all of the, the um, goals that you're having to manage. Um, yeah, that's so helpful. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, and, and also the biological risks. I think you'll hear about this in a little bit, but I, I don't think that we had been talking about scenarios. I think, Eric, you were showing scenarios with shoulder temps of 59 degrees, and I think uh, runs have been done with, with higher temperatures. That's something we hadn't been talking about. And of course, that's going to come with its own risks, which will be talked about later in the presentation. But um, but given the results that we're seeing, it kind of helps inform what that risk is and how we should be analyzing it. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, you know, this may be a, um, you know, a silly question, but, um, and Vice Chair, I think you are helping me understand this. Um, but just in terms of, um, you know, those temperature targets, if we're only looking at um, winter run, which obviously is the, the priority because of the, um, the, the danger, um, is 
how does that impact, are, are we able to look at how that, that may impact the ability to um, meet temperature for fall run? How does, can you just help me understand a little bit how those, those sort of temperature targetings relate and may um, uh, have to balance against each other? Again, I, I understand winter runs the priority here. Yeah, I can, um, you know, just say from the modeling perspective, we go through the, um, in these simulations, we go through the end of the year. Um, so we have information on um, temperatures going through um, the fall. Um, and so, you know, up to this point, our focus has been on the winter run, um, but the information is there for um, further analysis. And, and I would just follow up that, that uh, you know, because it is a full reservoir simulation as well, that tells you what the end of September storage will be, and you can then use that uh, for planning purposes for the following years. Um, and not, not, to, uh, not to, to digress too much, but you know, there are other uh, simulations that we can run with this model, such as what are the advantages of, of pulse flows, of releases of more water in the spring that would benefit out-migrating salmon at the cost potentially of, of cold water uh, in the summer. Uh, and all of those, uh, you know, all those take many, many simulations. So this is a tool that could uh, could work for that as well. Mr. Mooney, did you have something to add? Yeah, I think one of the conditions we see coming into the fall is just a much greater spread of hydrology and meteorology variability. So um, in general, when we start to see the very specific temperature modeling, um, we tend to go back to more of the, the guidelines and the historical experience just because it tends to have a little bit more challenging for us to, to rely upon those models. But I think at least in my distant past, being a modeler myself, I'm hopeful that we can get some tools to help us navigate that. Anything else, board member Firestone? No, I mean, I just don't, I don't know if DWR wanted to weigh in, but um, fine if, if not, happy to, to move forward. That was really helpful. I actually had a follow-up question uh, for you, Mr. Mooney. Um, so you had uh, talked about earlier that the focus on fall run is more uh, red dewatering. And in some of the, I just wanna take advantage of your presence at this point, because I think that there may be some discussion later about shifting on schedule for transfers. And I'm not quite following that 5% reduction scenario. Um, I know for the um, uh, temperature um, you, you had in one of your slides, Mr. Gilbert, a, a window, but I don't know on the 5% what the window is for those reductions. So just um, if you could, if, if any, Mr. Mooney or Mr. Gilbert comment on the, um, uh, the, the period of time for the 5% reduction and also uh, that issue of transfers and um, any voluntary actions that might be taken that could impact the red dewatering um, timeframe of concern. Um, so in terms of the, the modeling, uh, we used um, a 5% reduction through, um, it ended in September, um, the, in terms of reducing the releases. Um, and that the temperature targeting over that period was the same as in the um, the, the first temperature targeting scenario. Um, does that, is that what you're asking about? So it runs uh, on the 5% reduction, it runs the entire length? Uh, so it, it goes, uh, the reduction ends in September. So it goes back to the baseline flows uh, at the end of September. Okay. So at, at this stage in the year, um, where we don't have a full temperature management plan, we don't know the stratification. Um, we have assumptions we make on what kind of additional capability these types of actions might add. And so when we look at some just hypothetical windows of maintaining 56 for a longer period of time, we look at if we are doing these transfers and we're seeing a reduction in these early season releases, uh, we think that helps us extend that temperature window by a, a couple of weeks. And so that's kind of how we, we judge the benefit of this action. Uh, part of that is then discussed with the fish agencies on 
it's moving flows from one point in time to another point in time. And that does have some consequences for the conditions that the fall run set up in. And so we work pretty extensively with those folks who are transferring water to try to um, minimize those consequences and adapt um, to, to better support the fall run too for the red dewatering. Okay. Great. I don't know if that was too much down the rabbit hole or not. No, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, and then um, I, I, I just want to um, reiterate that I too think that it'd be important. Thank you all for your work um, uh, on this. Um, this is just, um, a, a, appears to be a great opportunity. And um, thank you for your commitment to share uh, the tool, you know, as it progresses. But um, in particular, um, I've just been, and I know others share this uh, as well, just really grateful for the increased uh, discussion and uh, collaboration within the Sacramento uh, River Temperature Management Task Force. And then um, also with the um, uh, Sacramento River Science Partnership, some increased dialogue there. And so just um, asking that you also work with those entities um, as, as you share um, more information about this tool. Great, thank you. All right, thank you so much. And um, let's move on now to um, uh, development of a draft temperature management plan, uh, Bureau of Reclamation, uh, Liz Kittick. Mr. Lawful, did you? Um, Vice Chair Diadamo, uh, the one thing I wanted to uh, just alert the board to is I know we were planning for a hard break at about noon and um, the upcoming presentation should last about 20 minutes, which will put us right up against that timeline. It may push us in terms of any questions the board members have. So I just wanted to give you a chance to pause and think about whether you wanted to do this one before or after the noontime break. Well, I think if we could just do the presentation and then pause for questions, I, I know we've got quite a few uh, commenters at the end of the day. And so uh, would like to just kind of keep things moving along. Terrific. Um, so we'll just take the presentation, but jot down your questions um, uh, for after the lunch break. Okay. Thank you. All right. Ms. Kittick. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Liz Kittick. I'm the chief Chief of our Water Operations Division for the Central Valley Operations Office. Uh, we have a, a group of uh, engineers, uh, operators. Um, we divide responsibilities into the Northern System, which includes Trinity, Whiskey Town, and Shasta Management, uh, the American River System, which is Folsom Reservoir, uh, the New Malona System, New Malonis Reservoir, and then we have a Delta operator who manages all the uh, requirements and pumping operations in the Delta and the coordination uh, with the state water project as well in the Delta. Um, uh, next slide, please. So our temperature management process uh, typically begins uh, in February. Uh, by that time, we have two months of precipitation under our belt. Uh, in California, our main months for precipitation are December, January, February, and March. Um, so we get a uh, what we call a water supply index forecast from the Department of Water Resources actually beginning December 1st and, um, and continuing every month uh, through May. The December 1st forecast is just based on conditions from the previous year and any kind of precipitation that may have occurred before uh, December 1st. And Janu the January 1 forecast, um, we're starting to get some snow information, snow pillow information, um, starting to do a few snow surveys, but the February 1 forecast is uh, the most complete snow survey forecast. So, and typically, as I say, it has taken into account uh, precipitation that we may have received in December and January. So it's giving us a pretty good indication uh, to start off of how the year might uh, turn out. 
Um, this, this year, February, the both indices for the Sac Valley and the San Joaquin Valley were indicating a critical year. Um, this is very concerning uh, to get that so early in the year. Um, we were concerned in February about uh, carryover storage at Shasta. Uh, indications were then that the end of September storage would be 1.4 million acre feet, which is quite low for Shasta. Um, of the most concern we were seeing is that storage in both uh, Shasta Reservoir and Folsom would not get high enough to be able to use our temperature control devices for those both of those reservoirs uh, to the fullest extent. Um, in, unless we have uh, enough storage in, in both of those reservoirs for Shasta, we are unable to use the upper uh, temperature control device gates and that really limits the amount of blending we can do to achieve temperatures downstream. In Folsom, we have a similar situation. We don't have as uh, complicated a as a, a temperature control device. Um, we called them shutters, but it was the same situation. The storage was not high enough um, at Folsom to be able to use the upper set of temperature shutters there either. So this was quite concerning very early on. Um, we had uh, reservoir releases at minimums in February. We did have uh, some actions that we had to take to meet Delta outflow that month, but we were able to reduce exports and achieve uh, the Delta outflow standard. Um, moving on to March, uh, the March 1 uh, WSI forecast also indicated critical for both the Sac Valley and the San Joaquin. Um, we did do an initial temperature modeling run in March just to see where we were going to land in the temperature tier selection. Um, the February forecast was indicating a potential tier three or tier four. Uh, March uh, pretty much solidified the, the tier four year. And um, we also had a decrease uh, in the projected in inflows in March. So we were looking at an end of September storage at Shasta of 1.3 million acre feet. So about 100,000 acre feet lower than the previous month. Um, we began because we had concerns and we also, um, there was no use of the upper, upper gates at either of the reservoirs uh, for the March uh, forecast. So we began uh, what we called the meet and confer meetings with a lot of different uh, entities to start talking about um, early actions that we could take. Uh, we were uh, very concerned about temperature operations for the summer, just given the low storage and the inability to fully use the temperature control devices. So these um, meetings began in March and some of the uh, actions that we came up with were the shifting the water transfers and shifting the timing of the release and the export of that water. Um, a warm water power bypass at uh, Shasta. Uh, typically when we talk about a power bypass, it's a cold water bypass. So we're using uh, bypassing the power plant in order to uh, achieve colder water releases downstream. But in this case, because we're limited by the, uh, the use of the upper gates at the TCD, we have uh, river outlet valves that are, that are higher on the face of the dam than the uh, elevation of the middle gate. So um, the thought was to, to use these to take warm water from the, the top layer of the reservoir and mix it with colder water and thereby preserve some of the colder water for later in the season. Uh, another uh, early action um, is to install temperature curtains over the middle gates of the temperature control device. Uh, these were installed during the drought. They were actually manufactured and designed to, to hang from the, uh, on the temperature control device. 
and be secured so to uh, help prevent warm water leakage through those middle gates. So we do have a plan in place to get those installed this year. Uh, after the drought ended, uh, those, those curtains were basically rolled up on the face of the TCD and secured in place. So um, they're already there. They just need, we uh, need to get a contractor in to put those in place for the coming year. And the other things uh, we were doing in March was uh, meeting with the Sac River Temperature Task Group and begin uh, discussions of the development of the temperature management plan. And in April, the month we're in, oh, I should say in March as well, we did have a lot of issues in the Delta, trying to meet Delta outflow. Um, we did end up having to increase releases from the Shasta, uh, you only increase Shasta about 250 CFS. We did increase releases at Folsom. And in, uh, and in the Delta, we ended up having to cycle a unit at our pumping plant. Uh, and the state went to minimal pumping at banks uh, to try and achieve the Delta outflow standards. And as was mentioned earlier, this cycling of a unit is, is very hard on our uh, infrastructure and uh, it's something that we do kind of as a last resort. And uh, we ended up doing quite a bit of it in March. So we do have a lot of concerns about um, continuing that any longer. It's just, uh, it risks a, a failure of some of those units. Okay, on our April 1 forecast, uh, still in critical condition for both of the indices. Um, we did uh, do a warm water bypass test at the beginning of April. I'll discuss that a little bit more on the next slide. And um, we're also starting our uh, uh, discussions with the Sac River Tel uh, Sac River Temperature Task Group on the development of the, uh, the draft temperature management plan. Um, there is a, a SRTTG group meeting tomorrow and we do plan on having a draft plan by the end of, of the month. Uh, next slide, please. So here's a diagram of the uh, uh, basically the, the face of the dam and the position of the temperature control device and the river outlets. So as I was saying, the river outlets are slightly higher than the middle gates. There's about a 24 foot difference in the center line between the center line of the middle gates and the center line of the river outlets. When we did our test um, bypass in uh, early, uh, early April, there was a 4.4 uh, degree temperature differential between the water coming out of the outlets and the water uh, from the middle gates. Um, so this, this showed us that uh, we could get warmer water out through the outlets. And we actually started that uh, bypass this last week on Sunday, starting with uh, just one outlet and then we added a second uh, outlet on uh, yesterday and we'll be adding a third outlet uh, tomorrow and we'll go to full bypass on Friday. Um, next slide, please. Uh, on the right is a photo of the test of the bypass. That was a, a full bypass. We shut down the temp the uh, power plant for 12 hours and ran all the water through the, um, through the river outlets. And the graph on the right, you can see the, the water coming out of the river outlets was about 54.2 degrees Fahrenheit, whereas uh, the water from the middle gates was uh, almost 50 degrees, 49.8. Um, last week, or this last week with the temperature profile that we received, the temperature differential was about seven degrees. So that tells us that those, that those warm uh, upper layers of the reservoir are already warming up. 
Um, and we expect we should get another profile this week and we expect that it will probably even be a greater uh, greater difference in temperatures between the, the river outlets and the middle gate. So that, that will help with uh, temperature blending and with preserving some of that cold water for later on. Um, because when we don't have use of those upper gates, this time of year we're typically blending water from the upper gates with the middle gates or maybe even using the full upper gates because we don't need uh, super cold water yet and not having the ability to use upper gates really limits uh, the amount of uh, flexibility we have with the, with the TCD. Uh, next slide, please. So this uh, is uh, the diagram that uh, Dave Mooney showed earlier. So what we're hoping to get out of the temperature task group tomorrow is some more scenarios to evaluate um, we need to know, you know, what the, what the time span in is that would be best for the uh, coldest, to aim for the coldest water temperatures. And on the shoulders, the beginning and ending shoulder periods, uh, what should those temperatures be? We have had some scenarios provided to us by our Bay Delta office that uh, we have evaluated and those will be presented tomorrow at the uh, SRTTG meeting. But we are looking in, uh, for input from NIMS and for other participant experts in the SRTTG uh, to guide us in developing uh, the strategy of how we're going to operate this year. And um, one thing we are concerned about is uh, once you pull the side gates on the temperature control device, you basically lose any more control over any kind of blending. You just, you get what you get out of the reservoir. And the earlier you pull those, then the, as I say, the less control you have. So our strategy typically is to extend um, the pulling of those gates as far as possible into the fall and that gives us the most flexibility but in a year like this with a limited cold water pool that can be uh, very difficult to prolong and uh, we may be looking at an, an earlier pull of the side gates and so then that uh, the the temperature then after that point is basically dependent on you know, how much cold water is left in the reservoir, how quickly we move uh, down through the stratified layers and, and, and start pulling warm water in, and also uh, heavily dependent on meteorological conditions. So the ambient air temperatures and the warming of the water as it's released from Keswick uh, and as it moves down through the river. And that's the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Perfect timing there. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. um, Ms. Kedek, we're going to uh, break for lunch now and then come back um, and um, give an opportunity for questions. I do see also on the, the panel that you had uh, Stephen Murano with NIMPS. And um, Stephen, I um, don't see you here, but um, if you have anything to add, we'll... Um, have you go first right after we reconvene at one o'clock. And so for those that are interested in, um, as I am in following the governor's announcement, uh, you can go on his Facebook page and um, we will see you all at one o'clock. Thank you.
Hope we will be able to begin uh, the board meeting again momentarily, trying to make sure that we can get everyone rounded up. Hello, Vice Chair Diadama. Hello. Mr. Webb, I see that you have your hand up. If you would like, you're welcome to send an email to the clerk, um, but just for everybody's expectation, we have a number of panels that we're going to be going through before we'll be opening up the public forum for comment. So if you're having a technical issue or you have some scheduling issues you want us to know about, you can just send an email to the clerk of the board, uh, janine.townsend at waterboards.ca dot gov. Uh, she was the one who had shared the Zoom credentials with you. Mr. Loeffler, are we waiting on anything else? At just this point in time, uh, Vice Chair Diadamo, I think you could go ahead and commence. I expect we'll have uh, Chair Escavel join us um, later, but we can resume with the panels. Right, okay. All right, um, thank you very much. It's now 1.05 and we will reconvene. Um, and before doing so, I'll just make a couple of um, brief um, uh, points about um, the event that Chair Esquivel was at, uh, joining Governor Newsom and the team of officials from the state that have been working with the governor over these past months, <coughs> excuse me, on drought and drought related preparedness. Um, the, the governor signed an executive order uh, as a drought preparedness executive order, um, stating very clearly that we are not at this time in a statewide drought emergency and that California is better prepared for drought than in the past. Uh, uh, he did go over some of the things that we heard about today, so I won't be repetitive about this being our second dry year um, of drought conditions. Um, but he did talk a lot about how today's action will help us all as a state better prepare for a possible third dry year. And uh, while we're not experiencing a statewide drought at this time, the governor is declaring a regional state of a statewide drought emergency at this time. The governor is declaring today a, a regional state of emergency in Mendocino and Sonoma counties due to the acutely dry conditions in the Russian River watershed. Um, and um, uh, he also um, was there with a group of local officials as well and encouraged uh, ongoing collaboration and partnerships. 
Um, hopefully, Chair Esquivel will be able to rejoin us before the conclusion of today's um, workshop and add any other comments. Um, so with that, we'll continue. And um, I just want to check with um, on the uh, before we concluded on the development of the draft temperature management plan, did uh, Stephen Morano from uh, National Marine Fisheries. Uh, Mr. Morano, did you have anything to add? I did just briefly. And I know that uh, Reclamation asked me to make a few comments from a, a fisheries perspective. Uh, I'll be really brief. I know there's a lot of important presentations and comments this afternoon, but maybe it's a good opportunity to just to summarize what we heard this morning. And so what I would take home, I would, uh, I would summarize it as the, the real keys that I've heard people talk about are temperature targets, the power bypass, changes in release patterns, and some careful TCD operations. So the sensitivity analysis, that pointed towards temperature targets of 53.5 to 54.5, a window length of 12 to 16 weeks, and shoulder temperatures of greater than 56. Um, those shoulder temperatures aren't unlimited. Uh, the power bypass, for example, could be very useful early in the season and the fisheries agencies have strongly supported uh, aggressively, for example, in 90% power bypass being implemented, but it'll need to be reevaluated re weekly as the river warns, uh, warms, pardon me, um, since the, tar the temperature targets, uh, if they are too high, could ultimately decrease egg or sperm fitness uh, in the holding adults, so before they've actually spawned. Um, and we also need to be aware that warmer April and May temperatures could defer peak spawning, which creates some uncertainty later in the season. So, uh, so it's a useful tool, but we need to use it with, uh, there's a lot of nuances to, uh, to applying it. Uh, the changes in release patterns, those will be talked about, I think, uh, more eloquently by the settlement contractors and others, others this afternoon. Um, and so just, I'd, I would just recap to say that these tools uh, appear to give us the opportunity to drive down temperature dependent mortality from the 80 to 90% range down to something like the 60 to 70% range. And like the governor said at noon, we've only recently emerged from the last drought. And so now that we're in consecutive dry years, I'd say the fisheries agencies are very eager to communicate and to coordinate and work quickly to get a temperature management plan in place. That's very helpful. Thank you. Can, can you mention again the range of temperature mortality um, that, that, that is expected with the actions that you just went through? Yeah, so at the initial SRTTG meetings, um, they had presented numbers that were approaching uh, about 90%. Uh, and it appears that uh, there might be the possibility of driving that down. Uh, James has talked about uh, how we very clearly need to, uh, need to run these through the full modeling uh, frameworks to actually confirm that. But it appears that it's possible to get a 10 or 20 percent reduction in temperature dependent mortality um, by implementing some of those actions that were that were being discussed this morning and will be elaborated on this afternoon. Great. Okay, thank you for that. All right. Um, any questions? Yeah, if you, actually, if you could just clarify, because I think some of the presentation we saw earlier included in the the um, science center's model runs included a, an additional, you know, scenario where there was a, a five percent reduction in deliveries, and so I was, uh, I was wondering, does your the numbers you just shared with us about the projected improvement in temperature dependent mortality to sixty to seventy percent, does that include that assumption of the five percent reduction in deliveries? Yeah, so the numbers that James presented, recall there was a base uh, temperature number that was about 85%, right? And then a temperature target one that targeted about 54 degrees with a shoulder of 59 for 14 weeks. That reduced it down to about 78%, so from 85 down to 78. And then adding on top of that, the 5% reduction uh, brought it down to about 69%. So those are the numbers he presented. And uh, I believe that some of the later presentations that we'll have maybe some more specific um, uh, details about possible transfers could, uh, you know, could, could have more granular information. Okay, thank you. And then uh, just another quick question is, uh, you know, one thing I've heard, it, it's very encouraging and to, to hear about um, the new suite of tools that Reclamation is, is looking at and actually embracing here. Uh, I think the best example today is that power bypass pilot and you know, carefully implementing that and seeing that roll out is good. Um, and I'm really glad to hear that. And I hope it goes well. I really do. Um, I, I heard though that, I mean, obviously there are some trade-offs with this decision. Um, 
we're talking today, we're focused on Salmonid survival, um, but just, I was wondering if um, Ms. Kiddick could perhaps just comment on the, on the power um, costs that are associated with this type of activity, just so everyone has a sense for those type, types of trade-offs that we're considering. Uh, yeah, this is Liz again. Uh, there are power costs associated with the power bypass, um, upwards of $7 million. Uh, so this is very concerning to the power customers. And another concern of theirs is that they're having to replace this uh, uh, relatively uh, green uh, hydro energy with other energy on the market that maybe is not so um, eco-friendly. So I know that's a concern there. So um, yeah, and I think we have this bypass potentially lasting through the end of May and that's highly dependent on uh, what temperatures we get from the bypass. So it could very well, you know, cut off earlier than that. But that was, I think, I believe that cost estimate uh, took the bypass through the end of May. Thank you, that's helpful. Mm -hmm. I had a follow-up on that point. Um, so uh, many of these agencies are under requirements for reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. So um, uh, do you have an estimate if they were to replace, if the power um, uh, suppliers were to, or the agencies were to replace um, hydro with other um, green energy sources, what the, um, impact would be? Um, no, I don't. I didn't hear any figures for that. Uh, okay. All right. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm newer to this. So, so forgive me if these are um, simplistic. So, for the temperature management planning, um, I know one of the challenges, at least my understanding, is that a lot of decisions have to be made earlier in the year than when a, um, you know, a, a temperature management plan is finalized, and then you know we have ten days to approve it. Um, and you know, again, this my understanding is we don't have perfect information early on when we have to make decisions. And so that's inherent, um, a inherent challenge to this. Um, do we already though have kind of um, some uh, actions and lessons learned, you know, a set of, a set of um, like temperature management actions to address um, problems that we expect to come up with tier four that um, could be kind of um, a, a draft very early on in the year that, that could be based on, um, you know, some, some uh, I don't know, like cont contingency triggers, obviously would need to be adaptive management, but you all, but my understanding is, you know, you have to, as your operators, you have to make these adjustments all the time. And I'm wondering if earlier on in the year, especially as you're seeing, you know, that tier four may be likely if there's, um, you know, some, some early draft that could be developed that maybe has a couple scenarios with, um, with actions and maybe this already happens. I don't know. So, um, can you talk a little bit more about how you manage that with um, with the the timing challenges of the temperature management plans? Ms. White or Mr. Mooney? <sighs> yeah, it looks like we need to address audio here. Mr. Lawler. Yeah, we are in the process of inviting Mr. Mooney to unmute again, unmute again, and we'll move him back up to co-host status. Thank you. And that's why too, I think. I think we we have what we call our drought toolkit. Uh, it's probably a little less formal uh, than most folks would hope to see. Uh, some of those actions are already identified 
like working with the fish agencies for planning on increased intake into Livingston Stone National Fish Hatchery as kind of our, our backup plan. Uh, and then some of the other measures and working with the Sac River settlement contractors that you've seen, uh, in addition to trying to use some of the conservative forecasts, which uh, aren't so conservative this year. Oh, Kristen, is there something else I think we should be covering? <laughs> you have to unmute her again. Okay, there we go. I was given, given permission to unmute, thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a really great question and one that we really struggle with. Um, uh, when it actually comes to temperature management planning as to where, in, where you can meet what temperature, uh, really we don't have a good idea until two things happen. One, until we know how much precip uh, and, and runoff we think we might get, which as Liz mentioned, our largest months uh, for precip are December through March. Um, and then two, uh, getting some idea about how the reservoir is gonna stratify. Um, and, and the stratification we can make some projections on, um, but those projections are based on storage. So making those estimates say in, in December or January before you've seen your wettest months um, can have, uh, I mean, the, the range as you saw from Molly's presentation of what we looked at in February versus what we're looking at uh, this, this year, back in February was still feasible that we could be in a wet year. So, um, so the range can be huge, which then leads you to, okay, well, if we, if we always plan on conservative, then you're basically gonna have the same plan every December and January because absent a, a just an extremely wet December and January, your 90% your is always gonna say that it's really bad. Um, and so you're always gonna be looking at those really poor conditions, which leads you to the drought toolkit, which um, Dave mentioned. So I think once we start getting an idea, especially once we've gone through December, January, then we're sitting in February with a, with a, a two week forecast and that's showing, so that's covering uh, over half of the wettest months, if that's showing that it's getting unlikely, that's when we start having all of those discussions as, uh, as Liz went through all those uh, early, uh, early management, early action brainstorming sessions. So, but it's definitely a balance. Um, I mean, we, we think about the potential of going into the drought starting the previous year of every year, <laughs> um, which is why, uh, we, of course, nobody knew what the hydrology was going to be like. So, but we we did all know that there's a risk of it being dry, which is why we tried to ramp down to our lowest minimum flow as soon as we could in uh, close coordination with the uh, the fishery agencies who are monitoring the reds and the Sacramento River settlement contractors who are uh, modifying diversions. Um, so that was that's kind of the the first action is assume it's a drought and ramp down as, uh, as quickly as you can. Um, but then beyond that, um, try to have some idea about where we're going before we make large commitments of resources um, uh, uh, to, to start implementing actions, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, it seems like, especially increasingly where we have more and more experience with this because it's gotten more common and, and we had, we, you know, recently went through a um, more prolonged drought. Um, so it seems like, so is the drought toolkit um, kind of the range of actions that you would um, plan on having to implement or bring to bear depending on as you see those um, as the, the, the season progresses? Yeah, I'll, I'll answer and then, let, and then let Dave fill in. Um, so I, I think we're expecting our first draft of this to be completed in August. So it's still under development right now. Um, but the way that what's being put together is uh, here's the action, here's what it's expected to do, here are the limitations on when you could implement this action, here are the things that should be considered and the process that would have to be followed in order to implement it. And the idea is that you get a kind of a booklet of, of all of those actions and, uh, and then as you start getting into things, so you're sitting in February and then we just had, you know, the driest December and January on record, uh, so what are our options? We start pulling that out and saying, okay, what are, what are the things that aren't huge commitments? What can we start thinking about now, such as the temperature curtain that, um, that Liz talked about? That's a, um, 
relatively minor cost uh, in, in order to install that. I mean, it's, I guess minor is relative, but um, but uh, it's a cost to, of installation because um, we've already we've already purchased the construction of it. That was the bigger cost. So um, so so now that it's there, it's a minor cost to implement it. So that's kind of an easier one that we can say, okay, that that can be part of the plan. It's got an easy process, and even if it gets wetter, we're not really losing resources by starting that planning effort and figuring out when that can get installed. Um, but some of the other ones are much, much bigger, like power bypass, as Liz mentioned, you really want to make sure you're doing that when, um, well, when one, the, when the reservoir is warm enough up top to, to have an impact and, and when the potential reward um, is offsetting the, the risks and not just the financial risk, but also the risk that Stephen Morano mentioned with, um, with uh, affecting some of that egg development and whatnot. Okay. Um, so, and it seems like one of the most, um, uh, you know, one of the, I don't know, what, the, the factors that could have the biggest impact is timing of releases and, um, and I'm, you know, that's a much more um, extreme or significant um, action to have to take. And so, but it also is one where decisions have to be made early. Um, and so I'm wondering if there's, um, I, I'm just thinking about the, you know, the press conference, I think um, in Mendocino, they were saying they had, a, um, they called it forecast informed reservoir operations, which is, it sounds like, um, at least the way that they described it was it was, um, pretty unique and a lot of work and in, went into developing it. But I'm, can you just help me understand more how, um, how we, you know, how you approach being able to um, have those kind of um, ready operations depending on how that continues to evolve um, you know, from week to week, at least, the, you know, again, I'm newer to this, so I may be asking this wrong, but it seems like that's, that's the goal of where we want to go. And I'm sure you do that to some extent, but it sounds like each year to year, you're also trying to pull out a toolkit and figure out what is the right um, specifics, but is there, um, is there the opportunity or, or tools yet, or do you see that as something feasible to get if there aren't yet to have that kind of um, more, get things lined up so you can have more of a um, forecast operations plan? Maybe you already have that. Well, I think there's some tools and practices that we've, so there, almost all of these are hard trade-offs. They're, you know, somebody's impacted or the, the species or the environments, um, you know, experiencing impact. And it takes us a, a lot to work through it. There's some that we've done that already. And so then we incorporate it into part of our long-term operation and say, this is all we've agreed to. I think the expansion of the fall transfer window, um, some of the red dewatering practices, looking at how we do or don't open up the Delta cross channel gates, and more of those extreme events. Those are ones that we've you know, taken to heart and figured out how to incorporate. So it's less of a, a scramble I think what you see in the drought toolkit are ones that we haven't been able to provide that full coverage and process. And so a lot of it is uh, um, active discussions and collaborations about where do we do the trade-off and the impacts. And um, we don't have the opportunity to figure out how we, we mitigate or reduce or avoid some of those um, to where it can just be a, a standard practice that requires a lot less effort. Is that yeah. fair, Kristen? Yeah, and I might also mention that our goal is to minimize releases uh, during the during the winter months, um, pretty much until May. Uh, that's always something we're shooting for. Um, we're more successful in it when there's just a little bit of precip, um, but um, uh, unlike this year. But uh, one of the things that we have seen the most correlation with uh, um, with temperature management is how high we can get May storage, and particularly how high we can access those upper shutters uh, that Liz mentioned in her presentation. 
Um, so that's a big goal that we have that we're taking regardless of, uh, of what kind of year we're in. Um, lucky for us, the irrigation demands, uh, particularly the ones that are driven by CVP allocations, don't pick up until probably mid-May timeframe. So usually we have the opportunity to see how high that storage gets before those deliveries start happening. So we do make initial allocations in February, um, but as you saw this year, they're they're not <laughs> they're not final, um, uh, uh, obviously until um, until we're more confident about the water supply. We we do try to make them based on conservative assumptions, but sometimes um, things come in less than ninety percent exceedance. So uh, so that's what we saw this year. Um, but those diversions don't typically pick up till May, so that allows us to see how far the res how high the reservoir can get. Um, but as Molly mentioned, uh, the significant challenges we had with Delta outflow in March and April meant we had to start going up from our minimum releases in March, which was um, very unfortunate. Great, thanks for walking me through. Okay, I think we'll uh, move along here. And before doing that, Mr. Uh, Lawford, do you have any sense of how many um, uh, commenters we have? Because if I look at the list, it includes a lot of the presenters. So I just want to get oh, yes. Sure, Vice Chair Diadamo, we have approximately 33 public speakers in addition to the panelists. Um, many of them, probably about 10, have indicated speak if necessary. Okay, great. We, well, we will uh, try to move along here. Thank you for that. Um, next is a uh, public presentation panel of uh, Sacramento River Settlement Contractors. Um, we will be hearing from uh, Thad Bentner, Lewis Baer, Lee Bergfeld, and Mike Diaz re representing um, the contractors. Good afternoon, Mr. Bentner. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair. Appreciate um, the opportunity. Hopefully just do a sound check. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Um, we we'll want to thank you and the other board members and your staff just for the invitation and ability to, to speak with you all today. Um, I think we have about 30 minutes. We'll, given how late things are going, we'll try and get through this quicker, hopefully. But um, again, just want to appreciate the time. Certainly want to appreciate the previous panels, um, our partners that we're working with, both Reclamation, um, NIMS, the Science Center. So it's been um, a challenging year so far, but I think just as a group, we've had almost it feels like daily engagement on different issues. So again, just uh, appreciate their willingness to, to partner on solutions for this year. Um, you know, I think it's it's certainly a tough year. Um, we, the settlement contractors, and we'll talk a bit more about who we are just um, for a few of the board members who aren't familiar with us. But certainly for us, you know, certainly we are a solution oriented group. I mean, we've been working on um, collabor co collaboration and ridge, ridge top. To, to river mouth water management. I think it's something we would like at some point to talk to your board about when things aren't as, as tense and, and challenging as they are today. So at some point in the future, maybe this year, we could give you some more details about all the things that we're working on, which are pretty exciting. I mean, and then I think just um, third, I think we just empathize with you about just the tough decisions that have to get made. I think, you know, daily we're having to, to balance the different needs that are out there and just understanding that you as a board also have to make those. So certainly we empathize with that challenge. And, you know, just as this week, you know, we've been having conversations with a lot of the bird folks wondering what the winter looks like and, you know, how much food and water will be available for birds coming down given the conditions up in Klamath. Um, you know, we, we're working with nymphs on river studies right now and migrating fish. We're talking to CDFW about giant garter snake and how to protect them this year. You know, working with Nature Conservancy on groundwater and sigma recharge projects. Um, you know, list goes on. So knowing that certainly today it's important to talk about winter run and temperature dependent mortality and those operations, just there's other, you know, needs that we're also to trying to attend to um, as a group of contractors in the Sacramento Valley. So with that, um, next slide. Um, I, uh, just kind of here's the agenda we wanted to cover and there, there will be four of us. I, I didn't think you'd want to hear just one of us because we could lull you to sleep. So hopefully we'll try and keep it a little bit entertaining with different speakers and uh, different voices and stuff. But we just want to talk a little bit again about us and our history. Um, I'll cover that. Lewis Bear will talk just about our salmon recovery program and the things that we're doing, which are really exciting, as well as kind of the planning that we're putting in place this year. So I think while potentially the morning gave you maybe a menu of different things, we can talk about 
more specifics about what we think is a path forward, um, how we're using models, and then just really looking forward. You know, it is action. So everything we, we want to talk about is action oriented versus kind of static feeling. Um, so next slide. Um, so I think it's just important for us. I mean, I know we, we tend to get signaled out quite a bit. I think that's good and bad. One, I think it's good because we have a lot of opportunities to help address a lot of the problems that exist. But I think the other thing is we also kind of feel like, you know, we're not at the table, we're being served at the table. So it's kind of, uh, it's always that interesting dynamic. But I, I think for us, you know, just so you all know, I mean, one, well, we are contractors with um, historical water rights. So a lot of our water rights go back to the 1800s. We, you know, pre-existed before the California Water Plan, which became the CVP or, or part of the CVP. Um, you know, and then Shasta Dam was built before a lot of these water rights were really settled with the project. Um, but our water rights have been extensively studied and documented. So certainly we have a lot of information that was done in the 50s to do that. And, and all of our predecessors, both ours and yours, um, worked on uh, State Board Decision 990, which basically set the, the water rights for the CVP, but also sort of directed all of us to enter into what, what ultimately became the settlement contracts. And that's sort of what we rely on today, which are part and parcel based on a lot of those historic water rights. Um, all the water that we get currently served from reclamation um, is less than our underlying water right. And again, I think we, we wanna make sure as we go forward, we're using those, our water and water rights in, in conjunction with reclamation as a partner to, to be um, collaborative and solution oriented here. But I think the other thing is, and Lewis will talk a little bit more about the things that we're really committed to doing. I think the other thing is though, is when things, when we try and work on a plan together um, with all the agency as a group and say, here's how we need to move forward. I think we're all doing that, uh, knowing that we're all part of owning how things um, go or what outcomes are. So I think, you know, the other thing is sometimes it feels like, well, if things don't go right, we need to be the ones that have to fix everything or, you know, our water has to be the one that fix everything. So, you know, we, we want to be, again, part partners, but again, we don't want to be the shock absorber when things don't go exactly as everybody thought they would. Um, so that I'll turn it over to uh, Lewis to go through our next few slides. Okay, can folks uh, hear and see me? I'm not seeing myself pop up there, but I'll, I will just proceed. I see Thad, Thad nodding. And so, um, well, I wanna start off, frankly, uh, by addressing my optimism and making sure folks don't think that I'm happy about the hydrology or the, uh, the situation we're all in. Um, it would sure be a lot nicer if it was wet. My optimism, frankly, comes from the standpoint that I think salmon recovery on the Sacramento River is very possible. In fact, I think the targets we have for salmon performance are well below where they should be. You know, when I look at the annual plots of numbers of salmon returning on the Sacramento River, I, uh, I think we should be 10 times that. We shouldn't be targeting 50,000 fish as a good year. We should be targeting half a million. This is a river at one time that produced a million plus fish and it can do that again. Um, right now, it doesn't provide the environmental services that our salmon need. And uh, in some years, the driest years, uh, it doesn't allow spawning and redding. Um, and when we think about climate change, it uh, makes it even harder. And so I wanna try to put in context what I think it looks like to re-envision salmon in the Sacramento Valley so that they're at a healthy phase that we have a half a million or a million fish returning on the Sacramento River providing plenty of fish, frankly, for the commercial fishery. We lost 80% of our commercial fishery between 1920 and 1930 when we completed the flood control system. And it means that if we can unwind some of the impacts with that, we can have a very healthy commercial fishery. We can have a very healthy sport fishery. In fact, something that we're not even really currently contemplating as a possibility. And I think what's exciting right now is that there's interest in investing in the infrastructure and renewing the natural processes, kind of greening up our existing infrastructure. It's an opportunity we haven't had in a long time. Um, and so when you see the backdrop of some of the activities that I'm gonna speak to, 
that's what the mindset that I have is, is not how we deal with temperature this very year as the number one priority, but uh, the number one priority is this long-term vision of a salmon uh, fishery on the Sacramento River that we can all be proud of. So, so I wanna dive into some of the details. So the first is on temperature actions. Um, this is not a spring activity. This is a year around mindset and activity. And when we have low storage in the fall, I know as Sac River settlement contractor managers, what we're thinking about is how do we target spring storage levels that are you know, the best they can possibly be. And that's why our cooperation with the Bureau, as you've heard, started last fall. Um, it had an impact on birds and on winter flooding and wetlands, um, but we were able to uh, reduce our diversions um, so that the, the releases from Shasta could get to a minimum uh, release as early as possible and with as little effect on fall run as possible. Um, there's some trade-offs. It meant that some of our fish food programs and some of our uh, winter water bird programs were delayed, but we felt uh, with a low storage level last year that uh, that was a prudent program. And so uh, board member Firestone, uh, you mentioned the different types of actions we could take. I think you have to filter those a little bit with a calendar. And I think you were inferring that this is one of those that comes up in the you know August time frame or even earlier that we're all planning for. So you can kind of think about an action plan, if you will, that that works around the you know around the full year uh, on the calendar. So that fall action that we took deferred 45,000 acre feet uh, from October to November, um, and it allowed for the like I said the early minimum release and over the winter certainly helped protect carryover storage. And even though we're not in a great place right now, I think we're in a place where we can come up with a, uh, you know, a not ideal, but a potential operations where we don't have to abandon in river um, spawning of uh, winter run um, because we have a slightly better storage than we would have otherwise if we had said, you know, we hadn't reached a minimum release from Shasta. Um, we also looked at other temperature actions, uh, certainly a delayed start to irrigation, uh, which was one of the actions back in 2015, where we kind of moved some water from April to May. Um, when we did the modeling on that, it didn't show a benefit. So that's one of them that dropped, dropped out early. Um, and then we also looked at the power bypass and transfers. I think there's been a lot of discussion about power bypass, the trade-offs there. Um, but also transfers allow us to move water from our diversion schedule, which would start in April, to more of a release schedule to the buyers that wouldn't start until later in the year. So holding that cold water in storage. And we have done what we think we can to maximize those transfers to help with temperature this year. Second thing I'd like to talk about is temperature forecasting tools. In 2015, we did not have the model that the SAC River settlement contractors helped develop or helped fund the development of. Um, we didn't have the modeling framework that the Bureau has organized. Um, I, I think that's really an important distinction because the, uh, the clarity that those models can provide is much better than we had in 2014 and 2015. They allow us to look at things um, like the temperature bypass in more detail. And I, I really wanna emphasize that that model was developed in a really open um, forum. We had everybody engaged and involved over two and a half years. We got everybody's input. That model has been made available to everybody to use um, and to make improvements on, to vet any issues. And I really think that's the model for the types of tools and processes that we need to see. Everybody collaboratively working together to make those improvements. I'm really excited about that tool and I think it's making a difference this year. So uh, another thing that I think we're really excited about and, uh, um, well, sorry, I was skipping the third uh, button. You've heard, th third bullet, you've heard the discussions about the meet and confer process. So that really started in March and uh, that is a process that came out of the biological opinions um, when they were redrafted. And what it really, the intent of that is we would all get together in years like this and put everything on the table and work through those options. And that's really part of the rest of the conversation. The meet and confer process started with National Marine Fishery Service and the Bureau and us. And pretty quickly, frankly, we've seen lots of the decision makers wanna be part of that process because it's been a terrifically constructive 
environment um, where we're willing to put everything on the table and discuss through that. So um, number six, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, Sacramento River Se uh, Science Partnership. Um, a little bit of the backstory on this, we were actually in Washington DC about three years ago and we're uh, talking to the National Marine Fishery Service about how much better we could all operate if we were in a room together, we were developing science together, we were sharing our ideas and thoughts, you know, not giving up autonomy, but coordinating all of our efforts. And that really is the foundation for the Sacramento River Science Partnership. Um, I think it's been terrifically exciting. There's now a, a science plan that has been developed and there are more than 30 uh, priority actions to develop uncertainty um, or answers to some of the uncertainties in our system. Um, they have folks working together just like we had envisioned um, so that we kind of have this shared conversation around uncertainty and the, the details of how to resolve that. And I, I think it's a really healthy conversation that I would just encourage more and more folks to be a part of. It's an open forum and everybody is welcome. So the restoration projects. So um, this is really what I get excited about because I think this is the vision for salmon beyond just uh, what we're talking about today. This is a, a, a salmon run on the Sacramento River that we could all be proud of. And it, it frankly could use everybody in this room, all of the panels here um, working together, putting their shoulder behind to implement. Um, I think now is the time to do this. It generally follows National Marine Fishery Services uh, Salmon Recovery Program. Um, and it, it looks at all, uh, all stages of the salmon life cycle, which is critically important because right, frankly, right now, most of the stages of uh, salmon in our Sacramento River are fairly hostile to fish, um, but they're not things that we can't correct. We can correct these issues and we can have a better river system for salmon um, and a vibrant salmon fishery. So the Sac River Settlement contractors um, over the last five years have been implementing um, side channel and spawning gravel habitat projects in the upper Sacramento River. Um, recently, the Bureau of Reclamation has uh, seen those investments um, through some of their structured decision making as very valuable uh, for uh, helping with uh, the salmon population. And so they prioritize some additional funding and they put out a uh, funding opportunity announcement. Um, both GCID and RD108 were fortunate to receive uh, grants to continue that work along with two others, uh, Chico State and River Partners. And so we're very excited about that partnership. The Bureau has committed to funding $40 million of work uh, in the spawning and uh, and side channel work on the upper Sacramento River. The improved survival of emerged salmon. Um, so this, you know, where we measure salmon productivity 60 miles downstream, um, yeah, I would say is, uh, you know, it makes it difficult to understand what all of the mechanisms are for uh, why salmon are not reaching the, where they count salmon at Red Bluff downstream. And, uh, this project actually is for that stretch of river between the spawning grounds and uh, the, the Red Bluff monitoring program. And it looks like, um, you know, the habitat projects you've seen from River Garden Farms where they produce uh, in river habitat for rearing of juvenile salmon. Um, RD 108 uh, has constructed two projects that would limit adult straying in the lower floodplain system, $20 million over the last three years. Um, and then I want to add to the floodplain habitat and I'll kind of pick that up with the next slide, but that maybe is one of the most uh, encouraging and exciting components of this whole program. And then finally, the fish food. Um, we've uh, been producing fish food now for about five years in rice fields and kind of feeding the rivers like the floodplains used to do. Uh, we got some exciting information for la from last year's study. Um, where we, we saw growth of juvenile fish in the channel, not just where we're returning uh, that food to the river or a mile downstream like we've seen in the past. We actually had fish six miles downstream of the food return location and we saw healthy, vibrant fish six miles downstream. Fish food is one of the things that we're putting on the table is something that could help out migrating fish this year. 
Um, we know there's going to be a challenge with survival um, with, uh, with salmon in the upper Sacramento River and the dry conditions uh, reducing high flows. So let's do everything that we possibly can. And one of the things we may be able to do is produce fish food to help those out migrating juveniles. And then finally, I'd like to thank both the resources agency and the federal agency for their roles to, uh, in programs like cutting the green tape um, and the federal agencies in particular in uh, making it a priority to permit some of these important salmon projects. So next slide, please. So Northern California Water Association has been leading a group called Floodplain Forward. And it really takes the concepts in the salmon recovery program that I mentioned on the last page and makes them real, populates those with real projects and reaches agreement. We have about 30 uh, agencies that are participating at this time, NGOs that do on the ground work. We have multiple landowners that are willing to put their property up and take action. And we have a number of projects um, all the way from the upper end of the Sacramento River, all the way down to the floodplains, looking at the river connections and the uh, drainage infrastructure and the landowners that uh, could hold water and kind of recreate the floodplains that used to power the energetics, power the biology in our river system and support a viable salmon population. Um, we recently culminated that effort uh, into a portfolio of projects and went together as a collective back to Washington DC to lobby for what we think is about a $2 billion effort over the next decade and a half. We think this could be kind of the golden age for salmon and changing you know, or kind of unwinding some of the unnecessary impacts from the flood control system and from how we've developed our levees. So it's a very exciting program and I look forward to, uh, to speaking with you all certainly more in the future on, on how we implement those. Next slide. So Thad, I don't know if you wanted to, uh, you mentioned that maybe in, in I, I think you covered these, Lewis, on yeah. the other side. So maybe we should just go to Lee just because we have about 10 minutes left. So yeah, sorry. No. All right. Can folks hear me? All right. Uh, we can go to the next slide, please. So one of the planning items that Lewis mentioned that uh, the contractors are involved in are weekly diversion scheduling calls. Uh, and all the contractors participate in those along with uh, Central Valley Project Operations Office. This is an activity that came out of the 2014 drought. It's been happening every year since then. And the figure that's on the screen here is a summary of some of the data that, that gets pulled together during these scheduling calls. Uh, I wanna start by talking about the yellow line uh, that, that goes through this figure. And this illustrates the scheduled daily diversions that the contractors enter into an online portal uh, we then uh, help collect that data and provide that to CBO to use in their operational decision making. Uh, prior to these sorts of efforts, uh, CBO had a pretty good understanding of what the diversions were, uh, but they didn't have this sort of daily detailed information to make those operational decisions as they look at <clears throat> making releases out of the reservoir and balancing those with things that are happening in the Delta. So uh, the, the data that represented by the yellow line are the current best estimates for the diversions for this coming year. Uh, the next area that I like to talk about is this blue shaded uh, area underneath of the yellow line. That represents the average monthly diversion scheduled for 2021. It's just a conversion of the yellow line into an average monthly number. And though these average monthly numbers are shown to kind of help illustrate that in some of the months like July is a, is a good example, the average is pretty close to the daily for most of the month, but while uh, other months, April and August uh, being good examples, uh, the daily diversions can change pretty rapidly throughout the, the course of the month. Uh, and the average is really only uh, held for a couple of days. And again, that those rapid changes in the scheduling of that is the really useful information for CVO as they're looking at, at uh, making their release decisions. Next is, uh, I'd like to talk about the very top black line. It's kind of the skyline that's going across all of the, the columns here in the figure. And this line represents average monthly diversions of 75% of the Sac River settlement contractors. Uh, as I think has been discussed, this year is a Shasta critical year. That's a term that's defined in the contracts based on the inflow into Shasta. 
And in Shasta critical years, the contracts are automatically reduced by 25% from the full contract supply. So then between this, the top black skyline and the blue areas underneath, uh, we've got two shaded areas. Uh, and these represent planned reductions in diversions by the settlement contractors beyond that 25% that's in the contract already. So this top shaded area, is, which is the uh, black uh, diagonal stripes areas, represents some voluntary reductions that the contractors are taking uh, as a result of water conservation and other efforts uh, within the individual districts to reduce diversions. And then the gray shaded areas are reductions for water transfers to buyers located south of the Delta. And I'll talk a little bit more about those in the next slide. But overall, and this is illustrated in the text box here in the middle of the figure that the 2021 scheduled diversions are approximately 58% of the full contract supply. That's about 350,000 acre feet less than the 75% contract allocation in a Shasta critical year. That 350,000 acre feet is made up of about 200,000 acre feet of voluntary reductions and another 150,000 for water transfers that are uh, moved to buyers south of the Delta. <clears throat> so next, uh, if we can move to the next slide, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, those transfers. So the figure on this plot uh, is two different variables. We've got an average monthly Keswick release. Those are the stair step lines that go across the top of the figure and daily Shasta storage. So that's the smooth line uh, uh, underneath of the stair steps. The uh, Keswick release is plotted in CFS. That's relative to the y-axis on the left side of the figure and Shasta storage plotted in thousands of acre feet or relative to the y-axis on the right side. And this figure illustrates two different conditions. And these are generalized uh, sort of conditions, but these are, sort of the, these are some of the things that we've been evaluating and, and providing some modeling support uh, on and that's uh, the two different conditions are without transfer condition. Uh, that's represented by the dash line for both Keswick release and Shasta storage and a with transfer condition represented by the solid lines. So when water is made available for transfer to South of Delta buyers, uh, it results in less diversion along the Sacramento River. And uh, that was illustrated in the, in the prior slide. And then in a dry year like 2021, uh, that reduction um, can result in a reduction in the release out of Keswick and that water that would have otherwise been diverted being held in Shasta. So this is illustrated in this figure occurring from the months of May through August. Uh, that, that's increasing uh, storage in the reservoir from what it would have otherwise been absent the transfer. And then that water later gets released to be moved to the buyer. Uh, that's expected to start in approximately August of this year and continue into the fall. Settlement contractors have been working very collaboratively with the buyers, with CVO and the other, and other agencies to investigate the options. When would be the best time to, to move this water? And how can we all kind of uh, arrive at a solution that works uh, collectively to improve temperature management, manage the concerns that we heard about earlier this morning related to fall run red dewatering, uh, and is also, you know, make... Um, work with the buyers because of course they would like that water earlier in the season um, but they recognize that delaying when they receive it um, may provide some important uh, benefits for temperature management. So um, as I mentioned the contractors are providing some modeling support to evaluate how some of these actions like transfers can improve temperature management. So I'm going to turn presentation over to Dr. Mike Diaz to describe some of that work. Thanks, Lee. Next slide, please. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to go through a, a temperature modeling simulation here. There's a lot of information on the slide. And we use this slide just because it's consistent with what we've been providing to the various uh, parties as we've met through meet and confer and other meetings as we work collab collaboratively to try to find solutions to this challenging year. Really briefly, this model was referred to by Lewis, um, developed over the last couple of years uh, for Shasta Lake. We also have one for Keswick. And we've been using this. It's a similar model to uh, the detailed model that Eric and James talked about earlier for Shasta, the C equal W2 model. And rather than spend a lot of time on that, because we don't have a lot of time, I just want to go through these results. 
I'll spend a moment on this slide just to illustrate what we have. On the left axis, we have temperatures in degrees Celsius. Sorry about that. 13.3 is 56 degrees Fahrenheit. 10 degrees is 50 degrees Fahrenheit, just to start you off. The yellow line on here is the tail bay temperature target. That's the target that we are trying to achieve below Shasta Dam to attain, in this case, 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Clear Creek. You'll notice it's very high in the spring. That's because it's not a temperature control period. It doesn't mean anything at that point. It's also very low out in the fall. You'll see it drops down to less than 50 degrees. Again, that's not a period when we're aiming for temperature control, so we don't use that. What we're really looking at is that middle section. So that's the yellow line, and then there's the red line. That is a simulated temperature out of the model. In this case, we have some assumptions. And I'm just going to show you one of many scenarios we've run. And this is with a power bypass, 90% um, power bypass mentioned earlier. And it also has transfers, the transfers that Lee just mentioned. So as we look at this, this is the 90% March forecast. We'll update all these runs uh, probably in the next few days. I, I presume all of the parties involved in this will be updating as we get new forecasts and new temperature conditions for thermal stratification in Shasta Lake. So when you look at this, this um, temperature trace, if you start on the left, this red line is rising in temperature and it goes right, crosses the yellow line and the vertical line there in mid um, to early May and continues to rise. The reason that it's, it's rising to these higher temperatures is because those waters are coming out of the upper river gates. This is the temperature, I mean, this is the hydropower bypass. So reclamation is only putting a small amount of water through the temperature control device during this time. Instead, they're using those higher upper river gates. Those gates are situated at an elevation of about 940 feet. If you use the middle gates, you would be accessing water down to 900 feet. So you would be reaching 40 feet deeper into the reservoir and pulling out colder water than you need to early in the year that you couldn't use later in the year. That's the concept of the power bypass. And one of the challenges, while the TCD is a remarkably efficient and effective facility at temperature control, is when, as Kristen mentioned, you don't have access to the upper gates, it really constrains operations on the TCD. And because the gate openings at each level are so large vertically, 46 feet for the upper and middle gates. When you open one, you necessarily reach deeper into the reservoir than you, than you want to go. That's why the river outlets are, in this particular simulation, run out to the end of May. And then you'll see the temperature drop and begin to follow the yellow line as the temperature control device is used through the summer, systematically reaching from the middle to the lower and ultimately around August 1st, the side gate structure, which is the deepest draw the TCD can do. And then the system runs out through August and into September. And then in later in September, you start to see right at the end of it, this, this loss, what we call loss of temperature control, which means that the TCD as a structure and the river gates for that matter, they cannot reach any deeper, cannot access the last bit of cold water probably on the order of 60 to 80,000 acre feet in the reservoir, the very bottom most waters. And then the temperatures begin to rise. What's important about this is that when you turn the side gate on, um, you're at the very bottom of your temperature management condition. And once you move only to the side gate, which happens out here uh, in the middle of August, you no longer can do anything to manage temperature at that point. You're just pulling the lowest, last, coldest water out of the system. These boxes on here also identify a couple of things. There's a little bit of noise in the red signal you can see here as we approach that side gate. That's an example of some model noise. Operators may operate around that. Um, the actual temperature trace may not look like that. Just wanted to bring that up as a model element. And then I also have a little blue box out here where this red line deviates from the temperature target and temperatures begin to climb rapidly. At that point, we're not quite sure. That's a very sensitive condition. 
and there's uncertainty around that exact deviation date. I'm not going to say that's going to occur on September 28th. It's going to occur, you know, plus or minus seven or 10 days from that, depending on many of the variables that people have already spoken about, meteorological conditions, unforeseen circumstances, uh, rates of heating in the reservoir, all those elements move that around a bit. What I'd like to identify here, though, is that with regard to these two actions, the power bypass and the transfers, that has produced approximately five weeks of additional time where the temperature can remain on the temperature target line. It does yield, uh, you, you give up a little bit, I would say, here two weeks in May. And if you go back to one of James's uh, slides about when the distribution of spawning was occurring, I believe the concept here was this was early when there weren't, wasn't a lot of spawning occurring yet. So those eggs would, would be uh, fewer in number affected by higher temperatures. And it preserves a longer period of time so that you could give those, um, those fishery life stages a better opportunity to uh, have appropriate or you know, functional temperatures, I would say. This is only one run. Uh, we've made several runs and shared those with the agencies um, and other stakeholders. I'm going to move past this to the next slide really quick, just in the in the interest of time. But at the end, we can um, answer any questions associated with this. There's a couple of slides in here that I, I think uh, National Marine Fisheries Service, the Science Center, spoke to, and it's been referenced um, several times. Even board members have asked questions about the appropriate use of models. And I think that what we're seeing here in this forum of multiple agencies aiming to achieve these kinds of goals is really um, a great achievement by all parties involved. Um, looking for transparency, um, identifying data and information as provisional, um, identifying where model um, additional model elements are going to be developed and shared. That's all good stuff. It makes everybody better. It makes the modelers better. It makes the decision makers, puts the decision makers in a better position. Um, it reduces friction and uncertainty, uh, increases confidence. So it's just an informational slide. You can read it at your leisure at another time. If you go to the next slide, please. And uh, this is the other element I just wanted to touch on in terms of, particularly for the board and perhaps certain agencies who don't do modeling every day. But fundamentally, you want to think about modeling from the beginning. What are you trying to achieve? What model will get you there? What is your region of interest? What are your spatial and temporal scales? How good does that model have to be to make a decision? How much uncertainty can you use? Is it for a back of the envelope calculation early in the season? Or are you really trying to drill down and get a very specific answer? And then you're going to put that model into application and you're going to look at it when you're done. How did you do? And you're going to go back and improve. And then it's really important to be able to communicate these elements to broader decision makers. So how do you present those results and how comfortable are they? Do they have um, assurances that there's been documentation, that there's been peer review? These are all things we've heard today. I just wanted to kind of put them in a bundle. So as you move forward with this work or other projects that use modeling, these might be some elements that you can consider. Thank you for your time. Yeah, we just had one last slide um, and I know we're out of time, so I don't wanna really walk through it. You can read it, but just again, looking forward, just letting you know this board know, your board know that we're committed as a settlement contractor group with working with our other partners in terms of these key areas of operations that Mike just covered, um, the science partnership, and I think as you as board members, um, board member uh, Firestone, just some of the issues that you've identified, if those if we can bring into the Sacramento Science Partnership, I think that would be a great place to be able to bring those up. You know, we've had uh, webinars, public webinars on a lot of these activities. So really excited about that. And then lastly, just Lewis covered a lot of the restoration, which is, as he mentioned, stuff that, that's ongoing. So again, just want to express our commitment to the board and our, our partners that, uh, you know, we're, we're more help, like like Lewis said, you know, leaning into it, uh, putting our shoulders in it would be great. So appreciate, appreciate the time and opportunity to present before you.
Thank you so much for your ongoing leadership and uh, creativity and collaboration. Um, it's really essential in getting um, this these conversations to move forward. So I wanna open it up to questions. I have quite a few of my own, but um, hopefully um, some of the other board members will be asking those so I won't tie things up too much at the end. Anyone? I can ask myself, waiting for others. Um, great. I, I mean, first of all, this, I, you know, it's amazing the amount of um, collaboration and kind of innovative stuff going on to address all kinds of, um, especially ecosystem and species of all kinds, not just fish. Um, and and um, so a couple of questions. One is just, I think you mentioned this, but it seems like uh, some of the decisions you're having to make um, in terms of timing and transfers and cuts um, may have implications for um, things like decomp and other habitat um, issues for other threatened species that aren't fish. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you fact how you how that decision making um, is brought into understanding all the different decisions and, and inter, um, interactions that happen. Yeah, I can start and then let Lewis. I think, I think we recognize there's going to be impacts in years like this. So it's really how do we create some certainty around managing those impacts um, and distributing is not the right word, but just making sure that we can do the best we can with what resource we may have remaining. And so I think um, to your point, yeah, I mean, we made a lot of these decisions early and started the planning early so we could kind of manage a lot of that and, and not end up with a chaotic outcome, you know? And so, for example, we worked with the refuge managers and, and Will, as the year goes on about how do we, you know, if we do have, you know, a little water available in the fall, we may not have very much, but how do we manage that in partnership with the refuge for, you know, flyaway items? You know, how do we keep our systems, you know, have some habitat for giant gar snakes. So can we leave some water in some of our canals and drains um, around fields that may, may not be formed this year? So, you know, really just trying to, again, do lessons learned from the previous drought. And, and I think really we approach every year as it's gonna be a dry year because, you know, we, we don't know otherwise. So working with our landowners, um, trying to get them as much information as early as possible and then taking risks. You know, we know we've made decisions already that you know we believe are could be part of the temperature plan you adopt we're not certain but we couldn't wait for you know your decision and knowing you have your own timeline we just had to sort of say yeah we believe this is the right path and we want to be partners on that but again there was some inherent risk in doing that but we think you know again it's the, the right approach so I'll let lewis comment too well i i uh i think it's hard work <laughs> Um, I, I think we rely on a lot of the experts throughout the valley and the meeting that Thad talked about with the bird folks was just one example of that. We, we try to listen to those folks and then understand what the limits are on the things that we can put on the table. Um, it's uh, you just try to do the best you can. So I mean, I, I don't think it's, it's any more perfect than that. Right. Yeah, no, I, um, uh, I, I, I guess I, you know, I hear you where it's like years like this, everything is, we're putting, it's sort of all hands on deck, putting everything on the table. Um, and, you know, um, uh, I, I think everybody and every part of the, the ecosystem and the watershed is, um, you know, is compromised in different ways. Um, is, I guess, you know, it looks like you all have already, um, like you said, you know, reduced um, sort of cut diversions voluntarily and done some, um, at least as I understood the chart and how you presented it, um, and done um, some, you know, diversions that um, through transfers um, that are planned. So, um, I guess I'm just, you know, as we look at these um, scenarios and 
you know, we don't, ha it sounds like we're still trying to understand what level of um, mortality may be happening. Um, I, I mean, I, it sounded like some anywhere from 90% to um, 70%. <laughs> Um, so just as you're looking at this, you know, from your standpoint and what you can, you know, what, what you can do as one of the partners putting all stuff, everything on the table, are there things, you know, would you be willing to do more cuts? Is there, are there other um, actions that you're looking at or have on the table as you will, along with, you know, everybody that's putting things on that you see and, and in addition to kind of what you've already already been out in front doing? Well, I, I can speak for our, you know, our district. I mean, we kind of did a allocation process with, again, you know, reduce supplies and, you know, tried to put together transfers, let growers know what they could, what assets they have left to continue to, to farm, even though they were all cut back. Any more water would mean going back out to them and taking water away from them. And they've kind of already made some decisions. Uh, I know in the past, we've tried to pump groundwater um, to try and close that gap. Um, you know, we don't have environmental clearance to do that. So it'd be a little bit of a challenge. Uh, but again, I think we're open to other ideas. Like I said, we, we believe like right now we're, and we like to talk about survival versus mortality, but you know, we think um, you know, we're in the 45% survival range. And, and again, I think the com, you know, we, we did similar actions before in the 14 and 15, I'd say we didn't have the, like Lewis said, all the best tools. So again, the newer reservoir tools, I think give us a lot more resolution on decision-making. And then we want to do a trip as we go through the year. So if there's ways to optimize operations um, to continue to improve survival, you know, that's really what we want to work with the temperature task group and other partners to do. Laurel, I, I mean, some of the things that are on my mind um, in this decision is the, you know, we're following in the Sac Valley a third, you know, approaching a half of the, sorry. <laughs> approaching, you know, 50% of the acres in the valley. And, uh, you know, I have concerns for lots of other species. I also have concerns around the whole system for salmon and last year, you know, survival was almost 100%. And, uh, you know, the, the results weren't great. And so if you move the needle by temperature dependent mortality by 10% or 20%, you make tremendous sacrifices for that. It doesn't feel to me like the next step of sacrifices, um, you know, this is me and folks are going to say, well, yeah, of course, you're the water user and, you know, it's your backyard. But doesn't feel to me like that's uh, that's worth the investment. Um, it's going to be a tough year. It all, I think it historically always was for fish when you had you know two of the drier years on record in a row. Um, but you know you, you can make up for that if you make the investments we need to make in a system that works for salmon. Um, and you know right now we kind of become hatchery dependent in these types of years, which I don't want to see us be in the future. Um, but uh, you know that that would be my decision right now. Great. I don't know that I have other questions right now. Thank you, Board Member McGuire. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really encouraging to hear about all the steps you're taking here to to look at you know ways to best manage what limited resources we have this year. And I know we've come, I, I feel like personally a long way in the past year, just in terms of uh, our collaborative outreach and connection. Um, I know your participation now with the SRTTG and the, the science partnership and all these different ways uh, that we're coming together at the table, looking at this uh, comprehensively, I think is just really invaluable, especially now. And so, you know, I'm keeping in mind that um, reclamations under a tight, Time frame here to develop their temperature management plan within the next week or week and a half or so. I think they're targeting the end of April. So, I was just, and you talked a bit about, uh, Mike Diaz talked a bit about the modeling work that, that you folks have done with reclamation. So, I was just wondering if you've had a chance to look at some of the, the results that are coming out of the rapid assessment tool yet, and if you're seeing some 
you know, synergies there? You know, are, are you essentially seeing agreement um, with some of your more sophisticated modeling versus that, you know, the rapid tool that's still in development? Just wondering, just to build some confidence in some of these scenarios. Maybe let Mike or Lee speak to that since they're more the technical folks. I can speak to that quickly, Thad. You know, one of the nice things about having multiple models is that you have these cross references. And so it's useful. Um, and there are differences. I, I cannot say that they're the same. Um, we're still trying to work through some of those elements. Um, the screening element of the rapid assessment tool is, is useful. The sensitivity of Lake Shasta or Shasta Lake in a year like this under low storage conditions, lack of access to the upper TCD gates and late season temperature challenges. Um, we've spent a lot of time working on that in these detailed models to really refine that so we can reproduce that. If, if uh, you were around in the 14 and 15 and looked at the post audit from, uh, from reclamation in those years, that high temperature gradient, that late season challenge was really important. So I think it's useful to have, you know, the models so long as you remember they're just models, you know, they're, they're, you know, they're not going to give you the answer, they're going to constrain the problem, and you're going to use humans to take that information and, uh, and develop, you know, based on various balances and risks, um, what they can make happen. And, uh, you know, it's just that, you know, somebody once told me a model is just a really, really fast calculator. You know, that's, that's what it's really doing for you, but it's not really giving you an answer, uh, just constraining the problem a little bit. So um, there are differences, but uh, I, working together has been very useful and helpful, I think, for all parties. So I hope that answers your question. Yeah, Member McGuire, I'd say that one of the things we're looking forward to is hopefully, you know, this, the Sac River Science Partnership is an op a place that we feel, you know, we can sort of do these model comparisons, how, you know, what, what's their use? When do you use them? You know, I mean, sometimes they feel like a black box. And I think if it's an opportunity to be able to understand and share these different tools, um, you know, we're really looking forward to that dialogue within the partnership. And again, would welcome anybody who wants to, you know, from the public who wants to participate in those that are open. Yes, thank you. That, that answers my question. And, and certainly I'm, I'm thinking here about the, you know, we have the the short-term sort of critical path decision making that has to happen here within a very tight window. We have the data, we have the modeling runs we have today, and obviously you'll refine those in coming weeks as you get the reservoir profile and other data. And then sort of the long-term opportunities, which I think is some of what you're alluding to, to you know really look at the synergies and benefits that all these different tools provide. So thank you for that. It's really helpful. I was just going to add, Board Member Require. I think I think you got it captured it there and you know this I think Mr. Gilbert did a very nice job um, describing the his tool and um, it is relatively new and we haven't really had much of an opportunity to take a look at it it's something that we definitely want to do um, I would say for the past month or you know so uh, we've really been focused on kind of the all hands on deck and what are we going to do this year and and not so much diving into that that particular tool or, or looking at it Thank you. Member Dodick. Thank you. Thank you for, for that presentation. I think I, my questions are going to be directed to Lewis. Um, thank you for presenting the salmon recovery plan and uh, sharing your optimism and uh, your vision of the golden age of salmon. I think uh, we all certainly would like to see that happen. Um, I guess the, the question is, and it ties back to Member McGuire's comment about the short term as well as the long term, the short term critical decision making, and then of course the long term vision that we're all are striving for. You know, if we are going to hopefully get to this golden age of salmon, which by the way, I love that phrase, I'm going to continue to use it and credit you with it. Um, it strikes me, how do we get there when we're, well, let me, let me rephrase this. How confident are you? of us reaching that stage when we're looking at, you know, anywhere from 90% to 60% mortality, or if you want to rephrase it in terms of survival, you know, 40%, uh, 45% survival seems 
low. Um, and I know that you are considering all sorts of voluntary actions and, and other things, um, but given that low rate, what else should be, should be on the table? Um, you know, what sort of infrastructure investment um, have you been discussing? Um, and I know that board member Firestone already approached one issue with respects to reduced diversion that uh, you did not, uh, was not too enthusiastic about. But I, I am curious as to, you know, what other voluntary actions are being discussed. Um, you know, the governor emphasized today in his press conference how strongly supportive and committed he is to voluntary local actions on the ground. And certainly we all do that. Uh, but, you know, at some point when there is a great need, ultimately results are what matter. And I think we all share that commitment to results of a, you know, of a, of a thriving economy, which includes not just the agricultural sector, but also the fishing industry as well. So how do we get to that golden age? What other actions are being considered? What infrastructure investments do you think are needed? So, uh, yeah, I think you can hear me. So, um, so uh, two different things. So um, you have to have all the links of the chain for salmon to work. And we've seen that on Butte Creek. And we had all of those things in place. Um, we're now getting returns of salmon that are 50 to 100 times um, what they were before those were in place. The links of each uh, stage of salmon life cycle. I think it's super important to remember that the broken system that we have for salmon right now doesn't even produce good numbers of salmon in good years. And that's what we're missing, frankly. We're missing the boom um, to the bus and we're, we're missing other options before, besides uh, spawning of salmon in Redding. You know, it's uh, with climate change facing us right now, um, I suspect there'll be more years like this where, uh, you know, raising salmon in Redding will be difficult. Um, but we have to remember that that's, if you remember Dave Mooney's slide, um, tier one and tier two is expected to be 85% of the years. If in 85% of the years we had a, uh, a link of chains for salmon that produced an abundant population of salmon, we could survive years like this. Um, we can make it. That's how it worked naturally. We used to have a million plus salmon on the Sacramento River. Um, it's, uh, you know, we've started a population of salmon on Battle Creek. I say we, the state is working with the feds on that. Um, the whole Northwest is moving salmon above Shasta where they used to spawn. This is not where salmon spawned. We all know that, right? We're, uh, we're artificially raising them in the Sacramento River in Redding. Um, they need to be in a place where they have cold water reliably um, for the spawning stage of the life cycle. We need to restore the food supply that supported the juveniles. So we had healthy juveniles making it out to the ocean and surviving at a much higher rate of survival. I think those are the kinds of things that will produce hundreds of thousands of salmon returning in a healthy commercial fishery and a healthy sport fishing. Uh, industry. But right now, I, I think the biggest thing that I would do is the floodplain work. Um, our flood control system reduced the number of active uh, floodplain um, acre days uh, in the Sacramento Valley dramatically. And that's why we saw a huge loss of fish between 1920 and 1930. It's when we completed the flood system. It's when the delta was starting to become complete and we, we stopped the shallow water habitat. We can reconnect those things in the Sacramento Valley. And that's why we proposed a $2 billion effort over the next decade and a half to the federal government, because we think modifying those weirs in the Sacramento Valley, modifying the internal infrastructure in the floodplains and spreading water out and slowing it down in the Sacramento Valley is the foundation for a healthy salmon fishery. So I think those things, um, you know, will dwarf in comparison the idea that we have to every year raise uh, salmon in Redding, because um, I just don't think it's long-term possible to do it every year. All right, can I just ask one follow-up question? I'm not as super helpful. Um, so 
you know, again, I'm new to the whole system. So the, um, as you are, um, you know, managing these different um, reductions in diversions and then um, opportunities for, for flood um, habitat, um, how do you, you know, I, I don't know how much this is an issue. I just, um, I know in some areas it is, but how do you um, kind of measure how that, um, how that's done, how um, that, that adds up and what that, how that fits with the, the overall kind of accounting that you're doing regionally? Is that a too big? Are, are you well? So I'm not. I'm not quite sure where you're headed. If you were heading to, how do you quantify the benefits of reconnecting the floodplains? Is one of no. I, I mean, that would be amazing to do. It seems like what part of your or a big part of your point is. You know, we're not going to restore populations without you know restoring um, that those that habitat um, and. Uh, and temperature mortality is just one component, but alone is not gonna bring about the, um, and may even not be the, the most dominant, um, especially when you look at the long-term of, um, of salmon populations. That's, that's kind of what I heard. Um, but I, I, I guess I'm interested, you know, for these, um, especially in these critical years, um, and maybe it's true in the really wet years, probably a lot matters less, but, um, you know, how do you, how do you do accounting of how, you know, the different um, diversions and sort of, you know, can, can see how you are um, as a region able to um, report and ensure that you're, you're meeting those targets, um, especially, yeah, I, it just seems like a, a, um, a challenging time as people are just trying to survive and figure out how to utilize water and, and well uh, I mean I, I I think just to quickly speak to that I, I mean we're all of our diversions are measured um, they're real-time metered um, you know I think we do that internally that's been part of the SB88 requirement um, Lee mentioned the portal that we have so we have everybody entering you know daily weekly monthly orders and then we true those up in 14 and 15 you know of that quantity that Lee was showing we were moving 30 or 40 CFS or you know 80 acre feet a day we're moving up and down the river so we would say hey we have to meet this certain flow target point which we call Wilkins Slough which a which a you know like at 4,000 CFS we were meeting that because reclamation was using the rest of that water for downstream and delta users were using that water and such so we would say hey somebody's a little bit short or somebody has some room and so we were actually moving that small of a quantity so like one percent of our diversion or something like that we were sharing you know, up 60, 80 miles up and down the river just to optimize everybody's usage to stay on our targets. So, I mean, and under, you know, and so, I mean, I think that's our commitment, you know, this year, um, you know, again, to transparency, people want to see that data. Um, we're, we're willing to share that and, and you know, let, let you know what we can do. And certainly, you know, want to post COVID invite you to come up and tour kind of what a year looks like like this you know and see 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 for yourself but um no i think we get that we need to be great stewards with the resource and, and really that's our goal for this year and can you just talk a little bit about what the um what the diversion what what the reductions in those diversions um especially the voluntary ones what does that mean like what it what um what is that what are those impacts um and changes then that you all have to make or the users in that area have to be. Uh, I, I know for us, it would mean um, more land coming out of production and maybe some landowners who have wells, maybe pumping a little bit for water their own property versus taking supplies, um, strict recycling, you know, we increase our, the amount of water recycling we do um, over and over again. Um, and then, um, you know, just, just trying to work with moving water around like we have some lands that are um habitat lands and they want water more in the fall so we could say hey well don't maybe don't take water in the spring summer but wait till the fall and flood up your habitat ground then you know or use water then so you know it's really 
I think each district has a different menu of actions it's going to implement to try and address, you know, any, you know, voluntary shortages that, that exist. Great, thanks. Sorry for the, the extra questions there, Vice Chair. So. Great, thank you for the good questions. That's actually where I was kind of headed to, so I'm glad this will be a good segue for me. Um, uh, so just a, a few um, kind of key areas here. Um, and I, I agree with board member McGuire, uh, sort of short term, long term. And so in the, in the short term, um, how I, I just want to better understand, um, and it's not hasn't been evident to me. There's different numbers being tossed around today, so I'm hoping that uh, you can help me to better understand. Maybe there's already been a lot of uh, or a fair amount of information sharing, and um, you all are starting to kind of converge on similar figures that the bureau's talking about and that NIMS is talking about. So just want to get some clarification there. But in the long run, absolutely, um, I'm just really hoping that there can be um, greater vetting and um, open uh, open discussion about uh, the de development of the NIMS tool. We talked about that earlier, and I know this is something that you're interested in as well. And then lastly, um, I just want to point out that, you know, the whole reason that we're here is because of a concern on temperature dependent mortality and um, that uh, the salmon have been severely impacted um, in prior years. And we want to try and avoid that. Uh, but we don't, I think, necessarily want to avoid that at the cost of someone else being hurt. And so um, that's why I'm just really grateful for all of this good creative thinking, you know, on voluntary actions, even if you're not seeing um, in some of these actions uh, necessarily a reduction in water supply, it's um, actions that you all are taking um, to be looking at um, how we can see a reduction in that mortality. Um, not necessarily that you all have to be hurt in the process, but of course, there'll be some pain along the way as well. And so I just want to better understand in these different buckets. And I'm looking at uh, slide number eight on the estimated diversions. You've got here the voluntary reductions where you do show that it is an impact on water supply and then uh, reductions for transfers. And I'm trying to better understand where that fits in with some of the dialogue that we had earlier today on that 5% reduction. Um, and I know it's not your tool, but you do understand the tool, I think, better than some of us. So can you comment on that? Yeah, um, thanks, uh, Vice Chair. Uh, we, we have not seen the that run that was shown earlier um, about the temperature targets and the 5% reduction in the estimates at the science and we, we, we haven't seen that. So that was kind of new to us today. So I can't really speak to that about what assumptions were in that model run. Um, I think for us, again, we've been looking at our suite of activities from the power bypass to transfers to voluntary reductions. And, and we believe each one of those has about um, an eight to 10% improvement in survival in each one of those actions. So, you know, we think that while some of the original estimates were 90-ish percent mortality, we think through the actions that we're taking that survival um, or temperature dependent mortality is in that 60% range now. So going from 90 to 60 um, and potentially improves from there. So, um, you know, we're, we feel like it's made a huge difference. And I don't, I don't, as I saw the earlier presentation, I don't know if the, Science Center Rapid Assessment Tool included the bypass power and or transfers or, or our voluntary reduction. I don't know what their baseline was because again, we haven't seen that um, presented to us in our, our work groups that we've had. Okay, um, Mr. Mr. Gilbert, looks like you're jumping in here. Um, it'd be great if we could get that question answered. Hold on one second, we, we've got to get you access. Okay, um, yes. So the um, that 5% reduction 
uh, scenario was meant to be just sort of a, a general qualitative um, estimate of the sensitivity of reducing from that baseline um, release scenario. Um, I will say that the um, that period of the reduction uh, coincides with the uh, the transfers uh, that were discussed um, through the basically the, the April through September period. Um, the thing is, we did not add that water back on as additional releases in those fall months. Um, it was just a um, change in flow over those summer months. Uh, and um, I, I cannot say at this point that the, the amounts are, um, are the same as what um, was estimated um, with the, the settlement contractors model. Um, it was just an across the board 5% adjustment for simplicity's sake. Um, the model runs that we've um, presented on today did not include the power bypass or those transfers as well. So it was just, um, again, for simplicity, it was the, the baseline operation uh, with some temperature targeting and then that um, across the board production um, through the summer months. Okay, very good. Thank you for that. Um, I suppose you all be talking about this quite a bit more at the uh, temperature task force group com meeting coming up. So I won't take up any more time on that, but that would be uh, for me an important piece of information once you all know more. Um, uh, hopefully if it's a, a 5% target that gets to that improved uh, number on mortality and it happens to be uh, in alignment with um, um, Thad and Lewis and really all of you that, that what you're presenting today, then that, that would be a win-win um, scenario across the board um, from my perspective, if we can get there through this um, improved uh, collaboration and um, voluntary measures um, that you all have come up with. But um, if it doesn't hit that target, then I suppose, you know, we'd have to uh, hear about what other measures uh, would need to take place or other adjustments in that rapid assessment, uh, perhaps through further vetting and discussion of that rapid assessment tool. So thank you very much. And with that, um, we will, I, I see um, John Manis, you've been very patiently waiting for your turn here. Um, we will move on to the next public presentation, the Golden Gate Salmon. Association and Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Association, uh, John Manis and Mike Conroy. Good afternoon, thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Actually, it's uh, John McManus. We used to be the Golden Gate Salmon Association. We changed our name to the Golden State Salmon Association, but we haven't told everybody, so let me use this opportunity to tell you all. Um, it's good to be with you. Um, boy, I've heard so many things today that I would love to comment on, and I will circle back to a few of them later. But one um, that was just mentioned, I think uh, board member Firestone was asking about um, the temperature plan and the May timeline. And I think I just heard Thad say, and here it is, April 21st on the calendar, that decisions have already been made. So um, perhaps will be an opportunity to hear more about that later. Um, can we go to the next slide? Thank you. Uh, the area in orange shows you where salmon live on the west coast of North America. And if you notice, we're at the very bottom of it. The very bottom of it. They come and go under the Golden Gate Bridge and they come out of the Central Valley. And I hope that uh, we remain part of salmon habitat. But as of right now, um, it's not 100% clear. Uh, we hope the board will take action to keep salmon in our future, and we need you all to take that action. It'd be awfully convenient if courts would do it, uh, answer some questions for everybody, but that's probably not going to happen. So we look to the state board to uh, do its duty here. Next slide, please. These salmon, next slide, by the way, came from just outside San Francisco. Keep these afloat. The boats you see here in uh, Bodega Bay Harbor, basically every single one of those boats has a connection to salmon. Every one of those boats uh, costs a lot of money to own and maintain and operate and employs all kinds of people in the owning, maintaining and operation. And it's not just Bodega Bay. Next slide, please. Um, 
there's businesses at every port and harbor up and down the state uh, that are also thriving on dollars that are related to the salmon industry. People come out to the coast to fish or even to the inland communities up and down the Sacramento River, and they spend a whole lot of money with local businesses. And I, I kind of wanted to touch on this today because uh, I have a feeling that um, the voices of these people are not always heard. And so I wanted to give them some voice today. Next slide, please. In addition, there's all kinds of business dollars being funneled into uh, businesses throughout the state, like Tim Eli, shown here at his store in Rohnert Park. They've got 40 employees in that store alone. These kind of stores are all over the place. Next slide, please. Ocean salmon anglers spend over $150 on average just to try and catch a salmon. And we have tens of thousands of people in California who try and catch salmon. When you think about the dollars spent and all the jobs that are supported. Next slide, please. People wait in long lines. Um, sometimes you see these lines that go back for a half a mile of people waiting to launch their boats. Next slide, please. They pay a whole lot of money to pack onto charter boats all up and down the coast to catch salmon. These charter boat operators hire people. They in turn spend a lot of the dollars that come in. Next slide, please. They pack into fishing and outdoor shows. Next slide. Businesses that serve the salmon industry abound in central and northern California. This is a shot looking at a part of the marina in San Rafael. Almost every one of those boats, all those vehicles that you see there are all related in one shape or form to the salmon industry. And again, these shots abound throughout California. Next shot. Next slide. Same thing, this is Moss Landing. Santa Cruz Harbor looks the same, Monterey Harbor looks the same. Um, there's a lot of money all up and down the coast. And all of these people, I think it's fair to say, are hoping that the state board will take action this year to get our salmon in a better situation. Um, we basically saw natural spawning salmon extirpated throughout large sections of Northern California including the upper Sacramento River, or close to extirpation. That was in 2014 and 2015. I'll give you an example. In 2017, three years later after 2014, I think there was something like 1,300 natural spawning salmon that returned to the upper Sacramento Basin, which is a paltry number. Um, and God help us all, if the fall run gets listed, it's gonna hurt everybody. Next slide, please. Sacramento River fishing supports many families by providing food for a whole bunch and employment for some. Many of these boats that you see here are actually charter boats and they're employing local people to run those, those trips. People in those boats in this instance are paying closer to two to $300 ahead to have a shot at catching a salmon. Um, and this is shot near the mouth of, uh, or the confluence of Battle Creek in the upper Sacramento River. Next shot, please. And we're not the only ones that like salmon. Um, salmon coming out of the Central Valley not only support the ocean fishery in California, they support about 60% of all salmon caught off the Oregon coast. And we've got um, all of these animals up and down the coast that rely on salmon. Next slide, please. So I think as everybody has commented today, it's, it's pretty obvious that salmon need a little water to survive. Um, the numbers that I've heard today are that we can expect to lose 70% of the winter run and probably more than that of the fall run. I I'd like to call the board's attention to comments made earlier today by Doug Killam of the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. He told you that the fall run spawn generally peaks in October, that they start spawning in September and peak in October. Um, people from the Bureau of Reclamation today have made clear that their temperature concerns are all around spawning and incubation of winter run. And after the winter run are deemed to have hatched and come out of the gravel, the Bureau no longer seems to have much interest in temperature and then turns its concern to red dewatering. Well, we're concerned about red dewatering too, and we appreciate that. But temperatures are crucial for fall run. And what I'm hearing today is that we can expect another 2014 when it comes to fall run. That is to say, we're gonna lose them. 
The eggs will be in the gravel. They'll be incubating and come probably Halloween, maybe a week before, maybe a week after. Uh, temperatures will probably be up into the low 60s in the Sacramento River. And what I'm hearing from presenters today is we can expect to see all those fall run eggs wiped out. Now, some fall run will continue to come in actually all the way up into the new year, truth be told. Uh, they'll come in through late November and in December. And by that time, ambient air temperature is expected to take the river temperature down and fish arriving in December will be able to successfully spawn. We hope, we hope, but that's a heck of a way to run business when we wipe out the majority of the fall run because temperatures shoot up above levels that the eggs can take in late October and early November. Next slide, please. So this is a shot of the Fresno River. Uh, and as you can see, it's been killed dead. And this is the type of thing that happened in California before the creation of the State Water Resources Control Board. So we look to the State Water Resources Control Board to keep this type of thing from happening again, including, including what happens to our salmon stocks. Next slide. I will stop there and toss to my good friend and colleague, Mr. Mike Conroy. Thanks, John. I'm just confirming that everybody can hear me. Yes. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, Vice Chair and Board Members. Uh, my name is Mike Conroy, and I'm the Executive Director of PCFFA, Pacific Coast Federation of Fishermen's Associations. We are the largest organization of commercial fishermen and women on the West Coast, with membership from Southern California to the Canadian border. Uh, today, we are here imploring you to adopt Sacramento River temperature management that takes the needs of Sac River salmon runs into account in a way that doesn't result in spawning failures. Uh, earlier today, NIMS announced that Sac River rental run are one of the species in the spotlight and thus subject to an action plan. And I'm going to quote from that thing that came out today. Winter run are dependent upon sufficient cold water originating from those headwaters to be released from Sasta Reservoir to, from spring to fall, the time of year when they are present below the reservoir. It has long been recognized that a prolonged drought could have devastating impacts possibly leading to species extinction. John did a wonderful job of explaining the importance of the state's recreational salmon fisheries. I'm gonna be focusing on the importance of salmon to our members, uh, the dependent coastal communities, the heritage and tradition of salmon fisheries to those communities, uh, the cultural importance of salmon to tribes and all Californians, and how you play an integral role in assuring all the aforementioned that, that we aren't bearing witness to the extinction of iconic Sacramento River runs. Order 90-5 states that the temperature of water is critical to salmonid, salmonid spawning and egg incubation. And the order requires meeting 56 degree Fahrenheit at Red Bluff if hotter temperatures would harm the fishery. The science is clear that 56 degrees in the spawning grounds does not protect salmon and will cause substantial mortality to salmon eggs. The course is clear. You need to require reclamation to ensure sufficient cold water is available to meet public trust responsibilities for salmon, including fall run Chinook. You have to do this. No other agency will do your job for you. Uh, next slide, please. California commercial salmon harvesters catch your fish one at a time. Uh, we are not the industrial operations depicted in a recent infomercial appearing on Netflix. We participate in a highly regulated fishery that by any definition is sustainable. Next slide, please. Throughout California, the public can come to the docks and purchase fresh salmon directly from the harvester. The ability for the consumer to meet and interact with the harvester builds our community. I encourage you when the season opens in just a little over a week to experience the interaction. Meet the people whose future you influence with your actions. Next slide, please. In days of old, fishermen fished. <laughs> they couldn't be bothered with meetings, workshops, webinars, etc. That has changed. Today, I am proud to stand next to and behind our members as they educate and engage in the fight for salmon. They understand and appreciate the need for suitable habitat throughout the salmon's lifestyle. Are they happy about this year's restrictions on ocean fisheries? No, but they understand the need to allow sufficient numbers to return to their birthplace to create the next generation. They are, they are hoping you understand the need to ensure that only the spawned adults die in the river this year. Next slide, please. As previously noted, without salmon, many of the state's small ports and harbors would suffer. For 2019, which is the most recent year for which data is publicly available, 
salmon X vessel revenues for the state totaled roughly $16.5 million. Using a conservative downstream multiplier of six times, the total economic benefit of the commercial salmon harvest is roughly $100 million a year. And that was during a down year. Right now, the Klamath stocks are concerning activity in the Klamath management zone, such that 2019 revenues in Eureka were roughly only 325,000. Please don't allow what is happening to fishing, fisheries and communities around the KMZ to happen further south. Next slide, please. I'm gonna share a question that I am repeatedly asked. Why are our activities, providing food for Californians, sort of viewed as less important than allowing water to be diverted for almond production? A recent news article indicated that California almonds are exported to over 100 countries. Next slide, please. I would add, why is it more important to divert water for a luxury food, primarily for export, than it is to ensure survival of salmon stocks, which are culturally important, economically important, and important to the identities of many of the state's small ports and harbors. Next slide, please. During last year, and this is just depicts Central Valley salmon populations as they've gone down from 20, sorry, from 1985 to 2019. Next slide, please. During last year's Zeke Greater Fisheries Forum, Secretary Crowfoot shared the state's goal of du doubling the Sacramento River winter run, spring run, late fall run, and late run populations. We have full confidence that you'll be partners with us in taking actions with further this goal to the benefit of a great number of Californians. Next slide, please. So we wanted to take the opportunity to show you how actions taken by the government can have repercussions beyond what you see in front of you. This year's harvest is based on fish that exited the river in 2018. I'm not here to point fingers at anyone, but just to show the dramatic reductions in opportunities that commercial fleets are facing this year. We are hoping that three or four years from now, we are not remembering this year as the good old years. Uh, keep in mind that 2020, the, 20, the 2020 almond crop is estimated to be the largest on record, and that's from an April 8th article in the Capitol Press. Uh, next slide, please. By comparison, you see here the reduction in recreational harvest opportunity when 2021 when compared to 2020, similar reductions. Next slide, please. We need your help. And the most direct way you, direct way you can help us is by supporting Sacramento River temperature management that prioritizes survival of embryonic salmon. We are cognizant of the drought and expect there will be fain, pains felt all around. We feel for California farmers and would hope that the federal government steps in much like recent actions taken for farmers dependent on water from the Klamath. We are not proposing that you disregard the needs and concerns of farmers who feed Californians, but rather we are asking you to take into consideration your public trust responsibilities and not oversee the extinction of Sacramento River salmon runs. If we can get anticipated mortality down to below 30%, which pains me to even say is we should always strive for zero mortality. We believe that would be appropriate given conditions. Certainly there are options for consideration which would cap egg mortality below 30%. Next slide, please. And of course, the obligatory, the obligatory wild capture salmon is good and healthy for you marketing ploy. Uh, please don't allow pictures like this to be part of a textbook explaining why we allowed Sacramento River salmon runs to go extinct. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, appreciate um, your leadership in this area and for your uh, comments. Um, questions, fellow board members? Board member Firestone. Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, uh, and yeah, thank you. I When I moved to Sacramento, um, I just, one of the most amazing things I remember is being able to see the salmon jumping. I'd never seen that before. So um, I, uh, my question is, you mentioned um, about fall run and that the management issue of, you know, focusing on winter run, um, but not managing around fall run temperature. And I'm just wondering what what would be the management options that you would want to see um, or that you think are feasible um, as we manage for winter run, you know, to protect from extinction uh, and the kind of really serious threat to, um, to winter run to, to also, and are trying to address dewatering. Um, and it just seemed like there was a, from the previous uh, panels that, 
a lot of the um, temperature management actions were limited after, in order to conserve temperature, enable really cold temperature for winter run. So by the time you got to fall, it was, there wasn't much opportunity to, um, to, to manage differently. And I'm just wondering if you have, if you had specific things in mind that might be um, possible or feasible to do to, to manage better for that fall run. If I can jump in for a second, just make a few comments on that. Um, following this panel, you'll hear from John Rosenfield and Doug Obiji, and I think they can actually go into some detail and some technical aspects of that. Um, left to its own devices uh, on the Bureau's uh, water release schedule, as I understand it, um, we basically can't, we're toast. Um, and that's why we come to you because only you on the board have the authority as we understand it and the obligation under state law to make sure the water is being used reasonably. And um, again, you'll get some detail coming up from uh, Mr. Rosenfield and uh, Mr. OBG. Great, thanks. All right. I just want to thank the panel for providing some really important perspective, I think, on the fishing industry and the current state it's in today. I, I know you're, you're struggling right now and you're going through a lot. And so it's really important uh, you know, that your voices are heard here as we deliberate and you know, think about the, the path forward and how best to manage through this really difficult time that we're all in. So thank you very much. Board Member McGuire, if I can just make a comment. Um, we have basically lost Delta smelt in the wild. And that occurred um, just in the last decade or so. Probably the State Water Resources Control Board is probably the only entity that can keep that from happening to other species. So I wanna impress on all of you the gravity of the situation here and the duty that you guys agreed to do in serving on the board. I, I, I don't envy you. <laughs> I don't envy, I don't envy you. It's grim. I understand, thank you. Thank you, board member Dodek. Uh, Mr. McManus, uh, actually both of you, thank you for your presentation today. Um, I know that you were under a time constraint during your presentation, but I was wondering if there was anything else you've heard today, Mr. McManus in particular, since you mentioned it, <laughs> to which you would like to respond. Thank you for that. Um, I wanted to pick up on your discussion of the golden age of salmon. Um, we agree, I think everybody agrees that uh, habitat restoration is important and, and the Golden State Salmon Association devotes much of its time and energy to habitat restoration projects as well. But I wanna point out um, relative to some of the happy talk we heard earlier that fish food really doesn't do any good if we don't have any baby salmon there to eat it. Gravel in rivers doesn't do any good if the adults that lay their eggs have hot water wash over it and kill all the eggs. So what's needed first and foremost is cold water in the fall for spawning and incubation. And we have to get some pulse flows. In dry years, in the hardest of years, we need some pulse flows coming down that river to deliver the juveniles out to the ocean. Let me just make a comment here. I don't know if folks know this, but the state of California has made a decision this year to truck all of its hatchery fish to the bay. They are not releasing them in the river because the conditions are too hostile. Conditions are expected to hit 70 degrees, as I understand it, down at, down at Freeport, just below Sacramento. That's gonna kill out migrating baby salmon. Um, I understand that there's something on the order of just under a million juvenile salmon still sitting at the Coleman National Fish Hatchery up on Battle Creek. And I've heard that the Fish and Wildlife Service is thinking long and hard about trucking those fish. That's how hostile the conditions are in the river this year. Um, although this is an extreme year, too many years see a lack of flow in the spring needed to get these juvenile fish out. So the habitat restoration is good, we agree but we have to get some water so we can get some baby fish to take advantage of it. And I'll stop there. Okay, thank you for that. Um, 
I don't have any questions. Mine was the same as board member Firestones and I will uh, wait to hear what uh, Doug, o Doug OBG and John Rosenfield have to say. Um, I think we should take a break. Um, we've got quite a few speakers, so um, uh, we'll just do a 10 minute break. And before um, taking the break, I just wanna announce that um, I would like to limit uh, public comment to three minutes. I'm very concerned that if we go with five minutes that we will not um, have enough of an opportunity for everybody on the list uh, to speak. We're gonna be going past five, it looks like. And I would just encourage um, all of you to um, uh, not be repetitive in uh, your public comment, um, if at all possible. And wherever you can say me too, if, you, um, if your thoughts are aligned with someone who's already spoken or a panelist, that would be really helpful. Um, we've all been taking notes and um, uh, something like that would help with the efficiency of time. And of course, if you need more than that, just you know, go ahead and say so and we'll do what we can to be accommodating. So we will come back at um, 3.12 from our break.
for those of you who are in the Zoom platform, we've got multiple Dugs on, but we have a, a Doug that came in recently with no last name and we um, cannot associate with one of our speaker cards. I'm going to invite you to unmute so that we can identify you. And if you are scheduled to speak later today, we can make sure we have the right name up. So you should receive a request on your Zoom device to unmute in a moment. Hey, hi, this is Doug. Can you hear me? I can, Doug. Uh, yeah, I'm stepping out of a desktop computer and switching to a mobile phone and wanted to be available for questions later on, if that's okay. possible. No problem. So it's Doug Killam again, right? Yes. Okay, thanks, Doug. We'll get you renamed and we'll have this as a backup one. All right, thank you. Okay, welcome back. Mr. Lawfer, are we ready to go on your end? Yes, yes. Okay. our next panelists have been given co-host permission and they are ready to roll and I believe we're getting the presentation up now. Okay, great. Now we'll hear from John Rosenfield with San Francisco Baykeeper, Doug OBG with Natural Resources Defense Council and Greg Reyes from the Bay Institute. I hope I pronounced your name correctly, Mr. Reyes. Hi, good afternoon. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Great, thank you. Good afternoon, board members. I'm John Rosenfield, senior scientist at San Francisco Baykeeper. My colleagues, Greg Reese from the Bay Institute, Doug Abiji from the Natural Resources Defense Council, and I are here to describe the catastrophe facing Sacramento River Chinook salmon this summer. Next slide, please. Central Valley Chinook salmon are in deep trouble. The Bureau's recurrent failure to manage Shasta Dam to preserve adequate cold water supplies that these fish depend on is a significant contributor to the plight of three of the Sacramento River's Chinook salmon runs. Once again this year, high water temperatures threaten to devastate Sacramento River Chinook salmon populations. This afternoon, my colleagues will explain that reducing water deliveries now is essential to survival of the winter, spring, and fall run Chinook salmon that spawn below Shasta and Keswick dams. But the Water Board must act quickly if we are to avert this disaster. Next slide, please. California's Fish and Game Code, the Water Quality Control Plan, and the Federal Central Valley Project Improvement Act call for doubling Central Valley Chinook salmon populations off of their 1967 to 1991 baseline populations. But instead of doubling, these populations have declined dramatically compared to the 1967 to 1991 baseline period. 
The baseline populations are shown in the left column of the table on this slide. And the right column shows the percentage decline from the baseline for each run. The figures at the bottom of the graph, uh, at the bottom of the slide, show, gra show graphically how the imperiled winter and spring run populations have declined from the historic baseline and have never really approached the doubling requirement, which is indicated on the figures by the dashed horizontal line on the right side. Next slide, please. The fall run Chinook salmon have also been impacted by failed reservoir and river management. And that failure has impacted California's commercial salmon fishery, as you just heard. As we see here, California salmon landings which largely reflects Central Valley fall run Chinook salmon, dropped precipitously, including a complete closure in 2008 and 2009. This year, the fishery will be severely restricted once again. But if current reservoir management and temperature projections come to pass, then salmon that are not caught in the ocean will return to spawn in a river that is too hot to support their eggs. Next slide, please. The Sacramento River hosts four unique populations of Chinook salmon. This remarkable diversity is achieved by the fish dividing up the year into different spawning seasons. Sacramento River Chinook salmon spawn in every month, as you can see in the middle column of this table. This means that their eggs are affected by river temperatures in every month. Note that the timing of spring run and fall run spawning means that their eggs are susceptible to high water temperatures in September, October, and November. Next slide, please. There's been some discussion of whether temperature standards for Central Valley Chinook salmon eggs ought to be higher than the standards for Northern populations because Central Valley fish are at the Southern end of the species range. I wanna emphasize that even conceptually, there's little support for this argument in the egg stage of Chinook salmon. And we now know that the temperature standard enshrined in Water Rights Order 90-5 is too high. Fish exposed to average daily water temperatures of 56 degrees Fahrenheit will experience temperature-dependent egg mortality. There is consensus that no temperature-dependent egg mortality occurs in the range indicated by the blue brackets, the blue bracket on this graph. Next slide, please. This slide shows some of the recent studies and literature reviews that have concluded that exposure to daily average water temperatures of 56 degrees Fahrenheit, as found in Water Rights 90-5, will result in some temperature-dependent egg mortality. So it was surprising to hear this morning that the Bureau still makes its water management plans around the 56 degree Fahrenheit standard in the shoulder seasons when winter run, spring run, and fall run will be impacted by high temperatures. Many of the studies and reviews that are on this uh, table focus on management of Central Valley Chinook salmon, and they occur with, uh, uh, they concur with or identify lower temperature targets than those temperatures that are recommended for Chinook salmon eggs from elsewhere in the Pacific Northwest. Next slide, please. So why are temperature dependent egg mortality rates so important? We're focusing so much on them today. It's because Chinook salmon migrate into freshwater and they die after spawning, specifically because the river environment has historically been a safe place for their eggs and juveniles. These fish migrate hundreds of miles upstream specifically to avoid warm water temperatures downstream. And this behavior means that temperature dependent egg mortality was exceedingly rare historically. This figure attempts to place temperature dependent egg mortality in a, in a geographic context. A typical, uh, let me describe the figure. So this is a map of California, Oregon's on the Northern border. San Francisco's at the bottom of the slide, San Francisco Bay uh, and the Delta are there at the bottom of the slide. And the blue line indicates the course of the Sacramento River. A typical Chinook salmon population in a typical year will have 10% of its eggs survive to migrate to the ocean. And this journey is represented by the green bracket on the slide. In order to achieve this high level of freshwater survival, which is the key to Chinook salmon behavior and population biology, egg to fry survival must be high. 
In a typical Chinook salmon population, this is measured across their range and other managed rivers, egg to fry survival averages 38%. In our river, egg to fry survival is measured as the fish migrate past Red Bluff Diversion Dam, which is shown here as the lower end of the red bracket on the slide. And in order to achieve this high level of egg to fry survival, temperature dependent egg mortality, which occurs in this tiny area indicated by the orange bracket, must be very low. In other words, low temperature dependent egg mortality is a necessary condition, though not sufficient on its own, to achieve the high levels of freshwater survival that Chinook salmon depend upon. Next slide, please. Winter run Chinook salmon rarely achieve even average egg to fry survival displayed by this species in managed rivers throughout their range. This graph shows the percentage of egg to fry survival on the vertical axis and shows how that's, occur uh, how that's rolled out in the years from 2005 through 2020. The dotted line indicates the average Sacramento River winter run Chinook salmon egg to fry survival during this period. It's about 23%. That's a lot less than the 38% that is typical of this species throughout its range. But I wanna note that in some years, particularly wet years like 2011 and 2017, these fish are capable of achieving, uh, more than achieving the average egg to fry survival that's typical of their species. Much, though not all, of the excess mortality experienced by winter run occurs because we have managed Sacramento River temperatures to standards that are too warm, and because the Bureau has failed to meet even those inadequate standards in many years. Next slide, please. Can I get the next slide? Thank you. The National Marine Fisheries Service has opined twice recently on the levels of temperature dependent egg mortality, egg to fry survival, and Shasta reservoir storage that are needed to prevent jeopardy. So in tier four years, which are otherwise known as critically dry years, NIMS in its January 19th, 2017 draft RPA amendment found that maximum temperature dependent uh, egg mortality had to be 30% or less. If you exceeded 30% temperature dependent egg mortality, that represented jeopardy conditions. Similarly, in NIMS's July 1, 2019 final jeopardy biological opinion, which was not published or put forward by the Trump administration, but is still the opinion of the agency's biologists, they found that minimum egg to fry survival had to be at least 15%. If egg to fry survival is higher than that, that repre represented jeopardy conditions. And in addition, end of September Shasta storage of 1.9 million acre feet was necessary to avoid jeopardy conditions. And even and those conditions, the tier four conditions could only occur in one of 10 years. Projections of winter, winter run Chinook salmon temperature dependent egg mortality this year uh, are what we've seen published uh, or put out to the public was 89%. Other people have indicated lower, uh, lower numbers today. But regardless, the projections that we've heard so far are much higher than what occur, uh, much higher than the uh, temperature dependent mortality threshold that NIMS identified. Uh, and the 89% is higher than what occurred in the disastrous years of 2014 and 2015. This level of mortality at the egg stage will devastate this year's winter run Chinook salmon population and would represent another step towards extinction of this species. The end of September storage at 1.29 million acre feet, which may even be lower under some of the runs that we've seen now, is less than the National Marine Fisheries Service threshold for jeopardy, and it suggests that fall and spring run Chinook salmon are also in grave danger from water temperatures below Shasta Dam this year. Next slide, please. These are the latest temperature projections that I've seen from the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group. On the horizontal axis, you have dates of the year for this year. And on the vertical axis, you have uh, temperatures in degrees Fahrenheit. Colored lines indicate different locations in the river where temperature is measured. 
The green line is the downstream extent of winter run Chinook salmon eggs at the Clear Creek gauge. You can see that temperatures are projected to exceed the in, already inadequate 56 degree Fahrenheit threshold starting in September. And then temperatures are going to remain high through early November. And those high temperatures will impact all fall run and all spring run that spawn in the Sacramento River in 2021. I should note also that the Bureau's temperature projections are fairly inaccurate uh, going into September, uh, and they almost always in a dry year underestimate actual temperatures. So um, it's likely to be much worse than is depicted in this graph. In my professional judgment, operations that lead to this temperature projection will result in massive mortality for fall and spring run deposited below Shasta Dam this year. Under similar conditions in 2014, fall run experienced egg to fry survival of 2.3% over 97% mortality before they passed Red Bluff. That's simply an unacceptable level of mortality to such a valuable resource. Now I wanna pass it to Greg Reese, who will describe how reservoir, reservoir management leads to these temperature impacts. And then Doug Obiji will explain what the board can do this year to avoid such extreme levels of egg mortality. So if you turn on Greg's sound, please. Hi, uh, thanks. Hi, I'm Greg Reese, uh, staff hydrologist with the Bay Institute. I'm just going to take a couple of minutes and slides to make, quickly make the point that river temperatures can be managed by maintaining adequate, cold, uh, adequate reservoir storage and releasing colder water. The graph shows cold water pool volume on the x-axis and river temperature on the y-axis. As cold pool increases, as you go to the right, river temperature decreases. You maintain adequate reservoir storage by reducing and delaying reservoir releases. And you release colder water with careful operation of the temperature control device, which was designed to make power plant bypasses less necessary. But in a year like this, use of the bypasses may be probably likely necessary. The, the low level bypasses. Uh, next slide, please. Can you hear me? Oh, thanks. Um, high levels of reservoir release are not necessary to maintain adequate temperatures for Chinook salmon incubation. Daniels and Danner, and I'm not gonna read the whole quote, but they uh, found that the primary controlling factor is dam discharge temperature in the upstream reach. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have time to walk you through this graph in detail. I'm happy to do that uh, with questions later. Uh, but if you look at it later, you'll see it shows compliance point temperatures can be met with colder or lower releases. This will contribute to cold enough temperatures in the fall and retain more water behind Shasta if next year is dry. That concludes my portion of the presentation and please make Doug Obiji the speaker. Thank you, uh, Vice Chair and members of the board and staff. I am Doug Obiji with the Natural Resources Defense Council. If you could please move to the next slide. Thank you. So we're here today because Water Rights Order 90-5 requires reclamation to operate to achieve 56 degrees at Red Bluff every day on when temperatures would be harmful to the fishery unless there are factors beyond reclamation's reasonable control that prevent them from meeting that water temperature standard. And I think there's three key points here that I wanna emphasize. The first is that Order 90-5 is not simply about the Endangered Species Act. And it's not simply limited to endangered species, but it includes the quote unquote fishery. That means protections for fall run, spring run, and other species have to be considered by the board. It also means that the jeopardy standard under the ESA, the preventing extinction is not necessarily what the board's obligations are. The board needs to do better than simply avoiding extinction particularly given the water quality control plan salmon doubling objective. This is a broader, higher standard. And what reclamation is focused on with their management of the tier system solely considers endangered species and it does not consider reductions in contract allocations. And that's the real second point is that factors within reclamation's reasonable control includes water deliveries by the Bureau to their settlement and exchange contractors and all their contractors. That's not just our view, that's actually the view of the Water Board in their letter to Reclamation dated last year. 
And it's really been the position of the board for more than a decade. So that means the third point is that in evaluating whether to approve a temperature management plan that does not achieve 56 degrees compliance at Red Bluff, the board has to consider reducing settlement contract deliveries and other CVP deliveries. And it has to consider the impacts, not just to winter run, but also to fall run. Next slide, please. So when we talk about factors within reclamation's reasonable control, one of the big points to make here is this, this table from reclamation showing that they're on track to allocate 3.8 million acre feet of water this year with you know, the settlement contractors getting 75% or 1.5 million acre feet of that allocation. That is a lot of water. Next slide. And in many dry years, the deliveries to the Sacramento River settlement contractors actually exceed what they would have access to under their water rights because their water rights do not include water storage, nor do they have a right to divert water that has been stored. And unfortunately, reservoir releases have already ramped up dramatically in order to meet Sacramento River contract demands. What we've seen is that um, significant increases in releases just in the last month um, in order to meet those demands. That's not water that's getting to the Delta. Um, it's not available for exports and it is draining the cold water pool. Next slide. The reason why I raised this issue about dramatically increasing reservoir releases right now is because we've been in this, in this play before. And unfortunately, as Ms. Lincoln knows, the end of the play is very, very bad. Back in 2014 and 2015, the board actually analyzed operations, and this is a table from that, looking at how you could manage water, how you could reduce diversions and releases from the reservoir to improve temperature management. And we saw, based on that analysis in 2015, that you could actually improve the size of the cold water pool, improve carryover storage, and reduce mortality by reducing releases, particularly early in the year. Unfortunately, the board didn't require those operations in 2015. And ultimately, uh, we ended up, California ended up killing the vast majority of the salmon, of the endangered salmon that year. And the quote on the right is uh, from NIMPS from 2019, and I think it's from their Jeopardy biop. But they've made the same point over and over again. And that is that the, the volume of releases in April and May, as well as June and July, really affect the stability of the cold water pool. Next slide, please. So even though we know that these excessive releases that are more than what's necessary for temperature control are depleting the pool, we're already doing that even before the board considers the temperature management. plan. And so we're losing the ability to actually have better outcomes because we're not taking action soon enough in the year. The table here shows the NIMS's estimate of the maximum reservoir releases that should be allowed in a critically dry year based on their January 2017 amendment to the biological opinion. And you can see based on the, the last forecast of operations um, that I've seen, which is from last month, we're planning to have two to 3,000 or more CFS of water released every day from Keswick than what would have been permitted under the 2017 RPA amendment which is really what's necessary for temperature control. And it really is very consistent with the analysis that's, that has been done by NIMS, which shows that reduced reservoir releases do improve our ability to maintain temperature control. Unfortunately, uh, as we all know, the Trump administration rejected this scientifically based amendment to the biological opinion. And instead in 2019, they uh, adopted the blatantly unlawful biological opinion that, that our coalition and the state of California all agree are unlawful and in, are in court to overturn. But unfortunately, these reservoir releases exceed what's necessary for temperature and they're driven by contract deliveries. These are measures that are within reclamation's control under the board's authority, board's authority but in reclamation's view, these are non-discretionary and they are not considering reductions to these allocations when they prepare the temperature management plan. Next slide, please. So this is a graph of the temperature control device from 2015, and it shows how the reservoir stratified that year. And on the left-hand side, you can see that the, the hot water in red um, and the cold water in blue is 
unavailable to release through the upper gates entirely, the same situation that we're in because the elevation is too low. And they're not releasing from the middle gates at this time because the water is too hot at this time in 2015. And instead they're using the pressure release relief gates, which are the lowest gates through the temperature control device, and then the side gate. And unfortunately the side gate really is, as I think one of the prior speakers mentioned, kind of the gate of last resort. And once we trigger that gate, we start to lose temperature control. And that is because the gate is so tall in elevation that it accesses not just the cold water at the bottom, but also the warm water at the top of that large black square with the big yellow, big white arrow. In contrast, we still have the river outlets that predate the temperature control device. And those can be used not just for releasing warmer water early in the year, but also for releasing very cold water later in the year. Now, my understanding is that that's not being considered because of concerns over uh, energy and electricity availability this summer. And it shows that there are trade-offs and no one is calling, wants to see uh, measures that result in more blackouts. But I think it, it also highlights that our, our tools are constrained and certainly that hydropower is not, particularly from large scale dams like this, is not a green and clean energy source, but it really is contributing to the demise of California salmon. Next slide, please. So I wanna wrap up here um, and really kind of talk about a couple of things that, that haven't really been mentioned. We are facing a re replay of 2014 and 2015. And while we have better tools for analyzing those impacts, we're continuing along the same course of debating management actions too late in the year and with the Bureau of Reclamation refusing to take action against to reduce contract deliveries for settlement and exchange contractors. This week, we finally received modeling that was done by NIMS and the Bureau of Reclamation that they called the unbounded modeling. So they, that initial modeling they did in March that did not include meeting other regulatory requirements, but was simply evaluating options. There was a wide range of reservoir releases and much wider range of temperature dependent mortality. You know, of those tens of thousands of runs, there were 30 model runs with 10% or less temperature dependent mortality for winter run and almost 3,000, precisely 2,894 model runs with temperature dependent mortality less than or equal to 30%. This modeling, as well as what NIMS has done in the past, clearly demonstrates that we can reduce temperature dependent mortality for winter run to levels that are more consistent with what's in the biological opinion and nearly half of what is on track to happen this year. Moreover, as, as I mentioned pre previously, NIMS is not actually, sorry, reclamation is not looking at further reductions in CVP contract allocations. The operations that have largely been presented as part of the temperature management plan are, are really taking that mostly off the table. And this is not only bad for salmon this year, but it also means that we're gonna have dangerously low levels of cold water storage, of carryover storage at the end of this year. So if next year is dry, we face a repeat of this problem, if not a even worse problem. We can and we have to do better. It's clear that reducing contract allocations can substantially improve water temperatures and protections for salmon, not just for endangered salmon, but also for fall run. And those temperature graphs in the fall are really scary for our fishing friends and for those of us who care about salmon. To the board and to the staff, you have the authority and the moral obligation to require reclamation to do better no other agency is going to do this. And, and frankly, many of them cannot. Board member Dodok asked earlier how reclamation balances these concerns. The honest answer is that they don't. They have executed water contracts that they claim eliminate their discretion to be able to balance those concerns. So they won't take action to require reduced deliveries to the SRS contractors. Moreover, it is not. It is false, as Reclamation asserted today, that the determination of a tier is determined solely by hydrology. It's also deliver, determined by these deliveries to their contractors. We have 3.9, 3.8 million acre feet of water that the CVP is planning to deliver this year. That's not all out of Shasta, but a big part of it is. Mr. Mooney carefully chose his words when he talked about emphasizing that they will take actions within their claimed discretion but the board can and must do more to, 
and, and we can meet a tier three year and we can do better than what has been presented and what will be presented in the temperature man management plan. Ultimately, the approach that reclamation takes in their temperature management plan under the biological opinions is fundamentally inconsistent with this board's obligations under state law, including order 90-5. NIMS also isn't gonna do this job for you. They're hamstrung by a blatantly unlawful biological opinion and their regulatory authority is focused on endangered species, but they are trying to help you. They are trying to give you the tools. And as I explained today, reducing reservoir releases, particularly in these early months, results in lower temperature dependent mortality. The State Water Board failed in 2014 and 2015 in response to the drought. We really hammered fish and wildlife in a way that we haven't recovered from. We have harmful algal blooms in the Delta that are occurring with greater frequency ever since we installed the drought barriers, the salinity barrier, and we waived water quality standards in the Delta. The operations being proposed by Reclamation again really do fail to provide reasonable protection to salmon and we can do better, but it's a fool's errand to believe that someone else is going to do this for us. This comes down to the board. You have the authority, you have the information. It is a tough choice, but I urge you to do more than simply rubber stamp that what comes from reclamation. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, your presentation and for um, providing this um, additional perspective um, and looking at looking at this through a different lens, I guess I would say, and um, opening up the conversation on the other runs as well. So um, with that, I'd like to open it up to questions. Yes, I wanted to just start by seeing if you could help um, me understand the question again about what we could do. I think you explained this, but I wasn't didn't just fully follow um, what the options are to do to protect fall run um, if we are in, in really critical years like this when we're really um, prioritizing temperature for winter run. You want me to take that, Doug? Why don't you start and I can... Okay. Hold up. I mean, it's it's a it's a very good question. The thing to understand here is that um, the needs of the fall run are completely in line with the needs of the winter run. If winter run are not protected, if their temperature needs aren't met, there's no way that you can provide temperature protection for fall run. It's, um, it's not an additive thing to do. You know, you have to do winter run and fall run. You have to accomplish winter run temperature objectives. In or that that would mean that there was cold water left over at the end of their incubation season that would be available to fall run, um, but you can't you can't do the reverse. Yeah, and I would just add it. You know, ultimately this is a, a math problem that the volume of the cold water pool is is a fixed thing, and we can't really negotiate with it. We release water that is water that can't. As we release water from the reservoirs, we have less of a cold water pool. Conversely, as we reduce diversions and releases from the reservoir, we actually have higher storage that uh, increases our ability to maintain temperatures, not just for winter run, but for fall run later into the year. And we saw that in 2014 and 2015, we saw very different results for the fall run. 14 was a disaster. Both years were a disaster for winter run. 14 was a disaster for fall run. 15 was not as bad. So there are choices here and the board's duties fundamentally are not just about the Endangered Species Act and endangered species, but include the fall run. Great, that's helpful. I think, um, I, I may have another question, but I not right the second. So another board member can go if they do. Others, board member Dodik. A dangerous legal question from an engineer. Um, so I think I'm directing this to Mr. Obiji since you mentioned it in your part of the of the presentation. What authority or authorities is, in your opinion, um, something that the board under which the board could direct the bureau to reduce their contract deliveries? So 90-5 says that the Bureau has to 
produce a temperature management plan and the board can reject it. And that would be the authority fundamentally that you'd be relying on because they're presenting a temperature management plan that does not actually protect salmon. And you have an obligation to reject that plan and force them to do something better. And when they consider what they consider to be, when you think about 90-5, they say their position is that deliveries to the Sacramento River settlement contractors are non-discretionary and we can't reduce them. So when we present a temperature management plan, that's off the table and we're just gonna present, and in fact, in the biological opinion, they won't reduce allocations to anyone um, in order to improve temperature management. They will just look at what what's being allocated and then whatever's left over will go to temperature management. But that's not how 90-5 works. 90-5 says they need to provide meet 56 degrees at Red Bluff without, without exception if it's going to harm the fishery. And if they and that these measures, these deliveries are within their reasonable control. So they can't justify not meeting 56 degrees because they are delivering water to the Sacramento River settlement contractors or other contractors. Ultimately, I think 90-5 is not, uh, it is rather inartful at this stage. You know, it assumes that the temperature control device is going to work um, and alleviate these problems, which is plainly not accurate anymore. And it doesn't really account for climate change. But I think you clearly have the authority under that order to require reclamation to do better. And they're, they're contractually obligated not to do better. And you're suggesting that we direct the Bureau to prioritize meeting temperature objectives and other objectives over their contractual deliveries, over their contracts? Yes. When you think about their obligations under the law, their contracts are not somehow above the law. It's not like their contracts are somehow superior to the Endangered Species Act, to the public trust doctrine, or to this board's authority. And indeed, you know, we have case law going back to the 1890s where activities have been curtailed to protect salmon, including a lawsuit against GCID requiring a fish screen from the 1930s. So it's not like senior water rights holders are somehow above the law. Thank you. My, my questions have been asked, so no questions. I'm sorry, no questions? No questions right now, thank you. All right. Um, I have a question and let's see, I'm looking through on my notes here on the um, chart that you have. And I think it was Mr. Rosenfield on pulling up the PowerPoint here. Let's see. Slide 10, uh, maximum temperature dependent mortality. And you reference um, uh, draft biological opinion uh, language. So what is in the biological opinion um, on this issue of egg to fry survival, if anything, that you're aware of? Maybe I can an yeah. answer that one. Um, so in the, you know, you, we, this slide shows what was in the uh, draft amendment to the RPA that was put forward by the, uh, by NIMS at the end of the Obama administration. Um, it also shows the July 1st, 2019 final biological opinion from the region that found jeopardy, which the Trump administration suppressed. In the final 2019 biological opinion issued by the Trump administration, they approved 100% temperature dependent mortality of winter run Chinook salmon in two consecutive years. And it would not be violated that take limit until after a third year of uh, similarly terrible, i.e. zero survival. The, that biological opinion also eliminated carryover storage requirements. It eliminated the requirements that the National Marine Fisheries Service consult with reclamation before issuing uh, initial allocations and that those allocations be subject to 
ensuring meeting temperature control for salmon. And it found that on average, as I recall, um, in these tier four years, you would see 77% temperature dependent mortality. And then one last thing, um, you know, the reclamation and the Bureau, sorry, reclamation and the biological opinion opine that these kinds of tier four conditions would only happen in five, six, 7% of years. But over the last decade, we've already had three of those years. And that's okay. in part because their modeling is not accounting for climate change in a reasonable way. Okay, thank you. Um, so the 77%, that's the base condition that um, was referred to earlier uh, today in NIMS presentation. Uh, I don't know if that's what was, I think that was, uh, you'd have to ask NIMS if that was in their base presentation. I think that was, I think that is actually just a coincidence of what is on average seen in a tier four year and then the operations that they had in their base and what the mortality looked like. But you'd have to ask them to confirm that. Okay, thank you. Um, seeing no further questions, <coughs> excuse me, we'll move on to um, the fourth um, public presentation. Uh, Bill Jennings, Tom Cannon, Chris Schutz, and Mike, Michael Jackson representing the California Sports Fishing Protection Alliance, California Water Impact Network, and Aqua Alliance. Good afternoon. Who will be all of, Mr. Yeah. Shooter? Okay. Uh, good afternoon. I think Mr. Jennings is going to go first. Is he up? He needs to unmute. Uh, okay. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good afternoon, Mr. Jennings. <clears throat> good afternoon. Bill Jennings, California Sports Fishing Protection Alliance. Well, we're here for another drought, another workshop and an abundance of um, ideas and promises on how we'll make conditions better in the future. But the underground reality never seems to change. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Over the last century, uh, droughts in the Sacramento Valley have occurred more than 40% of the time. Since 2000, below normal to critical water years have occurred over 71% of the time. It's likely to be worse in the future we can't be surprised by drought. Yet the state and federal projects operate as if there's no tomorrow. They deliver as much water as possible, leaving little carryover storage to guard against a subsequent dry year. A consistent pattern over five decades. Next slide, please. <clears throat> I could have included this 1976-77 or the 1988-92 droughts. It's the same pattern, end of storage, uh, serially drops until disaster intrudes. The pattern persists because, please, next slide. Under this approach, Sacramento Valley agriculture has done reasonably well. Between 2000 and 2019, annual reports by county ag commissioners show that farm production increased over 71%. Uh, actually, farm production frequently increases during early drought years. <clears throat> and annual farm em employment increased 16.6%, according to the EDD. Next slide, please. However, fish suffer. We're on the precipice of sending species into extinction, and we routinely relax, relax standards during uh, protecting fish during drought. Between 1970 and 74 and 2015 and 19, <clears throat> Sacramento River mainstream uh, Chinook salmon escapement for winter, spring, and fall run declined 91, 99.9, .9, and 79.7 percent, respectively. Between 1967, 71, and 2016-20, <clears throat> fall midwater trawl abundance indices for striped bass, delta smelt, long fin, uh, split tail, and thread fin uh, declined 98.1, 99.8, 99.8, 99.3, and 94.3 respectively. <clears throat> Actually, and there's been a, the, the down, downward trend has continued since 2000. Uh, between 2002 and 20, uh, average egg to fry survival has been 23%. In critical years, it's been 7%. Next slide, please. Ferry to meet downstream temperature objectives has compressed spawning. Since 1969, the percentages Chinook salmon all runs below Red Bluff declined from 36.5 to 9.3%. Uh, 
winter and spring runs used to spawn below Bread Bluff, and we ought not to be putting all of our eggs into a 10 mile reach below Keswick. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Water right order 9005 enforces the basin plan and requirements of the California Constitution, uh, the Water Code, Reasonable Use, and Public Trust Doctrine. The Bureau must meet 56 degrees Fahrenheit at Red Bluff subject to controllable factors. 56 at Red Bluff ensures lower temperatures upstream. Upstream compliance points are only allowed when caused by uncontrollable factors. Water delivery is a controllable factor. Water necessary to protect cold water is simply not available for delivery. <clears throat> Excuse me. For those old enough to remember, everyone in the old Bonders and Hearing Room in 1990 understood the Basin Plan's controllable factors policy and its implications. The Bureau embraced 9005 because it allowed them to escape a regional board, an enforceable regional board, waste discharge requirement with receiving water limitations, 56 from Shasta to Red Bluff, and a compliance schedule. The board must enforce 9005 by ensuring there's sufficient cold water to meet temperature objectives before there are any commitments to specific water deliveries. Next slide, please. <clears throat> the Bureau supplies 100% of contracted water settlement contractors, except in critical years, when it supplies 75%, well, except in 2018 or 2008, excuse me, uh, when it supplied full, full contract. The 2019 federal biological opinion eliminated previous end of storage requirements and limits on temperature dependent mortality during tier four years. After deliveries are announced, the Bureau and the Sacramento River Temperature Task Group then triages what little water remains into a temperature management plan uh, that they expect the board to approve. <clears throat> At no point does anyone consider how a reduction in deliveries to, sett to settlement contractors would better protect fish. We cannot continue to treat deliveries as a constant and fish protection as a variable. And senior water rights are not senior to the public trust. The board is not bound by bureau contracts or biological opinions. It is bound by its constitutional basin plan, water rights, and public trust responsibilities. Next slide, please. <clears throat> With respect to water transfers, the Sacramento contractors have proposed to transfer thousands of acre feet of water this year. Uh, the actual amount I heard for the first time today, but but we'll see, there are some other transfers. Uh, the Bureau has proposed a, a forbearance agreement to delay transfers until later in the year. Uh, we note that a similar forbearance agreement process was tried in 2015 and egg to fry survival was 3% and 85% of the winter run were killed below Shasta. Water transfers will also deprive Shasta of critically needed carryover storage in case drought continues. <clears throat> As to suggestion to allow higher early season temperatures, I remind everyone that early May is the onset of winter run spawning and winter run are already in the river below Keswick. Water necessary to comply with temperature objectives is not available for delivery and contractors should not be permitted to profit from the sale of unneeded water in a drought. Water they've already acknowledged, they don't need to apply to, on their own lands. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, while the Bureau bluntly rejected board staff's request, repeated request, to evaluate water delivery alternatives, we do expect the board to honor our settlement agreement to have staff evaluate whether water delivery alternatives may achieve uh, temperature compliance at the temperature compliance points. And we expect those evaluations to be available concurrently with the Bureau's draft temperature management plan. We'll be submitting extensive comments on the draft uh, management plan. And we expect that any TMP approval 
we're ensured that there's sufficient cold water to protect fish and to protect carryover storage. Uh, thank you for your patience. Uh, next slide. Uh, Tom Cannon will now take over, followed by Chris Schutz and Mike Jackson. Tom? I'm here. I activated my mute. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, good. <laughs> Sorry about that. Good afternoon. Uh, I am Tom Cannon with the CSPA and I'm coming last. So I hope to avoid duplication, make it minimal as possible. Uh, my presentation is on measures we can take in 2021 to protect the fish. And I'll start with the first slide, please. <clears throat> I'll just summarize, uh, we're similar to 2014 and 15, and uh, that's our starting point. And our cold water pool is roughly the same as 2014, 2015. So we have a good starting point in which to try to protect fish, which did not happen in 2014 and 15. Next slide, please. The first option is minimize shasta deliveries. If you look at the bottom line on this chart, it's a complicated chart, but the bottom line shows 2015. We certainly shouldn't go above that. Uh, the maximum uh, release from Keswick was 7,000. Uh, and that should be our goal or starting point this year and hopefully make it better. The NIMPS graph uh, Doug just showed in the last uh, slide period. Uh, was 6,000, you know, maybe it should be 6,000. I'm not going to argue about that, but I, I don't think we should go above the 7,000 from 2015. Next slide, please. Uh, we can take advantage of the spring Trinity diversions. They're cold. Uh, we, we can maximize those coming over and that'll just save one for one cold water pool uh, from Shasta. Uh, you can see on the, the chart that uh, Trinity diversion water is still down around 50 degrees and that's plenty cold. The more we take of it, the less we have to use of the Shasta water, cold water pool water. Excuse me, I think you're a slide behind. There Sorry. You. I'm a slide behind. You're good now, Tom. Oh, okay. Sorry. Thank you, Chris. So we have the table there and uh, Spring Creek Powerhouse is the third column, and you can see it's cold, and any amount of water we can use from that powerhouse into Keswick will save cold water pool in Shasta, and we should try to maximize that, and uh, at least to the extent it won't, won't hurt the Trinity River, and that's not my call to balance it, but the more we can take from the Trinity and from Lewiston, the better. Uh, and there's also the option you can, uh, you can run it down Clear Creek to some extent as well and save cold water pool. The second option here is to use the, uh, the upper TCD gates. In this case, are the, the, middle, the middle gates. Uh, that we're doing that well and it seems to be okay. The third option is to bypass the powerhouse and use the river outlets and uh, that seems to be going okay, but it, we're running out of that capacity as well because the water temperatures coming out of the dam through the, the river outlets is 70 some degrees already. It does mix downstream with colder water in Keswick. Uh, all three of those options are virtually exhausted now, and, uh, but they have provided some benefits. And that last one was the powerhouse bypass was undertaken in 2015 as well. Uh, Sorry, I just want to make sure I'm following. Is the are you um, on the next slide? I'm on uh, number two. Take advantage. Okay, great. I'm just going over it quickly. 
No, no, that's great. I'm trying to duplicate, and uh, I'm just listing the options. And uh, the data in the table are pretty complicated, and they only go through uh, April 12th. Uh, and things have happened since then as well, we talked about earlier. Uh, the benefits so far in April have been dampened by the doubling of storage releases from around uh, 3,500 to 6,500 in the month of April. And that's lost about 50,000 acre feet at cold water pool uh, just because of the increase in storage releases in April. On to the next slide, it's a similar table. It's for the summer. And here are kind of the opposite recommendation. Don't bring any Spring Creek hot water over because it takes a lot of cold water, cool water to ameliorate the effect of the warm Spring Creek water. So that's another option. Uh, yeah, some of that could go down Clear Creek without much impact. It's not a lot, a lot of capacity, but that's another option. But cutting the Spring Creek warm water input to Keswick will help. Next slide. And my last option really is modify hydropower peaking. It's a very complicated process. You know, there's five pen stocks and uh, I've looked at it for many years. And here's just one example of how the temperature is affected by how you operate the hydropower peaking. There are many other examples, this is just one. And certainly hydropower peaking can be adjusted to save cold water pool. That's all I can say about that really. And the next slide. The last thing we need to consider is avoiding the redirected impacts. Uh, and what I mean by that is the winter and spring when adults in May are still coming up in May and June and it's 200 miles of river. And, and if it's hot, like it's already getting, that's a very big hardship on those adults. Second thing is from July through September, the fall run Chinook salmon are coming up through the Sacramento River, 200 miles. And we gotta reconsider uh, the impacts the hot water and the river will have on those. Uh, spring run uh, sturgeon are also in the river spawning and, and larval rearing in the spring. Uh, we, we should consider them. They're, they're impacted as well, that's a long story as well. Uh, the spring season salmon and smolt immigration, mainly fall run, uh, is also going on. Uh, there's the Battle Creek hatchery fish are one of the considerations. Uh, they just won't make it through the hot river. Even if you do truck them, what do you do with a wild fish? There's millions of wild smolts going down the river. You gotta watch out for them as well. And this chart is longfin smelt. They're sitting in the West Delta and, and Susan Bay and a TUCP like we had in 14 and 15 would massacre them. It's a tough, tough call there. Finally, in closing, uh, we recommend focusing on an open daily management and decision process. You just can't rely on the models. You have to just manage the system daily, watching out for the weather and heat waves and things like that. Uh, it's just a tough management program that's necessary. Uh, given the state of the winter run population, the goal should be keeping the eggs alive and improving population viability and acting conservatively, conservatively uh, to keep the populations healthy. Right now they're on the brink of extinction and the, their jeopardy uh, opinion is likely to come from these operations. Uh, with that, I'll go back to Chris. Thanks very much. I don't have a PowerPoint for you all. Um, you can just leave up that slide if you like. Um, I'm Chris Schutz with the California Sport Fishing Protection Alliance to sum up some of our um, thoughts. As we stated, CSPA and California Water Impact Network in our comment letter, and as we've talked about again today, the board has the authority and the responsibility to set sideboards on the Bureau of Reclamation's Shasta operations in 2021. These sideboards must include limits on the water made available to Sacramento River settlement contractors for delivery and transfers. In 2020, 
and early 2021, Reclamation and DWR have run their reservoir storage as low as it was in 2015. It's the result of the Trump administration's buyouts, the disastrous re renegotiation of the Coordinated Operations Agreement, and the reckless federal policy of maximizing delivery and other choices. Risky decisions have consequences. Reclamation and its collaborators know how to operate the CBP system. What they don't do well is set limits and police themselves. Voluntary compliance has not protected fish. That needs to be your job. If reclamation declines to cooperate in providing information regarding reduced water deliveries to Sacramento River settlement contractors, the board will need to use its own resources to do the best job it can. Will the settlement contractors' voluntary reductions, as we heard about today, protect fish? We don't think so, but that's not modeled, or at least not modeled with any output that's been made public. It's not collaborative to just say no to that modeling. Where, uh, to enable the board to actually evaluate the benefits of reduced settlement contractor deliveries. That's the modeling that CSPA asked for and that reclamation firmly declined to do in September. Your authorities under the public trust and reasonable use doctrines require you to act. You must establish constraints on water deliveries and transfers and enforce them. You must be active in preserving Shasta cold water pool in 2021 and for future years and avoid redirected impacts. Delay is not an option for success. It would be a down payment on a bad decision. What goes in the game of bridge goes for the fish under the bridge. Hesitation is death. You must act quickly. Please make 2021 the success that 2015 and 2014 were not. Thank you. I believe Mr. Jackson has a few comments. Mr. Jackson. Can you hear me? There we go. Good afternoon. Thanks. Uh, my part of this presentation was to uh, listen closely to everybody else's presentation since we hadn't heard them before. Um, and give you just sort of what I will be looking for between now and the final document. Um, much of it has been covered. Um, um, from my point of view, the law is very clear. The reclamation law, as it was set up, gives the state power over reclamation in terms of water rights and water distribution. Uh, maybe you'd like it to be another way, but uh, in, in their infinite wisdom, the Congress of the United States, uh, shortly before the year uh, uh, 1900, uh, made the decision that all of the states in the West would have priority and authority over bureau projects. So that is, um, in, any indication otherwise is simply a long set of lawsuits that lead to the same place. Um, that was exactly, uh, again, tried uh, when there was uh, uh, a federal court case over whether Friant had to obey 5937, and it did. Um, the the situation is the same as Shasta. You're required to keep fish in good conditions under state law below dams. 
There is no place in California where that law is more important than right now. So it is a public trust violation not to take care of all of the species, not just the listed species below the dam. Practically, we've worked ourselves into a position where we can't really do a uh, ecosystem wide examination yet because most of these species are trapped in my hometown. If you've ever lived in Reading, <laughs> you know that um, trying to run an outdoor hatchery in 117 degree temperatures is really difficult. And so this cold water pool is absolutely critical at all stages of life. Um, so what we will be looking for is, in the presentation today, there are no details. In the presentation today, there is very little substance. In the, presen uh, in the presentation today, there are no answers. So there are four things which I, I, I think are the most important. The first is there does have to be an examination of reduced deliveries to the settlement contractors. Their, their, um, their contract is no, um, no, doesn't bind you at all. And um, I, I get a little nervous uh, and member Dodek can probably, uh, probably knows how long I've been nervous. Uh, when I first heard it in 1985, uh, and I've heard it every time you've met since, the idea that you can't examine reduced deliveries um, to the Sacramento River contractors is a non-starter. The, the contract that the government, the federal government signed, doesn't take away your right to regulate. So when you all hear the words collaboration, I hear the words regulatory capture. So um, I'll try to I'll, I'll, I'll try to phrase things within within science. And, and reason, but the idea that we're all gonna get in a room and kumbaya ourselves into some sort of way that we don't have to enforce the law is a non-starter for us. And it's simply gonna to lead to litigation. Uh, the second thing that I think is um, quite important is to realize again, and you've heard it, that there's less cold water in Shasta but also in Folsom and Oroville and everywhere else in California except New Maloney's um, than there was in, 20, in, in 2015. And what I did here today was the egg mortality, um, egg to fry of 3% for the year 2015. Now you didn't do this, <laughs> the boards in front of you did this but it's going to be the Newsom administration's responsibility if, if, if these things go extinct. I didn't hear any mention of sturgeon, spring run, um, any of the other uh, fish that are gonna be affected by this proposal that was um, submitted today, I guess, um, by the Bureau. I, I, I'm, I'm going to be looking for how you're going to deal with the Trinity River. Um, it supplies cold water early and hot water late. Both Keswick at the receiving end of the Trinity input um, and Lewiston at the diversion point out of the Trinity are are, are unnatural uh, dams that are not very big, but are very, very good at raising water temperature. Now, I, I used to go 
because of the hot temperatures in Reading, uh, like everybody else, I went to Whiskey Town Lake at night because it was close and it was fun and it was um, uh, pretty warm water. Well, they take the water out of Whiskey Town by uh, a, a really pretty system. They scrape it off the top with, with a glory hole, kind of like Berryessa. Um, and they move that water. That water can enter the Sacramento River either in the area where we're trying to grow fish in Redding, or you can send it down Clear Creek because that way it enters the Sacramento River at the time it's hot, supplies the molecules of water, but doesn't supply the increased temperature for the cold water pool coming out of Shasta. So I'm going to want to see um, a real analysis of that. And then the fourth is uh, a part that I don't even understand from the presentation. There was no examination of these transfers, where they're going to come from. Uh, part of the part of the disagreement about transfers is they can be good and they can be very very bad. And since there were about three hundred and fifty thousand acre feet of transfers that were proposed at one point to the state board for an examination and then suddenly withdrawn. And the Bureau is gonna be dealing with those transfers. So I'm gonna be looking for the Bureau's ecosystem plan for the connectivity of the surface water and groundwater in the Sacramento Valley. Since most of the economic, um, uh, the largest of the economic farming drivers is on the east side of the Sacramento Valley. The, um, the people there have been taking water out of the ground, putting it on their own land for almonds and walnuts, and, uh, and it's always recovered. But when we start <laughs> letting the rice farmers along the river, suck water out of the river because they're connected and call it <clears throat> groundwater and then move it. You're having all of the problems that, uh, that, that I think member Firestone you're so familiar with in terms of uh, deeper pumps, <coughs> deeper pumps uh, taking water from groundwater dependent farmers from uh, the, the same groups of people that have lost water in the San Joaquin. So those four things are gonna be what I'm looking for. Anyway, thank you very much for the opportunity, but I don't think this deal is cooked yet. So I'm hoping that you can um, uh, put aside this idea that if you don't go along to get along, it is regulatory capture because it is your responsibility. Anyway, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Jackson, and thank you all. Um, we will move on to any questions, and um, I'll just say that I'm going to kind of some <coughs> questions, but I'm going to kind of constrain this. <coughs> um, I, I'd like to move along so we can start up the public uh, comment section, but. Um, uh, if anyone has any pressing questions, please go ahead. Anyone? Okay. Uh, we, because we still do have one more um, uh, panel, and that is public presentation from the Sacramento Water Forum. Uh, Jessica Law. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, board members. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Thanks. I'd also like to invite my colleagues, uh, Jeffrey Weaver from HDR and Chris Hammersmark from CBEC uh, Eco Engineering to join me, if possible. Um, 
Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you this afternoon. It's been a long day, but there's been a lot of really good discussion. Uh, we are here to present on behalf of the Water Forum, uh, which, is, which represents a diverse group of business and agricultural leaders, citizen groups, environmentalists, water purveyors, and local governments in this region. We have been working together over the past 20 years to design and implement science-based solutions that balance water use and river management decisions. We want to reiterate many of the messages that you've heard today, uh, mainly that we must work towards balancing a complex system and understand that the whole of the system is greater than the sum of its parts. And it cannot be underscored enough, temperature management is absolutely critical to maintain the health of the system. Uh, next slide. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about current conditions and what we're seeing in the Lower American River. So conditions on the 23 mile stretch of the Lower American River are dictated by releases from Folsom Dam. Folsom Reservoir, as you know, is relatively small and shallow compared to the other reservoirs on the system. Unlike other CBP reservoirs, it also provides urban water for the surrounding communities, which are dependent on lake levels staying above 110,000 acre feet. This year is especially challenging for Folsom and the Lower American River as it is in the rest of the state. Um, however, the data are indicating that the reservoir and the river are likely going to be experiencing conditions this year that will be worse than 2014 and 2015. Earlier in the year, we were cautiously optimistic that higher than average snowpack levels in the upper watershed would provide a buffer for Folsom. However, inflow levels are lower than expected or predicted and releases have been above the minimum release requirements dictated in the 2019 biops to meet Delta outflow requirements. The Water Forum and Bureau of Reclamation have been working shoulder to shoulder uh, to ensure that there's accurate information and a thorough understanding of the conditions and potential impacts for this year. Uh, this includes up to weekly meetings with stakeholders and agencies to understand current and projected conditions in the river. So we are all in agreement that this is a difficult year and we're working closely to consider options on how to maintain adequate end of year storage and reduce impacts to the fisheries. And we are going to be working together to develop a temperature management plan. But even with this proactive approach, we are still facing a situation that will resort, result in poor conditions in the river throughout the summer and limited cold water pool in the fall. So we just have a few quick slides that we wanted to share um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Jeffrey and to Chris in order to provide some additional context and information about current conditions compared to 2014 and 2015. And then after that, we're happy to answer any questions. Next slide and I'll turn it over to Jeff. Yeah, hi, thank you everybody for uh, letting us, give us a chance to talk to you today. So. And I just have a, just a quote, couple of a few quick slides here just to show where conditions are for this year relative to 2014 and 2015. And as has been mentioned in some previous presentations, that, that current storage is is quite low in Folsom Reservoir. Um, and and, and this, this figure is actually a few days old. Uh, storage has continued to drop since this is this this figure. Um, but you can see where we are currently relative to both 2014 and 2015. The 2014 is the blue line and 2015 is the red line. Sorry that the, the legend got cut off on this one. Um, several several hundreds of thousand acre feet lower though, I guess is the, is the critical point on this slide. Can we go to the next one, please? So this is showing the daily inflow to Folsom Reservoir from CDEC and Again, the, the blue trace is the uh, 2014 and the red trace is 2015. And so you can see similarly here that the inflows to date are, are, are well, in, current inflows are, are lower than we were seeing in 2014. They're still above where we had in 2015. But again, uh, inflows are dropping off. The snow is almost all melted. We probably have a, a few more weeks left of snow and then it's likely gone. And, uh, and inflows then will drop to um, well, very low levels. I'm not going to hypothesize exactly what they, where they'll end up. Uh, next slide, please. And these are the current releases. So the black line is the uh, the releases from Lake Natoma. Um, again, blue line is twenty is 2014. The red line is 2015. Uh, 
right now releases are substantially above where they were in those uh, other two years. This is largely uh, to meet, at least by our, our understanding, to meet Delta requirements, um, basically showing that, that Folsom is carrying a much heavier load for, than it was in those other two years. And um, forecasted operations show lower releases than 2014 and 2015 in the, in the summer. But um, right now we're in a situation where we're releasing above the inflows and storage is dropping. Uh, next slide, please. This is where we are on temperatures right now. And, and Chris will talk a little bit more about where temperatures are expected to be. Um, but you can see where we are again, the black line is this year, 2014 blue and 2015 is in red. And you can see that in spite, uh, well, primarily due to our lower storage, but in spite of our higher flows, temperatures coming out of Lake Natoma are higher than they, they were in 2014 or 2015. Um, and again, right now, I think I uh, looked at yesterday's are uh, approaching 59 degrees uh, at uh, coming out of Nimbus Dam. So uh, we're in, in temperatures are in um, higher than uh, historic, than, higher than we've seen historically for this time of year. Uh, I think next slide I think is for Mr. Hammersmark. That's the last slide. Oh, last one, okay, I'm sorry. But Chris, if you wanted to go ahead and add comment on temperature. So Chris is participating by phone and we've invited him to unmute. Okay. There we go. All right, thank you for your patience. Um, I'm, I'm flying blind today, so I apologize. Uh, I don't have a slide prepared for this, but I would just wanted to review real quickly the, the temperature modeling that Reclamation has prepared for the Lower American River. Um, not surprisingly, it is as grim or grimmer than what we've heard um, earlier today, so I won't go into too much detail. Aside from the fact that they, they do not anticipate being able to meet a 72 degree temperature target at Watt Avenue, which is the, the compliance point. Um, 72 degrees is the highest temperature schedule out of 78 schedules that um, Reclamation tries to, uh, tries to manage to. So not meeting 72 degrees, in fact, 73 degrees and above in some weeks, uh, I'll, remind, I'll remind everybody that say an upper tolerable limit for steelhead would be 68 degrees. So we're, through the summer, we're, we're well above what would be considered tolerable for steelhead. Moving, moving up to Nimbus, um, the, the upstream limit of anadromy, temperatures are, are predicted to be in excess of 70 degrees as well. Looking into the fall, particularly in October, at least at this point, projections are for temperatures between 61 to 66 degrees, which based off of the discussions earlier um, is, is substantially above the 56 degrees that, that, that we believe um, is necessary to support spawning. And so um, it's looking very grim on the American for both steelhead and fall run. Back to you, Jessica. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, board members, for the opportunity to present today and your willingness to consider how conditions on the American are a part of the whole. Uh, and really, actions on the Sacramento River have potential consequences on the American. Our fear overall is that the American River and Folsom Reservoir will be further relied upon to provide water supply for the Delta, which would stretch a limited supply to a potentially extreme situation. So we encourage the board to keep focused on temperatures and balancing conditions in this complex and interconnected system. We're happy to take questions. Thank you both. That was very helpful and uh, to remind us of the complexity of the system and then also um, competing demands and trade-offs. Um, again, any pressing questions? I, I, I don't want to prevent uh, my fellow colleagues from asking questions, but just um, trying to move along if possible. Okay. All right. With that, um, we will now move into public comment. And again, want to remind everybody that we're going to limit comments to three minutes. Um, of course, if there's a need to go beyond, 
uh, will consider that um, on an individual basis. And if you're able to just chime in and say you agree with somebody who went before you or one of the panelists, we would welcome that as well. So that we, we just really want to give everyone that's in line the opportunity. And Mr. Lawfer, I've pulled it up, but it's kind of hard to sort through, um, you know, who, who's who's in line. So if you wouldn't mind um, helping me with the queue. We'd be happy to do that. And for individuals who have not, because we do have a number of speakers, just for everyone's awareness, we have approximately uh, 36 speakers still in the queue today. Um, but also for people who haven't routinely participated in one of our Zoom meetings, if you put your uh, Zoom platform into either the, the tile view or do whatever you need to do by scrolling the uh, wheel up top, You'll be able to see the scroll of upcoming speakers. So if you could be prepared to go live as soon as we unmute you. And so everybody knows not all 36 speakers will appear on that scroll the whole time. It becomes a little bit unmanageable. So we only keep about the next six to 10 speakers up there. When you see your name pop up, know that you'll probably be coming up within the next 10 minutes or so. And with that in mind, our first speaker is Mr. Tom Stokely. Give us a minute, we'll get you unmuted. And you should be good to go. Thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes. Great. Uh, members of the board and staff, my name is Tom Stokely. I'm with uh, Save California Salmon. And uh, I'm here to talk to you about the Trinity River. Um, Save California Salmon is concerned about survival of salmon in the Sacramento, Trinity, and Klamath rivers. And we encourage you to only approve a temperature management plan that ensures adequate cold water supplies for protection of fish in all these rivers. Since all other parties are commenting on Sacramento River protections, I will focus my comments on the Trinity and lower Klamath rivers. The Trinity is the largest natural tributary of the Klamath River, but it's also a, an artificial tributary of Clear Creek and the Sacramento River. Uh, the Trinity River is scheduled to deliver about 500,000 acre feet of water uh, to the uh, Sacramento River this year via Lewiston Reservoir, Whiskey Town, and Keswick Reservoirs. Uh, this is a substantial block of water, especially during drought. Uh, Trinity Lake is slightly over half full, at a little less than 1.3 million acre feet, and is projected to go below 600,000 acre feet before the end of the calendar year, which is less than 25% of storage capacity. Uh, giving my age a little bit here, I did participate in the 1990 proceeding uh, that resulted in Water Right Order 90-5, so I have a long history with this issue. Uh, as stated by staff at the beginning of the uh, workshop, uh, Water Right Order 95 contains protections for the Trinity River. They are found on pages 61 and 62, and I'm just gonna uh, paraphrase part of it and that is that uh, permittee being the Bureau shall not operate its Trinity River Division for water temperature control on the Sacramento River in such a manner as to adversely affect sp salmonid spawning and egg incubation in the Trinity River by exceeding average daily water temperatures of 56 degrees at the Douglas City Bridge between September 15th and October 1st, or at the confluence of the North Fork Trinity River between October 1st and December 31st due to factors which are A, controllable by permittee and B, are a result of modification of Trinity River operations for temperature control on the Sacramento River. So in other words, whatever you do with this plan for the Sacramento River temperature control, uh, it cannot harm the Trinity River as defined by, defined by 56 degrees at specific uh, locations and times. Uh, the transfer of Trinity water is problematic as Tom Cannon explained, and uh, Trinity River water can heat significantly in Lewiston and, and Trinity reservoirs. Uh, the heating of Trinity water in Lewiston can occur when there's inadequate turnover due to lower exports of water to the Sacramento River. The Trinity River is in an unfortunate situation of needing a certain amount of water uh, exported in summer in order to keep Lewiston reservoir flushed out and cold. Uh, conversely, the export of water Trinity water to the Sacramento River during the hotter months uh, can significantly heat the Sacramento River due to heating in Whiskey Town. I would uh, disagree with Mr. Uh, Cannon about moving the Trinity River water over early 
for reasons I don't have time to explain, I believe that would violate the do no harm clause in 9005. However, I do agree with him that moving the water, uh, moving less Trinity water in the hotter parts of the summer uh, would help uh, with temperatures in the Sacramento River. I think that when you do your modeling, you really ought to look at uh, finding a way to balance uh, diversions from the Trinity to keep the Trinity cold, uh, but also to minimize heating impacts uh, to the Sacramento River. Uh, it looks like I'm out of time, but I will say that also there do need to be uh, temperature bypasses at Trinity Dam to release cold water from the bottom of the dam when the power plant sucks in warm water. I haven't heard a discussion of that today. And also um, there needs to be water available to release from the Lower Klamath River pursuant to the Bureau of Reclamation's uh, 2017 Lower Klamath Record of Decision, uh, which calls for additional Trinity releases uh, in late summer and fall to re uh, prevent a repeat of the uh, 2002 uh, historic magic uh, Lower Klamath fill in which uh, 65,000 adult salmon were killed. So I urge you to protect uh, the Trinity and the Klamath Rivers in whatever plan uh, that you approve. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stokely. And so our next speaker is Ms. Ms. Chichizola. Hi, thank yeah. you. Um, my name is Regina Chichizola. Um, hopefully you can hear me. Yes. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm here today to um, do um, stand, uh, make sure that the temperature management plan that's put forward by the Bureau is rejected unless it does protect salmon. Um, we cannot let up to 90% of the salmon die this year or 89% of the winter run. Um, I also urge you to protect the spring run and fall salmon as um, was brought up before by the commercial fishermen. Um, and also to make sure that the Trinity River is protected because as Tom mentioned that um, carryover storage and water is needed in the Trinity River in order to stop adult Klamath fish kills. Um, and the Trinity River transport is not beneficial to Sacramento River salmon anyway. Um, with the, those things said, which were repeating of what other people said, um, what I would, the other thing I would like to bring up is the need to not only protect the public trust for the people of California, but also to think about the importance of uh, salmon as far as being a tribal trust species um, and the importance of um, tribal water rights and native people's diets as part of this process. Um, there used to be plentiful runs of salmon throughout California and enough runs throughout the year of salmon sturgeon and eels that there was a lot of food sources for native people and other people in California. And we don't have that anymore. And a lot of it's because of mismanagement by the Bureau of Reclamation in the state. And um, based on the fact that there are too many dams in the system and too many straws. And finding out that almonds are actually, more almonds are being planted, despite the fact that we lost the majority of our salmon runs three years running during the last drought. And despite the fact that we, the Klamath zone is completely closed down this year and the, um, sat, and the zones below that are severely limited is ridiculous. This board has action to stop the salmon from dying. It has not taken action to make sure that climate change is being addressed. Um, we just turned in comments on actions to deal with climate change and water rights for new water rights applications. But meanwhile, there are water rights that are complete violations of the public being exercised while salmon are dying and going extinct within this state. Um, so I only have 25 seconds left, but those are our comments. Please consult with the tribes on these decisions. Please think about the fact that you are the only people standing in the way of possible extinction of salmon runs in the Klam community, Sacramento, San Joaquin, and Bay Delta systems, and salmon are worth way more than exports of almonds. Um, thank you so much, and please exercise whatever authority you can in this situation, and please feel free to ask me any questions outside of this forum. I want to respect everyone else's time. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mark Chow. Uh, you should be able to unmute your phone by pressing star six. OK, 
Okay, it looks like you're unmuted at this point, Mr. Chow. But if you're speaking, we're not hearing you. If you have an alternate microphone, like a Bluetooth headset or something to that effect, you could try disabling that and speaking directly into the phone or whatever device you're calling from. So unfortunately, Mr. Chow, maybe you can send an email uh, to, um, at this point, go ahead and send it to me since Ms. Townsend had to step out. Um, it's michael.lawfer at waterboards.ca.gov. And we'll try to figure out what the technical issue is and get you back in the back of the queue. We'll come back to you shortly. Our next speaker is Rachel Zoliger. Hold on. And you should be asked to unmute at this point, Rachel. Hi there. Can you hear me okay? I'm through loud and clear. Great. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Zwillinger, an attorney and water policy advisor with Defenders of Wildlife. Defenders works to protect aquatic and wetland species in California's Central Valley with a focus on Pacific flyway birds and species listed under the Endangered Species Act, like winter run and spring run Chinook salmon and giant garter snakes. We are deeply concerned about the outlook for winter run Chinook salmon this year and urge the board to use the full extent of its authority to protect this gravely endangered species. As you've already heard, winter run are not doing well. Another bad year puts the species on a trajectory towards extinction and the predicted, le predicted levels of mortality for this year would do exactly that. You have the power to require more meaningful protective measures and we implore you to use your authority before it's too late. We also urge the board to begin planning now for a dry 2022 water year. We need to get out of this cycle of last minute scrambling to avert disaster and earlier planning is essential. For the longer term, updating the Bay Delta plan in a manner that accounts for the likelihood of multiple dry year sequences and ensures diversions are consistent with fish and wildlife beneficial uses should be a priority and is the best pathway to a more predictable and sustainable future. Finally, I wanna add a note about wetland species. Pacific flyway birds and wetland wildlife like giant garter snakes are going to see dramatic habitat reductions this year. Level two refuge water supplies have been cut by 25% and actual deliveries will likely be lower and level four water will be mostly unavailable. Additionally, water districts are setting aside little or no water for post-harvest flooding of rice fields which is a major problem for wintering waterfowl and other Pacific flyway birds. On top of that already difficult situation, the water transfers that have been discussed today will wipe out tens of thousands of additional acres of rice habitat without adequate mitigation for impacts to species that depend on the rice fields. There are simple things that can be done to reduce the water transfers impacts to terrestrial species, like retention of non-irrigated cover crops on idled parcels, idling in a checkerboard pattern for giant garter snake habitat connectivity and retaining a small fraction of the transfer water for post-harvest flooding. Yet there is not a plan for widespread implementation of these measures and birds, snakes and other wetland wildlife will needlessly suffer. If water transfers are to become a part of California's drought management strategy, we need to do a much better job of ensuring that impacts to wetland species are minimized and mitigated. Thank you for your time today and for creating this opportunity for public dialogue. Thank you. Our next speaker is Linda Webb. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, I, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, my name's Linda Webb. And I'm with the Friends of the Shasta River. The Shasta is a tributary to the Klamath and I realize we're talking about the Sacramento today. I had attempted to speak yesterday, but through some glitch, I wasn't recognized. And uh, so I'm back here today, but my comments do apply to everything we're talking about here throughout the state, really. I wanted to thank Chair Esquivel for his very moving opening statement this morning about the murder verdict we all saw yesterday. You know, as it was so very painful for all of us to stand by and witness the horror of the murder 
of George Floyd. We are also experiencing the horror of witnessing the murder of species. And particularly here in our Shasta River, the coho salmon are threatened and are teetering on the brink of extinction by everybody's assessment. The death of the coho here is due mostly to the fact that ag diverters leave too little water in the river during the crucial months of April through September, much like too little water left for the Sacramento River aquatic life. And yes, this is a drought year yet again, but we can't keep using that as an excuse to let species die. I'm here asking you, please do the right thing. Stop the murder of species. Curtail agricultural water division, diversions. And after all, that is a matter of current income versus permanent extinction. It's something your children and grandchildren will be proud of you for. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Webb. Our next speaker is Jason, Jason Salvato. So Mr. Salvatno has uh, not joined us on the Zoom platform. So I think our next speaker will be Mr. Bachter. Yes, can you hear me? I, I, I've decided not to do the comment today, so you can just move on to the next speaker. Other than, other than real briefly, um, I, I agree completely with the comments of many of the people, um, particularly with um, those of um, Mike Jackson and other people from CSBA and c one and also the uh, Regina Chichizola and Tom Stokely. Thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Our next speaker will be uh, Richard Poole. At this point, we'll ask you to unmute yourself. Hear me now? Yes. Uh, thank you, board members, for allowing me to comment on one of the most serious problems in Sacramento River salmon have ever uh, encountered. My name is Richard Poole. I'm an engineer and I'm here on behalf of the Golden State Salmon Association. I'm head, I head the uh, science center for that group. I've been working to save salmon for almost 40 years and I, I will start by saying I endorse all the comments of the environmental groups, uh, uh, TVSA, the, uh, commercial, and all other folks that comment, and, and I strongly urge the board to uh, overturn what the Bureau has done. I have two concerns. There was a lot of discussion about the Bureau's ability to release cold water when the fish needed. The temperature curtain on Shasta Dam is, a, is supposed to provide the flexibility that is needed. That point was made by a number of people. It can't do that unless there's adequate quick carryover in the reservoir. It also sounds like the curtain needs modifications. That should be a no brainer and I would hope uh, you will support that. The other concern was mentioned by Doug Killam and John McManus and that is the fall run problem of dewatering that occurs, virtually occurs every year when the Bureau cuts the flows dramatically uh, after the fall run or after the winter run uh, uh, come out of the gravel. And that, that's a serious, serious problem. And it has in the past impacted the fall run very, uh, very much. And uh, hopefully you can deal with that. So I'll cut it there and, and thank you very much for the opportunity and, and for all your, uh, uh, all your listening. Thank you, Mr. Poole. 
And so Mr. Nelson had to drop out. I think we're going to be able to get Mr. Chow back in in a few moments, but our next speaker will be Mr. David Guy. David, we're going to ask you to unmute and if you'd like to share your video. Can you hear me? Yes. Good afternoon. Oh, thank you. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, David Guy in Northern California Water. It's late in the day. Um, just wanted to kind of suggest, boy, there's a lot of really good innovative work going on in the Sacramento Valley. Um, I think a lot of you and your staff are working on that. And uh, just hope we can continue that. Uh, the governor today, of course, urged us to break down binaries and continue that collaboration. I think that's how we're going to improve salmon. Uh, water managers right now are working 365 days a year to try to help improve conditions for salmon. Um, it's a challenge, but we just have to keep after it. So I hope the state water board will continue to kind of work in that vein and would love anybody that's uh, listening to come join the efforts in the uh, Sacramento Valley. We all care deeply about salmon and want to make them uh, improve and, and get the conditions better. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Guy. And next up is Mr. Cornwell. Roger, you should be able to unmute yourself now. And we're not hearing you, which often, and hopefully this is gonna be the same issue we had with Mr. Chow. Um, next to the mute unmute button in the lower left corner of your screen, there's a little up arrow. And that may let you check, select a different microphone. It could be... So, I'm gonna invite you to unmute again, Roger. And so it's right next to that button. It looks like a little carrot or up arrow. And if you click that- Is that better? It, yeah, yes, now we hear you, terrific. Thank you. All right, uh, thank you, Madam Vice Chair and other board members for your time this afternoon. Uh, I'm Roger Cornwell. I'm general manager of River Garden Farms. I'm also the chair of the Sacramento River Settlement Contractors and uh, just a little bit about River Garden Farms. We're a 15,000 acre farming operation here in Northern California. And uh, we're a diversified farming operation and we do farm on the Sacramento River. You know, um, we're involved in a lot of the projects going on up and down the river and, and those projects are collaborative. And uh, we do reach out and, and try to bring in as many people as we can. You know, I'd urge you to strongly support uh, the efforts that the Sacramento River settlement contractors are, are doing and engaging with the Bureau and, uh, and, and National Marine Fisheries as we move forward through a tough year. You know, I, I do recognize that a tough year is, is hard on everybody and especially the communities here. And uh, we, we haven't stopped working. We'll continue to work hard to, to improve those conditions. And uh, that's about all I have today. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Cornwell. Appreciate it. And we're going to try once again with Mr. Chow. Um, Mark Chow, uh, hopefully at this point, I'm gonna invite you to unmute. You should receive a request and then let's see if we have the same issue. Why don't you go ahead and try speaking now? And if we're unable to hear you, which it seems to be the case, I would like you to try the same thing that uh, we just did with Mr. Cornwall, which is in the lower left corner of your Zoom screen next to where it says mute, unmute, there's a little up arrow just to the right of that. If you can click it, you should be able to select an alternate uh, microphone. And maybe if your computer is giving you another option besides whatever is presently got a check mark next to it under select a microphone. Any luck, Mr. Chow? So again, it's not actually clicking on the mute and the microphone, it's the little arrow next to it. That'll pop up a screen that lets you select a microphone source on your computer. Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Thank you. And sorry for all the troubles here. Uh, my name is Mark Chow and I represent, I'm on a board member of the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. 
Let me give you a quick background. I do have a bachelor's degree in evolutionary biology from UC Berkeley. I've studied aquaculture at Bodega Marine Lab. I also carry an MBA and again, I'm aligned with the Golden Gate Fishermen's Association. I wanna thank you for this opportunity and to keep some of it simple, I absolutely want to suggest I agree and we align with many of your panelists from John McManus to current. It's very, very important that we understand, I feel that central to the problem is that the water contracts in question have not really been crafted initially are offered with the intention to secure adequate water for the fisheries, which is unique to the Delta. In addition, I feel we've not really addressed that we're in a sense beyond the water capacity for both water co contractors and the unique ecology of the Delta. And that's just an endemic problem. And I think that needs to be brought out. In a big picture, the late Scott Ferris Sr., Fish and Game Commissioner for Tehama County and a guide up in Redding, California, shared with me once that Robert Lackey crafted a piece in 2000. Lackey was University of Oregon, and his piece was called Restoring Wild Salmon to the Pacific Northwest, Chasing an Illusion. And the gist of Lackey's piece was very simple. It was that we have to make social changes to address our ability to, to restore wild salmon. And if we don't make these social changes and continue on with water usage as we are doing today, we're not going to be able to restore these fish. It's a very, very telling piece that Lackey suggested. In addition, I want to highlight and point out that that 56 degree temperature Fahrenheit is really not the optimal temperature. The optimal temperature incubation is closer to 53 or even a little bit lower than that. And as many of the speakers have said before, but I want to reinforce this, it's both the winter and fall fish are in their incubation period with the fall fish incubating their eggs from September to December and they need that cold water just like the winter fish. So we can't have this myopic view of only the winter fish. The winter fish are actually a listed species. We're not recreationally fishing for them, We're not commercially fishing them, but of course we want to protect those fish. So in a big picture, I hope that we're able to look to continue to restore this fishery. I know there's a discussion about suggesting, well, why even try? because the fish aren't being able to survive on their own. Another issue is when Kristen White suggested that one of the goals was to minimize releases through May, the fish actually, the out-migrating spolts had a problem getting out through the system because we're minimizing those releases and they need faster moving water to get past predation and turbid water, which naturally was there pre Shasta Dam. So evolution structured this species to survive in the ecology of our Sacramento system. Again, my operation supports all the fishing communities and many, many more because there's processing, restaurants, manufacturing. I actually run an, an operation for employee benefits and pension plans. So here's the hell of it that I've recognized. My business supports, or I work with all these fishing businesses and agricultural businesses. When this fishing community collapses, they can't pay for their medical insurance. They're not able to retire. They're not able to fund their 401k plans. They Thank lay you. off their staff. I'll ask you to wrap up, please. Thank you very much. Okay. So, thank, thank, so you thank you for your time and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. I'm glad we were finally able to get you in. Thank you. And so our next speaker is Michelle Garcia. You'll be asked to unmute and share your video if you'd like. 
Hello, thank you. Thank you for um, letting me uh, speak today. And um, thank you for all those who um, have spoken. Um, I represent, um, come to you, um, that I do follow the indigenous leadership of Chief Kelly Sisk of the Winnemum Wintu. And I am part of the Run for Salmon prayer journey and efforts to bring the salmon back to Winnemum homelands above the Shasta Dam on the McLeod River. And uh, as a Run for Salmon teacher, which I shared with you in the last, um, last meeting, I have the opportunity to work with the fourth grade students and learning about the story, the perspective of the Winnemum Wintu and um, what has happened to our homeland, what has happened to our relatives, the salmon who we already have experienced loss. We no longer have our salmon on our river. And so we know what that feels like. And so when working with those students, they understand um, what it, um, the importance of the health of our waters from the headwaters, which we haven't really talked very much about today um, and bringing the salmon back to those cold headwaters. Um, and the health of the water and the salmon from those mountains to the rivers, to the Bay Delta and to the oceans. And when I come back to those classrooms later in the year and we're talking about um, the development of the Spanish mission system. And we start with um, a timeline, just a simple timeline exercise where they measure out grains of rice to see um, when the Spanish mission system, the history of California since the beginning of the mission system until now. And it looks like this, it's just a small half teaspoon of rice. And then we talk about the history of indigenous peoples on these lands being the caretakers of their lands and the waters and the salmon. And they do, after doing the math, they measure out that 15,000 years of tending to the land looks like this. And so that's 15,000 years of millions of salmon running through our waters. And in just 250 years of time, we are now dealing with thousands and in some cases, in some years, hundreds in these runs. And when we look at this historical maps and photographs of the missions, we invite the students to share what they notice. And they're looking at the large scale, not just the architecture, but the large scale mission systems of these large crops, the in first introduction of large agriculture and diversions and canals and dams. And I won't forget this one time where a young boy just shot up and he was just, oh, one of those moments that those teachers get so excited about. And he said, that's gonna affect the salmon. And so, our children, our youth get it, they understand it. And so then when we later then talk about early California history and they start learning about the Central Valley Project and all the different water projects that essentially expanded the mission system to create these large scale agricultural industries and ranching from Southern California to Northern California, it is very easy for them to understand what is creating the environmental crisis that we're in today that they understand that it is all connected to what has happened to the water in this amount of time. And it just simply cannot continue. We can't keep going in this direction. It's not working. And so we can talk about what we can do in these drought years, but we also need to, and yes, this water temperature conversation we've had all day today, there are some important decisions that need to be made now because we're running out of time. The salmon are running out of time. Thank you, Ms. Garcia. Thank you for your comments and for joining us again. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Barry Nelson. Thank you, uh, uh, board members. Um, uh, Barry Nelson, Golden State Salmon Association. I won't repeat any of the comments you've heard uh, previously. Just a couple of very quick comments. Just wanted to highlight the fact that the analysis that Mr. Gilbert from NIMPS presented earlier, great analysis, we're looking at his uh, 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 temperature dependent mortality landscape. Um, I, I urge you to go back and look at that slide and think about what it means 
um, for losses of fall run. Um, NIMS's authority extends to the, just the winter run. That's not true for the state board. Your authority includes fall run. So I'm just urging to make sure that the board's discussion and the staff's analysis explicitly address uh, mortality for uh, for fall run. I think if you go back and look at that slide, it's an extremely sobering picture. Talk about the potential for an essentially um, 90 to 100 percent loss of fall run this year. Um, second season the point I wanted to make: Mike uh, Conroy uh, presented the commercial salmon season. And I wanted to highlight the fact that 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 same salmon season, commercial and recreational, for most fishermen in the state, was slashed by about 60 percent. Uh, and the fishing community supports the restrictions it faces. They don't fight those restrictions. They understand the importance of sustainable levels of returns uh, to return to the rivers and spawn, both the hatcheries and in the rivers. You can imagine the frustration of those folks who are facing real painful hardships this year because of the restrictions that they're willing to live with this year to make sure enough salmon return. You can imagine the frustration they feel when they hear that 90 to 100% of the offspring of those salmon in the Sacramento, the most important river in the system, um, may simply be lost this year. It's enormously painful. With that in mind, I just explore, I urge you to clearly and explicitly and publicly uh, 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 examine a full range of options, including changes in water management to, uh, to make sure that the board is um, uh, successfully tackling the difficult, the painful uh, decisions you face this year. And I, I sympathize with you as John McManus did earlier, uh, but I wanna make sure that when you're making those decisions, you're bearing in mind the, 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 the pain that the fishing community is feeling and the leadership they have shown in supporting restrictions on their industry. And I hope that will help inspire you to tackle uh, your difficult job this year. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. And the next speaker we have in the Zoom platform is Mr. David Webb. Hello, thank you very much. Um, I'd like to start off by saying that uh, I'm in complete agreement uh, with the environmental comments that have been made, particularly those of Mr. Obegi, of the CSPA, uh, Regina Chichicola, and uh, the other environmental comments and, and the fact that, that Bill Jennings, who has been here through it all, heard the stories over and over again, found the lies, seen the lies, and, and can tell us where they are. We've got to pay attention to people like that. They, they've been here too long to be ignored. For myself, there's something else I'd like to point out. In, in these discussions, I've noted in, in you board members a great reluctance to do anything that, that might somehow get crosswise with these contracts that the Bureau of Reclamation has signed. We've got to recognize that many of those contracts were signed with the specific intention of circumventing your authority over the use of state water. And I think it's really important that you assert and enforce state primacy over water use in California, whether it be by the Bureau of Reclamation or the smallest individual water user. You have that right, you have that responsibility, you have that authority. You need to take it and not simply roll over because they've written contracts that don't contain a force majeure contract or clause, which I've never known a competent attorney not to include. You have the authority, you have the right, and it will do them no harm. And if it does, then I would repeat what is said amongst the stock traders, he who sells what isn't his and buys it back or goes to prison. Don't let them roll you because they wrote a stupid contract. And another piece of that, which, which I'd like you to consider, thoughts become things by the way we use the words to describe them. And we collectively are always using the words to describe their sales agreements with the water as contracts. The people who are buying that water as contractors. We're putting handcuffs on ourselves and our thinking. Think of them more as customers. They're just customers. If the product runs out, they don't get to buy it. That's okay. Uh, let's quit using the word contracts and instead, instead describe them as water agreements, just agreements. We'll do the best we can with them, but they aren't contracts. You can't deliver the full amounts in a really dry year. And abandon the use of, of, the, of reference to, to contracts and contracts themselves and call them 
water delivery potential amounts, not contract amounts, potential water delivery amounts. And that way we can all recognize the fact that they are not cast in concrete, they are not immutable, they are subject to your oversight and control as needed. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Our next speaker is Cody Henriksen. Yo, Kali Du. Good evening. My name is Cody Henriksen, and I am Denina and Sukpiak, an enrolled member of the Nindelchik Village Tribe, and we are salmon people. I'm a senior undergraduate studying marine biology and Native American studies at Humboldt State University, and I'm also an advocate for Save California Salmon. We have the opportunity to begin the healing process for centuries of abuse, neglect, and resources extraction in the name of progress. This so-called progress has been an ecological disaster for the state and has been an attack on indigenous people's sovereignty, cultures, and lives. Historically, California has treated indigenous peoples and their lifestyles as less than and has deemed profit more important than indigenous lives. All Californian waterways are threatened and facing a man-made crisis. This crisis though can be managed with appropriate and culturally sensitive policies and procedures that center indigenous people's needs and demands. We can no longer operate under a water for profit model at the cost of indigenous peoples. The battle we all face as Californians and as people is the right to clean water and healthy ecosystems. As indigenous peoples, this is a battle for our indigenous lifestyles, cultures, spiritualities, and sovereignties. If the water board does not act, we will see the extinction of winter run salmon and numerous other species in our near future that are integral to indigenous peoples of this state. This will affect our indigenous peoples the most as it will be an irreparable loss to the culture and is a continuation of the attempted genocide of California's indigenous peoples. Salmon are an integral part of indigenous culture, spirituality, sovereignty, economies, and food systems. As indigenous peoples, we view our salmon as our relatives, and it is our social responsibility to take care of our relatives who cannot speak for themselves. Traditional indigenous management practices are responsible for California's once abundant salmon runs, and in order to start a return to those salmon runs observed before colonization, we must center indigenous peoples in the management of California's waterways, as we are most impacted by these decisions. Coordination with Californian tribes is imperative for an equitable and just response to the drought we all face as Californians. I ask the Water Board to release water for the winter run salmon in the Sacramento River and to center, center indigenous needs and demands at the heart of water resource decisions in California. The Water Board can not only consider water for profit or science behind management practices, but the people as well. I am also aware of how in this very meeting, many tribal members have had to jump off of this call because of the inaccessibility of today's meeting. Coordination with tribal peoples must be made accessible and is a priority. I'd like to say chikini and thank you for your time. Mr. Hendrickson, before you leave, um, it would be helpful if you could follow up or Mr. Lawfer um, uh, with Mr. Hendrickson um, regarding um, lack of accessibility issues for tribal members. So um, maybe have an offline follow up discussion about that, please. Yes, I would be very happy to. Thank you. All right, next speaker. Our next speaker is Mr. Mike Wade. Uh, Mike, we're going to offer you an opportunity to unmute your phone. You should be able to hit star six and you're good to go. All right. Uh, I'm unmuted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair and board members. I appreciate the opportunity to comment. I'm Mike Wade, Executive Director of the California Farm Water Coalition, which is a nonprofit education organization that was set up to provide fact-based information on farm water issues to the public. There are uh, three things that I'd like to address in my comments, and I'll do that as quickly as possible. That's ecosystem management is very complex. Uh, agriculture needs reliable water supplies. And lastly, California has a vibrant import export market for many products. Um, 
let me begin. Temperature management, we understand and we acknowledge is very important for the survivability of fish. But so are ocean conditions and food webs, robust habitat, clean water, and many other things that all need to be taken together. This is a complex system that must be addressed holistically. Farmers, members of the conservation community, state and federal agencies, and irrigation and water districts have all banded together on many occasions to restore and maintain habitat and flows to help support this system. With respect to today's proceedings, we're in favor of reclamation's efforts this year to manage reservoir releases in a way that preserves cold water pool for later in the summer when it's needed for endangered winter run salmon. But with respect to agriculture, large parts of California's uh, agriculture community depends on flows from the Sacramento River. They contribute to the production of hundreds of commodities that make their way to consumers in California, across the country, and around the world. This water year is shaping up to be much like 2015, when 540,000 acres of farmland were fallowed. Water supply cuts have easily affected three to four million acres of the state's irrigated farmland this year. And by April 12th of this year, one out of every four irrigated acres had had its water supply cut by 95%. In 2015, under similar conditions, agriculture suffered an, an economic loss of $2.7 billion and 21,000 job losses. Now, I've personally spoken to numerous farmers in the last two weeks who told me they've already eliminated thousands of acres of at least 10 different crops, including lettuce, tomatoes, melons, rice, asparagus, sweet corn, pima cotton, and garlic. And for the most of these crops, California is the national production leader, which makes this a national issue, not just a California issue or a Central Valley issue. But when farm fields go unplanted, it isn't just the farmer who feels the pain. Uh, UC, Berkeley, uh, UC Berkeley economic assessment told us that the ripple effect travels through communities, eliminating on-farm and farm service jobs all across employee classes and compensation levels. And additional impacts occur in downstream jobs among sectors like transportation and food processing, and more generally as farmers and unemployed workers, oftentimes in disadvantaged communities, have less income to spend on household purchases with all types of businesses that they work with. Now, California farm products aren't just grown for Californians. Any more than energy generated in one county is used only for the benefit of that county's residents. We live in a world which, where products are grown or built or assembled and are then sold to other people all around the world. And I would just add that picking this crop or that crop as a villain is a misleading way of dealing with our overall water supply and the benefits that California agriculture brings to millions and millions of people that need to eat every day and a large part of California's economy. So Thank you, Mr. That's the end of my comment. Thank you very much. I appreciate okay, it. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker is Jane Carey. Should be invited to unmute and start your video if you'd like. Hi, my video is not working. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. Thank you very much for offering um, this opportunity for comment today. And I hope you and all the board and your loved ones are all safe and healthy and have everything that you need. I'm Dr. Jane Perry, retired researcher and teacher at UC Berkeley and a member of 1000 Grandmothers for Future Generations. I am commenting for the third time to your board on behalf of our California salmon who cannot speak for themselves in this format. I've spoken of necessary water flows to restore healthy salmon runs, recognizing your authority and legal responsibility to provide adequate flow standards. I have spoken of this year's reports of better than expected salmon school numbers and the necessity of protecting the eggs of this year's run from too hot Sacramento River temperatures. I am very grateful to all those bringing information to this workshop. 
our salmon are truly amazing, as Doug Killam and Stephen Morano told us. Salmon leave their natal stream just months after hatching to transform from fresh to saltwater creatures, offer themselves as a food source, and return years later, sometimes traversing 900 miles and gaining 7,000 feet in elevation to find their place of birth. In the process, our salmon clean the riverbeds, allowing the river to breathe. How do the salmon accomplish such navigation? Migrating salmon can detect a single drop of water from their natal stream in 250 gallons of seawater. They follow the scent of their natal stream. I encourage the board's creative powers in partnering with innovative solutions to protect our salmon. Please use your sacred responsibility in this system of life to regulate water flow and temperature. I'm so very grateful to you for this workshop and this opportunity to comment. I thank you and I thank you for your statement on environmental racism. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Um, Mr. Lawfer, I just want to do um, a time check. Um, uh, how many speakers do we have left? And then um, we will want to um, have some closing comments um, by the board. So just considering whether we should take a, just a brief uh, bio break here. Sure. So at this point in time, Vice Chair Diodamo, we have 11 speakers who have indicated they still would like to speak. And then there are another six or seven who put in a card and are either not on the Zoom platform or have indicated that they uh, only want to speak if necessary. So somewhere between 11 and probably 15 people. Okay, I'll defer to my colleagues. I'm okay with pressing through, but I'm also fine with taking a break. Does anyone have strong feelings here? <laughs> Okay, well then I think we'll press through. I just um, wanna be able to get, um, you know, a lot of people are still following and wanna be able to wrap things up so people can have family time. So let's press on through. Thank you. Sure. Our next speaker is Rebecca Olstad. We'll be asked to unmute. Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Seatung Olstad. I'm a member of the public and I'm calling in from Oakland, California. And I'm also grateful and blessed to be a part of the Run for Salmon journey led by Chief Colleen Sisk of the Winneman Wintu tribe. And I want to lift up the comments and agree with Regina Chikazola, Nichelle Garcia, Cody Henriksen, and Dr. Jane Perry. Uh, so to you all the board, I, I understand you're operating from a framework of your legal responsibilities, your state constitutional responsibilities, and I really want to emphasize your moral responsibility and your responsibility to us, the public. You know, we, we know that it's not okay to lose salmon, and we know that salmon are indicators of healthy waters, and if they're in trouble, we're all in trouble, and that's indigenous knowledge and it is also backed by biological opinion. It's unacceptable to lose our salmon. And as Nichelle said, we already have. Many tribes already have lost their salmon. This state has already lost salmon and it has had huge impacts on people's lives and on the landscape. They're keystone species and we need them and we need them to survive what's, what's coming next. So I really ask you to listen to that moral compass. And as all the specialists have shared today, it sounds like you have a lot of legal framework to really exercise your authority in a way that protects the salmon and keeps the water cold and allows them to actually thrive and continue to live under already very hostile situations for most of the salmon that are still in this state. I also really wanna lift up the comment by Cody Henriksen that the salmon becoming extinct is part of ongoing genocide against native peoples. And you all have a responsibility an opportunity and a necessity to stop that from continuing to happen. So I really hope that you listen to these comments and to the comments by so many others to protect the salmon, center tribal leadership, center the requests and asks of tribal people. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And then our next speaker is Vivian Hellowell, who will be asked to unmute at this point. you hear me? All right. Yes, good evening. 
my video doesn't seem to be working. But... Actually, Ms. Hall, we can see you just fine. Oh, great. Um, I'm from a commercial fishing family and we have a very, very limited season this year in the ocean. We still have fixed costs of maintaining our boats. In fact, you cannot sell a boat if there's no season. We have no local salmon in the stores. It's all flown in. So uh, we're, we support conservative management of the fisheries to, to maintain these fish in the long term and uh, they provide a fine quality local product of protein and thousands of jobs to our communities. We had a robust fishery from the Sacramento just a couple of three decades ago and the, the fish have continued to crash. We, uh, uh, I agree with the comments uh, of Mr. Jennings, Mr. Obiji, Mr. Schutz, Mr. Jackson, and Regina Chikazola, that you have a responsibility to take care of the fall run Chinook as well as the, the endangered winter run that we worked for so many decades to keep from the edge of extinction. And it looks like we're gonna have lose another year class again this year. I wanna ask you to stand up for California's unique resource of salmon and see that we can keep it from going extinct. Electrical blackouts are temporary, but extinction is forever. And so the fishermen need a higher standard of recovery than even the ESA. We need a harvestable surplus. And this goes for the We've lost your video, Ms. Hallowell. Okay. Oh, there we go. But you can hear my voice. <laughs> so we really need the board to stand up for these fish and make sure they have water year round so they can get out of the river. I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And then our next speaker is Sherry Norris, who will be invited to unmute at this point in time. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Sherry Norris. I'm the executive director of the California Indian Environmental Alliance. It's good to see uh, those of you on the board who I've seen before out here at different forums, so hello. Um, I'm here to um, remind um, all of you of some of the work that, that SIA has done, and in particular, that salmon are, tr are traditional food for all California people throughout the state, not just through the direct gathering and fishing of tribes that are adjacent to the river system of the Sacramento River and all of the tributaries that feed into it, but also that salmon is used for trade among tribes. So this is actually connected to the cultural continuance of all tribes in California and even outside of the area as well. Can't tell you how many times that I have been at ceremonies where salmon were, were part of our meals and traded. Um, I've been in the, in the desert in Arizona and, had, and salmon was traded from California. So people, tribes in other states look to California um, for, for this traditional food. Um, they're an irreplaceable, an irreplaceable species that are tied to the future of California tribes. Um, they are low in mercury uh, because of their life cycle, which is left over from the first statewide environmental catastrophe of the gold rush, which is also connected to the genocide that took place in California. And that right now the state is trying to heal from through the truth and healing um, um, process that we're going through here in the state of California. So how can tribes heal without having traditional foods, land, safe water and health and this would be a, a severe blow on the, the uh, continuation of California Indian people to lose the, 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 the salmon in the state of California. In particular, the Sacramento River, the tribes along the river are, are struggling immensely to maintain their salmon. You've heard about the Winnem and Wintu in the north and all the way through um, to, the, to the bay here where the, where the Muek Maloney are working to restore their fish and their traditional ceremonies related to fish and keep these going. Um, so I urge the water board to exercise your authority to prioritize California, California families, California tribes, and to remember that 
that salmon have the long chain omega-3 fatty acids that are the best source for developing fetus and for families of all backgrounds in California. These nutrients cannot be gained by supplements. They are key for brain and nervous system development. And so really we cannot prioritize exported agricultural crops and allow the extinction of such an important culturally and um, healthful species. It's, it's just, it's you have too big of a responsibility in front of you right now to, to uh, pass this opportunity up to support us all. Thank you very much, I appreciate your help. Thank you for your comments, Ms. Norris. And then we're gonna go through a few uh, individuals who have not uh, joined us on the Zoom platform or have already left. And so our next speaker who's actually in the platform and indicated it uh, was listed as if necessary is Celia Gonzalez. Ms. Gonzalez, would you like to speak? You'll be given a chance now and unmuted. Hi, uh, my name is Celia Lobono Gonzalez. Um, I want to uplift Regina Chichizola, Michelle Garcia, Cody Henriksen, Rebecca Olsted, and Sherry Norris's comments today. I'd like to remind you that California is stolen land, and I'm here to ask for you to please listen to California Native people. Indigenous people are the original scientists of this land and have been studying and stewarding salmon since time immemorial. Salmon are a keystone species and their health impacts the entire ecology from the head springs to the entire ocean. Please guide your decisions with traditional ecological knowledge. River flows are critical to salmon survival. In the past, poor prioritization led to low flows causing the killing of up to 98% of the juvenile salmon in California's major salmon rivers, Sacramento and Klamath. It also led to poor water qualities in cities drinking water supplies. Salmon may be on the brink of extinction, and if action is not taken to protect and restore wild salmon, it would be an ecological disaster that, as has been said already, would also mean cultural gen genocide for Native peoples. This can be mitigated, and we all have a role to play, and you all must take action now. From what I understand from the Governor Newsom's executive order announcement today about the drought, the State Water Resources Board has authority to override certain water rights. The priority must be to let the water flow in the rivers to protect the salmon and to not to give in to the demands of corporate water brokers and export-based agriculture. Please work urgently and holistically to protect salmon and fish ecology. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Our next speaker is Mary Kate Lowry, who will be invited to unmute at this point. A queen, Nick now, Mary Kate Lowry, um, Anishinaabe, Mate Wilmershoff, uh, Nanel, uh, Nate. My name is Mary Kate Lowry, and I come from Shrey, but my ancestry comes from the Great Lakes areas. I've worked in education, Native education, for about 20 years, and I'm doing Native STEAM through the Pathmakers program. Um, I've worked with Yurok, Karuk, and, and all different native youth and what we're looking at is what I, I really appreciate every single speaker but those that mentioned cultural genocide tek um the understanding that we have to work together for our future i've been here just like you guys have sitting here watching and listening okay i'm here with you i understand it hurts you know but it's because we're hurt we we're trying to come together to make a future and just like the woman who mentioned the our world is changing with George Floyd's death. We are changing our world paradigm. I'm a teacher. I work for Hubble County Office of Education. I have children who are Yurok who have suffered because of the salmon policies. And because of time, the next couple of speakers are my children because every single federal energy regulatory council that we went to, for them to speak because they're Yurok and because their ancestors and their culture is based on salmon and every single tribe that had salmon, just like the women went to, are relying, and their children are relying, and their grandmothers are hoping and dreaming for these children to be able to carry on the future. All right, bring it in. Let's go, boys. So we have to do what we have to do to save the salmon so they don't go extinct this summer. All right, now you. Do what you got to do to save the salmon. We don't want them going dead. We'll all die. All right, so 
that will hopefully take the place. So Connect Neck and Rapport are my sons. They've been with me since they were babies attending these meetings. They're not the only one. Daniel Ray, who is, she's one of our youth water protectors. We have, when the dams were coming down the Klamath River, there was hope. I lived in a community where seven young men committed suicide in two years. And what we're looking at, and I'm done in one minute, we're looking at creating hope. We're doing this together. We have an opportunity to do something different, all right? And I, I'm really appreciative. Thank you so much. Everybody who spoke in uh, Waklao, too. Thank you, and uh, thanks to your sons as well. Appreciate it. Our next speaker is Molly Colton, who will be asked to unmute at this point in time and share a video if you'd like. Hi, y'all. Can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Hello. All right. Hello. My name is Molly Colton, and I'm speaking on behalf of Sierra Club California. I'm echoing what many of the presenters and public commenters have said today. We're asking the State Water Board to run their models and tell us what it would take to avoid the looming fish massacre and how much water needs to be held back to protect the salmon. We don't want to see a repeat of past calamities like the 2008-2009 shutdown and or the 2014-2015 loss of naturally spawned salmon due to hot water issues back then. The State Water Board needs to act to avoid killing the salmon eggs in the Sacramento River this fall. Please save the offspring of what we believe to be a decent school of salmon out in the ocean right now. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. And then our next speaker I had indicated if necessary, but Isaac Kinney, we're now going to give you an opportunity to unmute and speak if you'd like. Hey. Oops, hold on one second, Mr. Kinney, you're going to have to go again on unmuting. Hey, Kui. Neck now, Isaac Kinney. Wage boost, as you back to us, as you actually got my well match up, as you wage boost up. Hello, my name is Isaac Kinney. I uh, come from the villages of Wagepoos, Peck Tooth, and Ursula Gert at the, at the confluence of the Klamath and Trinity Rivers. I'm calling here to uh, urge the uh, water board to, again, do what they need to do to manage uh, cold water flows to California salmon uh, year round. Um, I have a couple of points here that I want to make sure to go quick, but want to include. Uh, again, understanding that one of the main uh, uh, one of the main solutions to climate change is going to be local market resilience, and that understanding that uh, here locally salmon is one of these major socioeconomic indicators. It's a ecological and biological indicator, but one I want to focus on uh, is that it's also also a cultural and nutritional health indicator as well. And that right now, all of our protein uh, sources of protein are under threat here locally, not just in the lower Klamath or the, the lower Trinity, but all throughout uh, the region. And so to understand that salmon is uh, this pathway to of self-determination, uh, not just for tribal folk, but for all people living in our watersheds, the ability to feed ourselves healthy foods and good medicine. Again, uh, my, my next point is because of Calif the state of California and their lack of path to title of the land of California, that the, the water board needs to drastically change its decision-making to include and prioritize uh, it, tribal and indigenous communities because California has the largest indigenous uh, people's population of the United States. This has to be a priority, especially because in taking an environmental and social justice perspective to climate change, uh, you gotta include indigenous people's voices. And my last point real quick, uh, to understand that, um, you know, a lot of the decisions or the water board's connection to land, connection, uh, as well as the contractors, uh, Sacramento River contractors connection to land is built off of uh, the genocide of indigenous peoples, has to be a part of the equation. But also to understand that this is my final point, that we have an opportunity here that when we can make these changes locally in our backyard here in California, what is now known as California, we can prove these concepts uh, for regenerative practice throughout the world. Now, my name is Isaac Kinney. I'm the CEO of Watershed Regenerative Ventures, and I'm done talking. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Kinney.
Then our next speaker is Garen McCarthy, who will be asked to unmute at this point in time. Hi, my name is Garen McCarthy. Can you hear me, board? Yes, we can. Hello. Good, good evening. Um, I'm a third generation commercial fisherman, and I'm asking for your help in protecting our future with the fish and my future and my heritage. I fished commercially since 1992. I've been through the 2008 closure. I lost my boat. I got another boat and I really don't want this to happen again. Um, commercial fishermen put our lives and our souls in this. It's, it's more than just a way to make money. It's a heritage. It's a, it's a culture and it's, something of a dying breed. We're the, we're the last of the last. A lot of our infrastructure has gone away, like what Mike Conroy and <clears throat> John McManus were talking about earlier. The gear stores have gone away. The ice docks have gone away. The fuel docks are getting limited. We're struggling here. And I truly believe that you as board members can make a difference in not only my future, but the future of others who want to try to maintain this lifestyle. It's not a lavish lifestyle. It's it's a lot of hard work, but it's very, very rewarding. And like I said, very important that we keep so we have to up to be returning this fall. We got to run that as you've heard there are concerns concerns are a lot of people who have um, presented early put a rosy picture on it what's actually happened. I'm kind of boots on the ground. I've seen what's been going on for the last 20, 25, 30 years. Our industry has declined. It's been decimated. It's getting worse and worse. Honestly, we're all day and on. And I really report, use the authority that you have to make a difference. You know, and not only financially, but we've got our heart and our soul wrapped up. So if there's anything to do, I'd really appreciate it. And I know it's been a long day. I've been on um, I've been on the conference call since eight o'clock this morning while trying to work on my boat. I'm in the wheelhouse right now, and I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you for sticking with us, Mr. McCarthy. Appreciate your comments. And our next speaker is Mr. Andrew Hitchings. Uh, Andy, we're going to give you a chance to unmute yourself and start your video here. Yeah, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah, Hello. thank you, Vice Chair Diadamo and members of the board um, for the opportunity to comment. It's been a long day, so I will make this brief. Uh, Andrew Hitchings of Somex Simmons and Dunn appearing for Glen Close Irrigation District, which is one of the Sac River settlement contractors. Um, I just want to make a few comments in response to certain earlier statements made by Mr. OBG for NRDC during their presentation. Um, I just think it's important that, that we note that the settlement contractors really do dispute NRDC's characterization of the board's authority under 90-5. I know board member Dodek had asked uh, a specific question with regard to uh, what authority would be cited to there. And also uh, NRDC's characterization of reclamation's discretion to reduce allocations to the contractors under the settlement contracts. Uh, we did submit detailed letters on these subjects to the board on March 30th uh, of this year, uh, which also included and attached a copy of a May 11, 2020 letter, uh, which completely refute those characterizations, um, as well as other positions that have been taken by NRDC regarding the contractor's water rights. Um, so we encourage the board members and staff to review those. Um, and we are happy to make ourselves available to answer any questions on them. Uh, but we think there is a, a lot of detail in there that's helpful, particularly to the, the question that uh, board member Dodek had, had raised earlier. Um, you know, and in closing though, I, I do wanna re reiterate um, some of the earlier statements by the contractors during uh, this long day that what we really look forward to is instructive, constructive engagement within the SRTTG and the buyout meet and confer process and within the Sac River Science Plan effort to find a creative way to address temperature management challenges in years like this. 
So with that, I just want to thank you for your consideration of our comments. Thank you, Mr. Hitchings. I appreciate that. And at this point, uh, Vice Chair Diadamo and other board members, we have concluded all of the speakers who are in the queue and it is over for the board to discuss at this point. All right. Well, it's been a long day. Um, I'd like to open it up. I'm having some difficulty with my screen, but not able to kind of shift around. So um, I'll try and I'm not able to see board member Firestone. And I think my computer's just kind of tired here. So let's see if I can. We'll, we'll just open it up and um, go from there. Since you can see me, well, go ahead. And go to, yeah, why don't you start? Thank you. Um, and then actually, I have some questions for staff, actually. So if Ms. Riddle if, is still around, Ms. Riddle, or Mr. Oppenheimer, or somebody, staff? <laughs> I, I know, I know Ms. Heinrich I, uh, it is on and, Okay. Thank you. Go, Matt Holland. Good. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, I, I'm I'm curious. I know and appreciate all the discussions staff has had uh, with our you know fellow sister agencies as well as the bureau and the fishery agencies um, on this matter. I'm curious though. To what extent have the scenarios that you guys have been discussing, I know that it includes, you know, various hydrology, various fishery conditions, uh, various temperature targets and locations, but do they include also potential reductions in deliveries, timing of, you know, deliveries, which I think has been mentioned, but how about reductions? So um, I don't know if Matt or Diane are still in the Zoom platform. They've been the ones working most closely with um, Reclamation and NIMS technical staff. Um, but my understanding is they, you know, using this rapid assessment tool, again, it's more of a screening tool that would then need to be vetted with a full model. But using that tool, my understanding is they are looking at a lot of different scenarios, including uh, reductions. And I did get an email from Diane saying she can't unmute. And so I maybe, can now. Uh, I'm unmuted. I want to pick up where I just left off, but um, you know a lot better than I do, Diane, what you're modeling, what you're not. Yeah. Um... We have been, so as part of the rapid assessment process, as James Gilbert um, described, we have been evaluating a number of different factors, including changes in releases, which would, you know, I think in order to achieve that would have to be achieved through changes in deliveries or, or some other factor. I don't, I don't think that the modeling has necessarily determined how that's achieved, but that would be essentially the proxy for a change in deliveries. So that is something that has been explored in the rapid assessment tool. I believe that James showed some results for a reduction in releases of 5%, which is approximately withholding 120,000 acre feet in storage. Um, the, some of that rapid assessment work has explored a broader range of scenarios as James explained in his presentation, um, the rapid assessment tool is, is just a screening tool. It helps us to understand areas where we may want to focus further analysis. So I think in order to really determine the sensitivity of um, temperature conditions and temperature dependent mortality to changes in deliveries would require a full assessment NIMS has so far done a full assessment of, again, that 5% change in um, releases, uh, but not any further full assessment using this full suite of modeling tools of other scenarios. Those are things I think could potentially be investigated if those are you know, scenarios the board is interested in um, being further. 
I guess the reason I ask and the reason I would be interested is because this is such a complicated issue, because this has such wide ranging implications and impacts to you know, so many people. Um, I mean, at this point, unless we've definitely ruled out any particular pathway, I would like to have as much options as possible, um, you know, analyzed and so that we have those options to consider. And so, you know, that's why I asked the question. But your answer actually leads me to another question, and that is, you know, time is running out on us. I think the, if I recall correctly, the timeline is that the draft temperature management plan would not be received by us until, actually, no, the final plan won't be received until late May. The draft is supposed to be sometime in late April. Um, and then we have 10 days to act upon that. So possibly that means June before the board takes action. And based on your discussions so far, by then, how many of these options, how many of these scenarios that are being discussed will be ruled out simply because of the late timing of our action? I don't know that scenarios are necessarily ruled out. I think the repercussions of scenarios, it's already obviously would be a serious action to look at scenarios in which you're reducing releases further than what's comp contemplated. You know, there are a lot of different decisions that are being made. Um, and the so there are, you know, the considerations with respect to um, the different purposes that water from Shasta Reservoir is used for, it's used for salinity control in the Delta, um, along with supplies from Oroville and Folsom. So that's, you know, always a balancing act between those tributaries. I think we heard some about the storage conditions in the other reservoirs. It's not, you know, I think it, we're facing low storage levels in all of the project reservoirs. So I think that, you know, that creates a challenge. So that's, you know, one consideration. Another consideration, of course, is the water supply um, situation. Um, and I think at this point in the irrigation season, I would anticipate that the um, settlement contractors have largely made some of their planting decisions. So, you know, if I don't know that those options are necessarily foreclosed, but those I'm sure would be concerns related to, you know, the fact that I'm sure many decisions related to purchasing of supplies and scheduling and, and other factors have been, um, have been arranged, which has always frankly been one of the challenges with temperature management. I think we spoke about that some today, that the timing with the hydrology and the irrigation needs and um, the temperature management planning process, they all kind of pile on top of one another at the same time. Um, but I don't know that options are closed necessarily. They're just much more difficult to consider the later in the season we get. Hmm. And then I guess my final question, my first two questions were focused on this immediate um, near-term actions that we have to take. But we've heard today how important it is to start planning for next year. So could you please um, spend a little bit of time, not too much since it's late in the day, but just maybe outlining what steps are being put in place right now to plan for next season? Because we've heard already how important it is to start I guess maybe it's not a starting, but ongoing and continuing the discussion and the coordination, should there be another uh, unfortunate dry season next year? Sure. Um, I, I think you may have recalled, and I'm not, and all may not be aware of this, but um, we did submit a request for a temperature management planning protocol to the Bureau of Reclamation. We received a response to that late last year. Um, we This year, much of the focus hasn't been on that protocol. Instead, it has been on the temperature management planning issues that we're facing within this year versus the long-term issues. I think, um, you know, I, the circumstances this year, I've had some discussions with Reclamation 
about, you know, the need to look at some of these long-term planning issues and how we go about Sacramento River temperature management planning going forward. And I think we're, we have consensus. We might have different ideas about how to go about doing that. But I, I think all involved understand the need for us to be thinking more long-term in our strategies for managing and working together, considering the different factors. So those are definitely um, issues as soon as we can get past this temperature management planning season that I know that um, we as well as the as reclamation, the fishery agencies are um, anticipating moving, you know, quickly into those discussions and focusing on um, on how we consider these issues in in the next year and, and how we take advantage of some of the new tools. I know some of you know the rapid assessment tool, the NIMS Science Center has developed. It's a new tool. It's it's a helpful tool if we can get that peer reviewed and finalized. I think it will help with decision making, help with considering. The different trade-offs for a number of different factors, um, including uh, releases, but also um, how long the window is, what temperatures we target, some of these Trinity River issues that we spoke about. Um, it's really a, a very helpful tool. So I think there will be an emphasis on getting that tool peer-reviewed, vetted through a public process, making it available to folks. And we've had some discussions with NIMS on that front. And I think everybody's really um, in favor of moving forward in that direction, including you know the water water users and um, and the fisheries agencies. So um, there's a good amount of work to do. We've had some initial discussions. Um, the other issue I think is uh, Dave Mooney spoke about the drought toolkit that Reclamation is developing. Um, I think the efforts to complete that de development process and fully assess all of the different toolkit actions that maybe on the table needs, you know, emphasis will be placed on completing that effort as well. Again, I think some of the emphasis turned away from some of these long-term planning activities while we were um, focusing um, for the next, you know, month in the past couple of months on the, the specific issues within this year. But those are all, all of those issues are teed up um, for uh, further work and, um, and collaboration to get us in a better position next year. Thank you. Thank you, board member Dodek. Board member Firestone or board member McGuire. Well, I'll, I'll jump in. So, <laughs> You know, I'll keep and I'll keep my comments short, just based on the space that we're in right now. But just really thank everyone who's participated here over the last nine hours of our meeting today. It really has been a lot of powerful comments from from all the stakeholders, right? So from reclamation, um, hearing from the water users, hearing from um, our tribal representatives. And hearing from you know so many different interests, um, it just highlights how complex and how challenging uh, these decisions are and will be this year. And as we were just discussing here in future years, you know, as we think about climate change, as we think about you know, other stressors on the system, and you know, I've learned a lot today. Uh, I had a lot to take in. I was taking notes. Uh, as, as Vice Chair Diadamo had uh, <laughs> suggested we were, I was diligently listening to all the folks today. And you know, certainly this is a workshop and we're not here to, to make any uh, decisions, but um, you know, I will be interested in hearing more about the, you know, the analysis, the, the scenarios that have been considered and following in the line of what board member Dodek was asking about just now. Um, I am very much interested in seeing the draft temperature management plan soon uh, when Reclamation has it uh, available. Uh, I know there's a lot of moving parts here, um, you know, but at the end of the day, I have been really encouraged by the discussion um, of, and, and looking, thinking creatively about, for example, the power bypass, and different options that you haven't even been considered um, or implemented really in prior years. Um, so what I do see here is progress. 
uh, in, you know, embracing you know, different actions that could help this year, uh, looking at the various modeling tools that are in development that can help inform better decision making. Uh, the challenge, I think, is that this is all happening uh, in real time here. And so we do, you know, we all have decisions, tough decisions to make. Uh, and I am sensitive to uh, the risk and the trade-offs here um, when we're thinking about our fisheries. Uh, you know, and, and you know, I had been thinking predominantly about this, the uh, um, the winter run salmon, but I really appreciated all the comments today about the other runs, the fall and spring run, and needing to think about the entire uh, water cycle, the entire ecosystem here um, through our planning efforts. So. Um, those comments I did take to heart and appreciated that input. So, um, you, know, and the, you know, the last thing I just wanted to mention is I, you know, I, I do feel like um, a lot of focus is on uh, the settlement contractors here as being the only knob that's available. And I think, you know, it seems like they're making some efforts with the transfers, with some voluntary reductions, um, you know, as to what they feel they can contribute here to better improve temperature management. Whether it's enough, whether, you know, how far that goes, I suppose, I, I think we have to wait and see what the temperature management plan uh, includes and, and we can go from there. Um, but um, I do think that this, you know, today's discussion has highlighted the benefits of having, um, you know, an earlier, process and planning um, and even, you know, even just these, this, this workshop today, I think has highlighted the need for that, how some decisions have already been made and are in the works. Um, and, you know, we need to embrace, you know, this planning process as, as early in the, the season as we can, um, knowing that, you know, while not all commitments can be finalized until we really know everything about the hydrology and, and where the reservoir is, um, there are some early actions that be, can be contemplated. And to the extent, I think it was Mr. Cannon who was talking about um, the need for adaptive management and really looking at this on a day-to-day -day basis and you know, making decisions, reflecting on how conditions are changing, I think is something that we, we need to better embrace here as we go forward. I think we, um, last year, I think, you know, we had a lot of these similar concerns and discussions about mortality and what ended up happening was we had catastrophic wildfires, which none of us were uh, predicting at that time and not even really thinking about how that might actually impact, and, um, strangely enough, benefit uh, water temperatures uh, because of all the smoke, but you know, in some way it did. And so you know, we can't predict what will happen this year completely, um, but I think with these modeling tools and, and the steps that we're taking, we can be more proactive. So I just look forward to additional pop process here, additional consideration um, from the water users, from reclamation, from other stakeholders that are involved and uh, continued discussion. Thank you. Thank you, board member McGuire. Board member Firestone. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, also wanna say thanks to everyone that that's, has stuck with us all day um, and has been working on these issues um, for many years. Um, the, I mean, I just really appreciate the opportunity to have this space and public dialogue um, that I think is really important on these issues. I am, uh, you know, struck by um, how complex this is um, as somebody new to this whole area of work, um, just so interconnected, um, and and uh, challenging for I, I I guess I have a whole new appreciation. Not that I didn't appreciate it before, but for the real operational challenges and kind of interconnectedness of all these decisions, um, and also just really the. Um, you know, the, the variety of um, solutions and, and ideas that are, that are, um, people are bringing to the table. I think really exciting to see the new tools, um, exciting to see, you know, these new options being tried out like the, the bypass. Um, uh, I, um, you know, so I, 
I'm coming into this area in learning mode. I'm very much listening and learning and I, I have learned a ton today. Um, I do feel like there's, you know, as a board member now, this may not have been my area of expertise before, but this is a really essential function that we play as a board. And um, I think we all take this really seriously. Um, we certainly don't want to be, um, you know, the the um, the ones that let species go extinct. Um, and uh, we also need to be doing everything we can to support um, everything going on the table, rolling up our sleeves, trying to figure out um, how we can can do, uh, how, how we can achieve the goals that we really need to achieve and, and do our responsibility. Um, I don't think there's, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in the sort of binary that um, it's sort of a regulatory approach versus voluntary. I mean, I think that actually regulation um, enables voluntary actions in many ways. It provides more certainty and, and clarity. And so I do feel like we need to, um, you know, take our regulatory authority um, seriously, which I know we do. Um, that includes, I think, you know, ensuring that we can look at all the scenarios um, and uh, and that um, you know we're that and I know our staff are doing this, but that we um, are really doing everything we can to support all of the the discussions of management um, agencies and stakeholders that are trying to really again, in good faith, put everything on the table and see how we can get to the goals of, of not just preventing species from going extinct, but, but reasonable protection um, and, um, and preparation for, I think what we said is, and what everyone has seen is, is the, the new normal, um, you know, increasingly, um, inc increasingly we are seeing these really dire circumstances. We know um, that this isn't, this is something we need to be planning for. Um, just repeating, I think what what everyone's already said before. Um, I, you know, I think about uh, again with all drought preparedness. Um, you know, I come from the drinking water context, um, and one and one it, it, in some ways every um, situation is different, but there's a lot that we can prepare for and do ahead of time. And um, I think uh, the more that we can really roll up our sleeves and look at, it seems like this new tool provides some ability to start to see, um, you know, where there's really, um, what really makes a difference, um, where there's opportunities and, um, and just, you know, the work on the, the toolkit and different, um, you know, clarity as we go forward what are the options? How are we going to respond? How can we um, how can we manage even as we can't predict what's going to happen um, a month from now? So, again, I I think um, I just really appreciate the complexity. I appreciate the severity of the situation, um, and I take really seriously the the role that we have within it, and appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, board member Firestone, and thanks to everyone for um, my, my colleagues for all of the really good dialogue and questions for all of the presenters today in their thoughtful and uh, thought provoking presentations and for the many, many stakeholders, uh, public commenters that uh, hung in there with us. I apologize that the day has dragged on so much, but um, I too learned a lot today, took a lot of notes and really do appreciate the opportunity to learn more. So um, I have, um, uh, I guess, two buckets of comments. One is long-term planning versus how do we move quickly and do the best with what we've got this year. And so the longer term planning, I really appreciate the development of the drought toolkit and hopefully we'll be able to utilize that more um, next year and in future years. Um, further development of the uh, rapid assessment tool, um, really exciting opportunities with that tool and just um, 
uh, want to learn more about how that tool can be used. And of course, not being an expert, what I would rely on is the opinion of others. Um, so um, really uh, looking forward to an open process with that tool, uh, peer review and uh, open uh, collaboration on further development of it. Um, and then of course, just overall improved pre preparedness, which um, that sort of folds into um, this year. And um, I, I just wanna comment that um, having been here uh, in the last drought, this just really feels different. The stakes are even higher because of you know uh, dry years, um, uh, drought coming so soon after the most recent drought. So in some respects, it seems even more serious and even more troublesome. But then I always like to look at the glass that's uh, half full and I feel hopefulness um, in, um, because of some of the increased tools that we have in this round. And so um, I appreciate the presentation about some of the system improvements, um, additional assessment tools, as we've talked about, um, uh, earlier discussions than what we've had in the past. Could be earlier, yes, of course, um, but do appreciate that things um, have taken place, uh, discussions have been taken place earlier. And um, the voluntary actions that were presented today and some real creative thinking. Um, I feel very strongly that um, however we get to improved conditions on uh, uh, survival, um, it doesn't have to be through a reduction in water supply, it, but these reduced deliveries through other creative mechanisms. Um, I'm just excited to hear about those opportunities where we can see improvement on survival and uh, through, through reduced deliveries, but at the same time that work for other beneficial uses. So I, I really look forward to hearing more about those opportunities. And um, Michael Jackson said he felt like it wasn't fully cooked. I, I don't know if I'd go that far. I just don't think today was really structured to hear about all the ingredients that have gone into the pot. And so I know that there's the upcoming temperature management uh, task force group. And I think that there'll be you know more detailed discussions there. And I too look forward to reviewing the plan and learning more about those details and you know some of the trade-offs that we've heard about today and how best to um, reduce redirected impacts uh, to other uh, species and ecosystems and other beneficial uses. Um, and then just wanna call out also uh, just how much um, I wanna thank all stakeholders and um, our staff and all the agencies for this improved collaboration and communication. Um, I think that the this workshop, um, the previous workshops that the Bureau conducted, and I know there were in more internal discussions with our staff, um, I think it's gone a long way to getting us out of sort of that binary that I felt personally back in 2014 that I'm not feeling this year. And so, um, just, I know it takes more time, but I think it produces better results and um, am hopeful that what we receive um, uh, from in the draft plan will continue that dialogue and we'll end up with a final plan that um, is the best uh, possible that we can do. So um, unless there are any other um, comments um, or uh, Diane, if you or Michael Loeffler or anyone else has anything to add before we close it out, I just wanna give you that opportunity. Yeah, I just wanted to mention, um, we've gotten a number of requests to receive the PowerPoint presentations from the different presenters. Um, we will be posting those on our, submitting a request to post them on our website. If somebody wants them before that, then they can go ahead and contact our staff, um, Craig Williams, his email address was identified in the notice and we'll be happy to send those over um, within the next day or two. All right. And I also just wanted to thank um, all of the presenters, particularly the agency folks. Um, it was um, a lot to get together as we're in the midst of trying to digest all of the information. I really appreciate all of their hard work and their willingness to be a part of the workshop all day today um, amidst all of the other drought um, related work that they have on their plate. So um, thank you again to everyone for participating. Thank you for, for saying that, Ms. Riddle. Okay, well, we will um, adjourn um, and um, 
hope you all have um, a good rest of the evening. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everybody.